So I was browsing my previous episodes the other day when I stumbled upon a dark and disturbing discovery. I've never done a scary hunting stories compilation. What the heck is wrong with me? So here you go, you wonderful, beautiful people. Several hours of unexplained creepiness going down in the woods in regards to hunters. Enjoy, and be sure to send me your encounters with the unexplained at darkstories.org so I can narrate them. Also, check out eeriecast.com for more scary shows. Now, let's begin. The Wrong Place From Gatherer Born and raised in the Ozarks, these mountains, these forests, I knew them like the back of my hand. My papa had taken me hunting in these woods since I was a little boy, and I loved every second of it. Sure, sometimes you didn't see no deer at all. You'd spend several hours sitting in one spot waiting for the telltale sound of hooves breaking the silence. Yet, even if that never happened, that time spent in nature, getting some truly fresh air, it never felt wasted. In my younger days, I'd stare up at the canopy, watching the wind blow away the browning leaves. Sunbeams would soon break through and warm up my skin, as the dark morning cold gave way to sunrise. If you've never gone hunting, don't miss out. And if you ain't into killing for food, I understand. Maybe a nice early morning hike will do ya. Whatever you do, always carry a GPS of some kind on ya, and never forget your gun when you enter the wilderness. You see, even when you're as familiar with the woods as I am, Terrible, unexplainable things can happen. It was 1998. I was a 32-year-old man who took weekdays off when he could to do some early morning hunting in the fall. It was still dark as I made my way from my pickup and into the mountain trail. Scurrying possums greeted me with caution. A slight breeze waxed and waned, filling me with a slight chill whenever it picked up. I'd always been a deep sleeper, and an early riser. There was no fatigue in my legs as I walked through that trail. So I took my time, taking in the sights as I always did, careful to keep an eye out for any fallen branches or rocks along the way. You never knew when a branch had fallen in the night, bringing a small but often painful surprise to a path that you should be familiar with. I walked for half an hour, the bird chirps grew into a ruckus the closer the sun got to the horizon. Small animals scurried through the brush to find their resting places until the next night. But my focus was on one thing, any trace of big bucks in the region. And to be honest, my hopes were getting up. I'd noticed several scrapes and rubs on the trees along the path, and they looked pretty deep and broad, meaning two things. There was at least one trophy buck out here, and they weren't scared of crossing along the trail. My confidence was boosted. The trail meandered, then opened up to a clearing. To my right sat a small pond, surrounded by cattails and tall weeds. Within it, a raucous symphony of toads came to a quiet end as the shadows began to fade. I walked perhaps another football field's length until steadily positioning myself under a tree, careful to stay as quiet as I could. The moment my rear hit the surface of the ground, the strangest thing happened. All the animal sounds around me came to a sudden and unrealistic stop. Usually as night changes into morning, those night shift animals clock out, and the day shift animals clock in. That changeover is usually quite steady. I had never in all my life heard it happen so suddenly before. It was like someone picked up a remote and rapidly clicked the mute button. It was so fast and so odd that I quickly stood back up, as if thinking that might trigger the sounds to come back. Of course, it didn't. When I stood up and listened, it was so immensely silent, my ears rang. One of my eyebrows raised, and I looked around, confused. 
When I looked up at the canopy, dread welled up in my heart. The branches were perfectly motionless. It was like the wind itself had become extinct in that moment. It's strange and terrifying to be in a place that has brought nothing but peace and happiness to you for years, to have it so suddenly change into something ominous. I sat back down against the tree, praying that this was normal but rare. I must have sat there for an hour, clutching my rifle with a shaky and sweaty grasp. My eyes were wide, and I listened for any noise, ready to turn my attention in its direction if it happened to arrive. It felt as if I was waiting for something horrifying to pop out at me. For the first time in decades, I felt like a kid in his room at night, wanting to scream for mom and dad to chase away the things in the dark, but never finding the courage to speak until morning. My anxiety climbed until I decided to reach in my pocket and grab my phone. I knew talking on the phone would scare away deer, but I was already scared enough myself. I was going to call my papa, who at this hour was probably up with a cup of coffee working on some whittling. Maybe he had experienced this himself before. Maybe he'd have an answer, I thought. But when I pulled out my phone and clicked the button on the side to bring up the unlock screen, the screen wouldn't wake up. It was like the phone was off. I thought maybe I placed it in my pocket in such a way that the lock button was held down, causing the phone to shut off. So I held the button down to turn it back on. But the screen would not change from black. It was like my phone was dead, but that didn't make sense. Every night I'd put it on the charger, and every morning I'd pull it off the charger. And every time I went hunting as I stepped out of the pickup truck, I made a habit of checking the battery percentage and I remember clear as day that morning, the percentage read 94. There was no reason it shouldn't be turning on. Over and over again for the next 10 minutes, I kept trying to turn on my phone, but nothing happened. Had I gotten it wet? Did I sit on it the wrong way? Had I damaged my phone and couldn't remember doing it? Once I'd given up on my phone, I stood straight back up, and I decided to head back to the pickup truck. I would regroup there, gather my thoughts, put my phone on the car charger. It sounded like a much better idea than waiting out here in utterly motionless silence. Purple and orange ribbons flowed through the sky, which was mostly clear, with only the occasional small cloud. It should have only taken me a minute or two to reach that clearing with the small pond and the cattails, but as I walked back down the trail, I never saw that clearing. Ten minutes turned into twenty minutes of walking. I should have been beyond the halfway point back to the truck, and yet I never saw that clearing. My walk soon turned into a run, and I began to breathe frantically. What in the world was happening? I had never gotten lost on these trails. Never once had I lost my way in the Ozark Mountains. Suddenly, almost tripping into it, I arrived in the clearing. No movement, no ripples appeared on the pond, and the cattails surrounding it seemed frozen in time. Part of me wanted to walk over and touch one, to make it move, to make sure it wasn't actually frozen there. But my desire to leave overwhelmed me. I continued walking past the small clearing and into the other part of the trail, which in half an hour should take me back to my pickup. And luckily, it seemed everything looked normal on this part of the trail. I began to calm down. The sounds had not returned. Everything was still motionless, but at least the landmarks I was used to seemed to be in their spots. With a sigh of relief, I knew that I was no longer lost. I knew I should have felt that way when I found that pond again, but I didn't. There was something wrong about that place. My watch still worked, thankfully, and I used it to keep track of time. 15 minutes of walking, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I was soon to be coming upon the edge of the dirt road, where I parked my truck. But I then noticed something else that was out of place. Those purples and oranges in the sky, those hues indicating the change between morning and night, 
They didn't change or shift in any way. The sun should have been up already. It should have been peeking over the horizon. And yet the shadows around me stayed at their density. I began to run again, turning those last few minutes into seconds before the trail broke. I'd made it back to... Wait. The clearing. This wasn't the roadside. This was the clearing to the pond. I had just traveled for half an hour downhill, and yet somehow I was back up the mountain at the clearing with that darn pond. No, 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 no. I remember saying aloud, Where was the road? Where had I been walking for so long now? Was there something wrong with my mind? I didn't have the time to worry or panic as a sound erupted behind me. Some sort of monstrous roar. It sounded as if it had come from a jet engine made of flesh. There was moisture and deepness to it. It was so loud, so close. It vibrated every bone in my body. Instinct took over, and I had no choice but to run taking the downhill trail again, hoping that things would be different this time. Running full speed, somehow managing not to trip, getting away from that roar, I managed to get to the end of that trail in about seven minutes. But once again, when it broke, I found myself in the clearing with the pond to my side. I fumbled for my phone, hoping that it would turn on now, but of course it didn't. Exhausted from running, I walked through the clearing, keeping my eyes wide for any sort of movement. The only thing I could think of to do was continue to try the downhill trail until the madness stopped. As I made it to the mouth of that trail, with the pond now behind me, I heard a sound that sent chills throughout my body, a splash in the water from something big. Again, I ran, forcing my body through its exhaustion. I ran for so long I couldn't count how many times I'd passed through that clearing with the pond. Suddenly, at one point, I slid to a stop, like a baseball player, sliding into the home plate. I sat there on the ground and stared in front of me, because in the middle of the trail before me was a massive buck. It was just chewing some leaves, staring at me. I swear this thing had ten points on it. It was massive. The exact trophy buck I'd been wanting to see out here. It seemed so carefree, not at all intimidated by me. Slowly, I picked myself and my rifle up off the ground. I stood in front of it and looked back at it for a minute. Then the buck just turned and bent down yanking a broad leaf off of a weed, proceeding to chew on it. Still panting from my run, I carefully walked past it, keeping an eye on it, making sure I didn't startle it. But it didn't seem to care, and once I passed it, it didn't look back at me. A few minutes later, a hopeless me made it to the edge of the trail again. I was looking down at my shoes, tired, sad, confused, but unable to even question the situation anymore. That is, until I heard birds chirping and wind flowing through trees. I looked up as I passed through the opening of the trail, and there rested my truck on the side of the road. I'd made it back. The forest had relinquished me, and I had no idea why, no idea what happened and to this day I still have no earthly clue as to what happened to me. I've told this story to my grandkids. They seem to love it, they find it creepy and unexplainable, but I think they're the only ones that believe it. I told my wife she thought it was funny, but never believed it herself. I told my papa when he was still around, and he got a kick out of it, and I do think he believed me. He said he never encountered anything similar, but he did tell me that some very strange things can happen out there when you're alone. So maybe he had his own weird experiences in the woods. I can't be sure. But I'm still a hunter, and my kids will be hunters too if they like it. 
This experience never changed my love for the woods, but it definitely made me respect it more. Though I don't think any amount of respect would keep this from happening to anyone. To me, I think it was just random. Some sort of glitch in the woods. All I can say is, if you find yourself in a similar situation, keep moving. Don't give up. And I pray you make it back. The Wheat Fields from Derek D. This happened in northern Texas. My dad and I were walking back to the truck after a hunt. We didn't get anything that day. The walk would take us through my grandpa's wheat field along a path. Grandpa owned tons of land, so it would still take us a bit of a walk before we got back to the truck. It must have been around 9 a.m., so the sun was well into the sky, but the sky was gray and fully covered that morning. Before long, it began to rain. Not too hard, thank goodness. I was wearing a few layers of clothes because of the cold that morning, and it would have been exhausting to walk soaked in all of that clothing. I remember walking behind my dad, the two of us not really talking much. I was thinking about the biscuits and gravy we usually had back at home after days we went hunting. Sorry, I was starved. Suddenly, I ran right into him, because he had just stopped walking. I looked up at him, and before I could say a word, he shushed me. I looked around, wondering what he was worried about. Then I heard it. Footsteps. It sounded like someone was walking around in the stalks of the wheat fields. The wheat itself was about five feet tall so the two of us could see over it without much trouble. I kept my eyes on the direction I'd heard the footsteps coming from. The sounds would come and go every few seconds. I'm not sure who was out there or why, but it definitely sounded like a person, like a grown man crouching down because they knew they were trespassing. Hey, come on out of there. My dad suddenly shouted. It made me jump. Dad's voice was always pretty scary when he was mad. The footsteps suddenly stopped. The trespasser definitely heard my dad. Holy crap. My dad breathed. I didn't see it at first, but it was soon hard to miss. The man in the field began to stand up, and after seeing him, I really don't think it was a normal man. Slowly, this thin figure with an oval-shaped head stood up to a height twice that of my father, who's five feet nine inches tall. Dad raised his gun at it. I heard him release the safety. He was scared. I don't blame him because I was petrified at the time. He didn't fire, though. I think it looked too much like a man, and my dad, like anyone, was hesitant to shoot at another person. The figure crouched back down under the wheat, which was amazing that it could fit its tall form below the wheat stalks. We then heard footsteps, or perhaps crawling, as it sounded like it went in the opposite direction toward the forest we had just come from. I was so relieved. It wasn't coming after us. My dad and I picked up the pace and got back to the truck. Then we called my grandpa to let him know that we'd seen someone in his fields. My grandpa wasn't surprised. We met up with him for breakfast, and he told us that he'd been hearing someone walking around the farmhouse some nights. They seemed to be gone by the time he got outside with a gun, so he figured whoever it was had been hiding in the fields. After finding some bird nests with the heads chewed off the birds and the remains of crushed eggs, my grandpa figured some psycho homeless person was eating whatever critters he could find out in those fields. To this day, my grandpa hears the occasional footsteps outside in the wheat fields. He hasn't yet seen what my dad and I saw, and I'm hoping that terrible tall figure was just a trick of the light. No one can be that tall. The Coyote Pack Attack from Redford, the Snake Doctor this happened after a late night, scouring an area in Little Rock, Arkansas, just outside the city limits, 
where industrial mining and processing of materials operations are carried out 24-7. Around there exist local legends of bottomless pits, quicksand, and cottonmouth snake masses, as well as other folklore, which I learned about over the 40-plus years I lived in the area. For my time staying there, I enjoyed hunting and fishing at every available opportunity or chance I had, within reason. Of course, I had my responsibilities, like helping my parents pay the freight, so to speak, at a very early age. But whenever I could get away, I would, and during my free time, I got experience in being a lawnmower, dishwasher, busboy, and all that, earning money in various ways. On one occasion, I was scouting an area of a mountain range, which is on the east side of the highway, which makes up the center line defining the boundary of the county and city limits. With my homework done at the time, as rigorous as it was, I journeyed through the area before dawn, and using a map I rendered hours earlier, I was fairly certain I was in a sweet spot for hunting and fishing. I prepared some lures and camouflaged myself in woodland colors, then doused myself in doe estrus. From that point, I began to make a circle with a scent drag as high as I could reach. Then I went to the center of the circle and made a stand. Preparing takes time and I'll spare you the details. I headed back to my truck and I was plumb wore out by then. I grabbed my muzzle loader and as quietly as possible, I went back to my stand, which was simply the base of a double pine tree that I cleared out of debris the day before. I sat quiet listening for almost two hours in pitch dark. It wasn't until morning that I saw a buck with some beautiful antlers. When I saw the creature, I decided those antlers were a bonus, and I'd be taking that precious venison home and would not be wasting it, like so many sport deer shooting clubs would do. But then I began to hear footsteps, and I thought, whoa, it's a whole herd of them coming my way but I would soon realize these footsteps were not from deer. A pack of 15 to 20 coyotes were trailing me. I think they were following the scent drags, and even after they saw that it wasn't a deer they were pursuing, they kept coming. I was only able to shoot down one before I had to start swinging my rifle at the rest of them. Let me tell you, these things were ready to take down a man. More and more kept coming, and at a certain point, I'd have more luck keeping track of how many pieces of my muzzle loader came off as I swung it, hitting these mongrels. I did everything in my power to push them back and to keep them from surrounding me. There seemed to be no end to them. Minute by minute, I grew more and more exhausted, and I knew soon I'd have to give in. But by some miracle, the coyotes gave in first. When the first one began to back away into the woods... More and more of them began to follow suit behind him, until they were gone. I couldn't believe what just happened. I wasn't in a lot of pain yet. I was exhausted, covered with blood and bites and scratches. My hands were torn up from the wild swings I'd been taking, most of which missed the coyotes and would hit pine trees next to me instead. I know it sounds hard and crazy to believe, but as bad as I felt, the last thing I wanted to do was lay down to rest. Instead, I was on my feet, getting a move on, because I did not want to be eaten by desperate coyotes. The one coyote I did manage to shoot at the beginning of this had already taken off as the bullet had passed right through him. I got the heck out of there, and I swore I would never go back into the woods with just a muzzle-loading rifle. I'll at least have something else as backup. And not too long after this experience, a hunter was gored to death, just an hour or so north of here. Nature is violent and ruthless. Be careful and be safe out there. I still enjoy hunting and fishing. I just have a heightened sense of my surroundings from now on, and I stay more alert, no longer taking naps outside of certain periods. Even the animals that fear you might get desperate enough to attack. Alaska Bigfoot Encounter from Gavin's Raging Reptiles, 1908 I'm a big game hunter. I've been all the way to Africa hunting whatever was in season. But one thing I do know 
is that what me and my cousin encountered that day in August of 2018 was no grizzly bear. It was Saturday, August 17th, 2018. My cousin and I went out grizzly bear hunting in Alaska. We were there for four days before we found grizzly cub tracks, but they were heading out of a zone we both knew no cub or adult bear would ever leave. As we followed these tracks, we began to emerge from the woods into a large open field, with one single river running through it. There are usually bears there drinking or eating. I always carry three guns on me, one 30 6 and two revolvers. I do this just in case my gun jams. You never want to take chances, especially with grizzlies. But as we were walking through this field, we all of a sudden hear something crashing through the woods at a rapid speed, heading straight in our direction. My first instinct was to fire a shot, but unfortunately, my gun jammed right as this big, hairy, man-looking thing thundered out of the woods, still running in me and my cousin's direction. My cousin was busy trying to pull ammo from his pack, but fearing for my life, I shot my revolver at it. I hit it, but it looked like it got even more angry. So we took off running from this creature. It followed us for what seemed like miles, until we got to the boat and punched the engine to maximum power. We decided to never go back to that place again, so we can stay far away from what we now believe was a Bigfoot. Bear Cubs From Jared M. It was October 2015. It was rough grouse season here in Maine. I had that Thursday off, so I planned to go into my grandparents' camps to do some bird hunting. I got there a little after 3 p.m., so I knew I didn't have much time to get some hunting in before dark, but I knew I could make it to an old apple orchard about three quarters of a mile away. I knew there would be some partridge in there getting something to eat before they go roost for the night. I grabbed a handful of 16-gauge shells for my shotgun. I put one in the chamber and two in the tube, then put the rest of them in my vest pocket. I began my walk towards the orchard. I made it to the orchard, and I began to slowly make my way in, trying to make as little noise as possible, which is difficult because the brush around and in this orchard is thick, so it's hard for anything in or around it to be quiet. I started to break the brush line, keeping my eyes open for any movement. Suddenly, I heard something to my right just take off. I look over, and I can see the top of one of the apple trees swaying back and forth. I catch a glimpse of a bear taking off down through the trees. I listen to it crashing through the brush. That bear was only about 40 yards from me when it jumped down out of the tree so I'm standing there for a moment, just listening to this bear go. After a few seconds, I hear something to my left. It was small and walking towards me, whatever it was, but I couldn't see it yet because of the thick brush. The next thing I know, there's a bear cub only 30 feet in front of me, barking like a dog and walking towards me. I start to backpedal, yelling at it, trying my best to scare it away. The cub keeps going, and I just kept walking backwards, yelling at the cub, knowing its mother was going to be extremely mad if she saw I was near its cub. Finally, the cub stopped. Then it stood up on its hind legs, just looking at me. At this point, there was about 80 feet between us. He then took off towards the direction the other bear went, which I now believe to be his mom. Now, I've come across a lot of bears over the years, and they usually go the other way, but this one kept following me, and I was terrified at the thought of what would happen if its mother came back to see me that close to its baby. A bear attack is not something I want to be a part of. Sublet Idaho Hunting Trip by Idaho Livin a few years back, I was invited by my friend Matt to go deer hunting in a range of mountains neither of us had ever been to before. 
Matt had gone up a few days ahead of me to claim a nice camping spot and to hunt with his son for a few days on their own. The day I headed up, I had found their camping spot, but no one was there, and I concluded that they went hunting early that day as it was just after sun up. So I decided to go explore and hunt on my own, and I came back around midday thinking they would be back by then. So I unloaded my ATV, donned my hand-sewn ghillie suit, something I had made just the week before. Then I set out. After a while of driving around and taking short hikes into areas that seemed like sure things that would have been chocked full with deer, but I got skunked every time. What we call it when we don't see anything when hunting. I stumbled into an area that had been burned up in a forest fire earlier this year. I'd never been in a burned up area like this before, and I was just absorbing all the visual shock of the devastation. I was walking along the ridge line of the burned area, looking as far as I could see across all the other ridges where the fire had burnt it up. I even found the burned, charred remains of some poor little critter, too unfortunate to escape in the blaze. Shaking my head to clear my mood and focus on why I came here, I tried to gauge distances with no points of reference. But I spotted a clear patch of dirt down at the bottom of the ravine. It must have been 250 yards, give or take. I set the riser sight on my rifle to the 250 mark and took a shot at a rock roughly the size of a small dog in the middle of the patch of bare dirt, and I nailed it. Satisfied with the shot, and seeing that it was midday now, I headed back to camp. As I was nearing the camp, I saw a skinned and cleaned out deer hanging from a tree, and I met up with my friend. We chatted for a while about his son bagging the deer, about the burned up area and the moose he saw. Moose are unusual to us as the mountains we grew up around have a very small population of them, and you rarely ever saw them. Anyway, we cooked up some lunch and sat down by a campfire. My friend said he was going to run down the mountain to get a cell signal and call his wife to pick up his son. We put the fire out and they took off. I decided around that time to go hunting again, but headed in the opposite direction this time away from the burned up area. I found a nice trail for ATVs and drove up it. It was a beautiful drive through an aspen grove. It was mid-fall, and the leaves were all golden in color. The mid-afternoon sun almost seemed to sparkle off of them. The cool, crisp autumn air was filled with a perfumed aroma of the aspens. I came to the end of the trail, only because a huge tree had fallen down across the path some years ago, and it had never been cleared out. I got off of my ATV and walked up the abandoned and overgrown trail, after a bit of a hike, I was in pine trees with low-hanging branches, just at my head level, and I had to do a lot of ducking to get around. After a while, I noticed that all the low pine branches were all broken and roughed up, as if deer or elk had been tearing them up. Feeling like I was in a lucky zone, I kept going up the trail. I finally ran into an area that had no grass in the ground and could tell what kind of animal was on the trail. Sure enough, I seem to have found the deer and elk highway. I was beyond stoked now. Further up the trail, I found some leg bones of a deer. And I have a habit of trying to find the whole skeleton in hopes of finding the skull. Because if it still had antlers attached, those were very useful or could be used as tools or trophies. Searching around for a few minutes, I found the entire skeleton, but it was female. But I spotted another leg bone nearby an elk bone, and I went to look for that skeleton as well. I found it a few moments later, only to see it was a small young female. I started to get a funny feeling like I should get out of the area, and I started to back out. I was looking around when I noticed carnivore scat and bones of even smaller animals. The whole way back, I was looking over my shoulder until I reached my ATV. I sped back to camp and started the fire again, and I sat there drinking until my friend Matt finally showed back up. We stayed in camp until his wife showed up to pick up their son and to take him home. Matt and I discussed our hunting plans for the next day. As we were sitting there, 
we saw a large black animal walking on the hill across from our camp. At first, we assumed it was a rancher's cow, but took a second look through binoculars when we realized it was alone and cows tend to stay with the herd. Matt muttered, ah, just another moose, looking through his binoculars. As for the hunting plans we came up with, Matt would be going to hunt where his son had bagged that deer, and I was going to hunt at a creek near our camp where Matt said he saw plenty of deer. I opted not to go with Matt, as I didn't want to take a long drive to where they were hunting on the back side of the mountain, near some farmer's fields, and I preferred to hunt nearby. The next day, we woke up at around 4.30 a.m. I boiled a kettle of water to make some instant oatmeal, a true hunter's breakfast. Matt asked me one more time if I was sure I didn't want to go with him to his spot. I firmly said no. I had a good feeling about hunting over at the creek. He gave me one last warning about watching out for moose, then took off. I put on my ghillie suit and my headlamp and walked over to the creek. It wasn't far from our camp, a few hundred yards at best. I couldn't see anything through the darkness, and my headlamp only seemed to light up the area four feet ahead of me, and anything beyond that was too dim and hard to make out. The batteries weren't fresh, so that didn't help. I managed to find a spot I thought was going to be good. I sat there, and I waited for daylight. The sky was beginning to brighten, and I could make out more of the landscape, dim but clearer than my headlamp could make it. A little while after that, I could see well enough to make out an even better spot to wait out an animal and a clump of aspens with a clear line down the whole creek. I walked over as quietly as I could, and I got set up there. As the morning light was getting bright enough to see totally clearly, I could hear all sorts of things moving around in the thick brush beyond the tree line of the creek. I sat and planned out scenarios through my head of what I would do if I saw a deer in certain areas. Then, out of the bushes on my right side, within two feet of me, trotted out three coyotes in single file. I nearly jumped, but remained calm. I mean, I could have reached out and grabbed one by the tail. They were that close. I was amazed at the effectiveness of my ghillie suit and the scent spray. They had no idea I was there. A few moments later, I heard something else getting closer to the creek through the dense brush. I could tell the direction it was heading. It moved quietly out of my hiding spot and heard it was just on the other side of a large pine tree. Of course, by then the coyotes were long gone. I was using my scope this time and I set the zoom to the lowest power and began to kneel down. I had one eye through the scope and the other eye looking at the tree waiting for the animal to pop out. My heart was pounding in anticipation. Whatever it was, it sounded huge. I even had a second thought about the situation. Was I really ready for whatever was on the other side? I realized all too late that I'd never hunted something so large, and if it was a deer, it would definitely not be walking around, not caring what knew it was there. It was not even trying to be quiet. That moment, the head of this huge animal came out from behind the tree. At first, it was looking down at the ground, it noticed me and looked over my way. It was the biggest moose I'd ever seen. I could have used one of the moose's paddles as a hammock for myself, that big. The magazine photos I've seen and other trophy mounts I've witnessed, this animal was by far larger than any of those and was standing a mere 10 yards away from me. It was that moment you realize you're in trouble and time seems to stand still and let you think of an option. By then, I was too far away from the tree line to be able to run back into the thick aspens where I had been without that thing reaching me. My hope was that my ghillie suit would confuse the moose, and I hoped that getting close to the willow shrub could save me from getting stepped on. So I tried to situate myself as close to the willow shrub as possible without giving away my position. If this thing stepped on me, I'd be done for. I couldn't see anything going on around me. The hood of my suit was large and was covering my whole head. 
I could hear the moose snorting and grunting angrily. And then I heard the sounds of at least five more individuals, large animals moving out of the thick brush and heading to the creek. I was in deep, too deep. I was so scared I was shaking, and it's hard to manage to stay still in that kind of situation. I had the thought of shooting my rifle off and trying to scare all the moose away and take the risk of being stepped on by a 2,000 pound animal. As I went to slowly move my hand up to the trigger, my wrist was caught on my sling and I could not move my arm up to the trigger all the way. As the old military saying goes, there is no such thing as an atheist in a foxhole during a firefight. I found myself praying for a way out. After what I think was five minutes, I hear the herd head back into the brush. I waited even longer for silence again. I peeked out as best I could under my hood to my sides, and I didn't see anything. I slowly pushed myself up, pulled my hood back, and looked around. That's when I heard a snort. I looked behind me to see the massive male only five feet from me, and it knew I was there. It was angry. I went back down and put my hood back up real quick, but the moose continued to snort and grunt. I heard it begin to thrash the willow bush with its paddles. I was shaking uncontrollably at the moment. I started praying for someone to drive by and scare the attacking thing away. I didn't know if anyone would drive by because the whole day I had only seen two other people. The moose finally stopped thrashing on the willow bush and was now just snorting. I forced myself to calm down, but I couldn't stop thinking that one good strike with its paddles or a hoof and I wouldn't be alive anymore. It could happen at any moment. No matter how hard I tried, I was still shaking a bit from the adrenaline, but I had calmed down mostly. What seemed like hours passed, waiting for this moose to move on. Finally, a large truck drove by. I heard them stop and comment on the massive size of the moose, and they didn't even see that I was there. A few moments later, the moose just trots off into the brush after its herd. The truck drove off, and I got up and got out of there as fast as I could. I jumped the creek and jogged up to the road. I went and sat next to some small bushes and went over what the heck just happened. As I was sitting there, some deer happened to pop out and get a drink. I raised my rifle, but for the first time in my hunting career, I hesitated. A thought raced through my head. How could I even think about taking this animal's life moments after something bigger than me only narrowly and unknowingly spared mine? I lowered my rifle and muttered to myself, Not today, buddy. I walked back to camp and waited for Matt. After a couple of hours, he showed back up to camp, and I told him my story of what had happened. I'm sure he thought it was a BS story and said to me, I told you, dude, there was Moose, and he laughed at me. To this day, I still wonder if those people in the truck took a picture of that Moose, and perhaps they unknowingly captured a photo of a man with the look of death in his eyes. Hunting Trip Stalker by Huntsy. For quite some time, I've been an avid hunter, and I've also hunted in this particular area for the past five years. I'm very familiar with these mountains. It was the fourth day of bear season, and I had finally decided on a spot, a meadow, about two months before, due to all of the heavy predator signs, such as prints, scat, and carcasses. Now, you have to understand hunting predators tends to be slightly unnerving at times. At times, I think we have a built-in sense when you know something is close, because sometimes, things don't feel right. Anyway, that day, I got to my spot an hour before the sun rose, as I didn't want to come too late that I spooked everything. I found a tree and dug out a small trench to lay in where I could easily keep an eye on the meadow. Now everything was pretty quiet and I felt something odd. 
like eyes watching me, but I pushed the feeling away. I decided I would take a nap before shooting light, so I propped my hat over my face and prayed that me being sleepy didn't keep me from missing the best prize. I laid there, trying to get some shut-eye and listening closely for any kind of movement, but I couldn't really get any rest because of the unnerving feeling like I was not alone. Plus, the rising sun was getting brighter by the second, shining through the trees and hitting me through my cap. So really, I was just laying there and waiting. A few minutes later, out of nowhere, the little bit of light shining through the holes of my hat went dark, as if someone or something had stepped in front of the light, and they'd have to be right in front of me at that angle. In a split moment, I pulled up my cap, heard large wings flapping right in front of me, felt a gust against my face, and the shadow of something taking flight and disappearing above me. This really put me off my guard, had me nervous, and I was already low on sleep. But because I was so exhausted, I thought it was either just a bird or something I just made up for being half awake. I laid there for another five minutes, thinking and waiting, when, to my surprise, my hat gets smashed down on my face as if something just landed on it or whacked at it. It really hurt my head because whatever it was hit it extremely hard or was just that heavy. When I got up and pulled my cap back up to see what it was, once again, all I see are flapping wings in a black silhouette flying back up through the trees. At the rate it moved and how slow I was to catch a glimpse of it, I can't even tell you how big or small it was. All I knew was that it had wings and I was starting to think it was harassing me. And then I felt dripping on my head, a warm sensation that grew colder the further down it got. I dabbed my finger on my forehead to feel the liquid. It was red. Whatever that was had hit me so hard, it broke the skin. And for all I knew, I had a concussion. I needed to get home. Sadly, calling the hunting trip quits early. I began to make my way out of the woods, thinking of what doctor to go to or even if I should see a doctor about this. But as I moved, making my way back, I heard flapping, the same flapping sound. It was coming from above me now. And here and there on the ground, I saw a shadow moving, something shadow being cast from above. I found myself power walking, and then full on running until I made my way back to my vehicle. Just as I stepped inside to drive away, I looked back at the top of the trees and I swear I saw a silhouette standing on one of the branches. The thing was the size of a large German shepherd, that's for sure, but because of the bright sunlight behind it, all I saw was a dark outline. What it was, I don't really know. It could have just been a really teed off bird or something else. Whenever I went back out in the mountains after that, I tried to keep an eye out for the thing, but I haven't seen it since. And yeah, I'm glad I left that day because I had a pretty severe concussion, according to the doctors. Hunting with the Dark by Ethan. I live in central Arkansas, just northwest of Searcy. My family has called this area, around Mount Pisgah, home since the early 1880s. So naturally, my family has a strong relationship to the land. We own about 600 acres on Mount Pisgah, and that flat ground land is good for row crop farming. Being poor southern farmers all the way back to my great grandfather, we've also been avid trappers and hunters just to pay the wintertime bills and put supper on the table. My grandfather and father always ran a lengthy trap line on neighbor's land, so when I was old enough to be trusted with a dog in a 22, I started coon and squirrel hunting for meat and hides. My grandfather and my dad always avoided ghost stories too. My dad would give a growl and leave the house if someone started to tell one. My grandfather would shut the individual up with a loud cursing, so naturally, I thought they didn't like ghost stories because they thought they were dumb and untrue. 
I couldn't have been more wrong. Mount Pisgah being 1,500 acres, several different people and families own a piece of it. I was hunting Miss Michelle's property one cold winter day with my mountain cur, Bob. An odd name for a dog, sure. It was a good day, and my knapsack had several squirrels and a couple of rabbits. It was getting late, and being still about five miles from home, I decided to radio in on my walkie-talkie to tell my family I'd be home for breakfast, with hopefully a few raccoons in my mixed bag. As darkness fell, I put my coon lamp on my cap. Bob, for a bad squirrel dog, was a fantastic coon dog. We'd caught four coons since 10 o'clock. The wind began to howl furiously, and we stopped our coon hunt to seek shelter. Being raised and knowing this land so thoroughly, you almost always know where you're at. I remembered Miss Michelle's son David had a small log cabin about a quarter mile north of my location. So me and Bob arrived there happy to see the cabin. We built a fire in the stone fireplace that was actually part of the original cabin, built before the Civil War, and was burned during a skirmish in 1863. As we warmed ourselves, we heard what sounded like cannon fire and musket shots. I swore it was just freezing rain and hail, but it grew louder until it sounded like it was just outside. Bob was cowering in a corner, scared for his life. By then, the clouds had cleared, and though the rain had stopped, the sounds continued, and now I knew very clearly that these were shots being fired and they were accompanied by the sound of men screaming and shouting, dozens of sets of footsteps running through the forest. I looked outside, and I was bewildered by what I saw, what appeared to be muskets being aimed toward the cabin. I jumped down, covered my head, and put my body over Bob. Dozens of different shots were fired, but shortly after, everything was quiet. I considered that our chance to get out of there with our lives intact. I grabbed Bob, and I ran out of the door. I ran towards home until I had to put Bob down, and he ran back even faster than I did. When I was back at home, I woke my dad and told him what I'd seen. He told me to sit by the wood stove for a bit. He called my grandfather over, and together the two of them sat with me and told me some of the occurrences that they had as well. They say they've experienced the same thing, and that they keep quiet about it. They said it's harmless, just history repeating itself, and though it sounds terrifying, it's best just to ignore that it's happening and move on. After that, my grandfather drove us to Miss Michelle's property, and we hiked up to the cabin on the old wagon road. The cabin I had just been staying in had burnt to the ground in under an hour. My grandfather and father looked at each other and muttered, that's new, and I realized one of two things happened. The fire I'd left in the fireplace had burned the place to the ground, or those apparitions were more real than my father and grandfather knew. That was about nine years ago, and I remember the scene and the sounds more clearly than ever. And though my family helped to rebuild that cabin, believe it or not, the place has been burned down twice since then, and on one occasion, according to the firefighters, it appeared that a torch was what burned it, not the fireplace. In the Woods by M. Bird. I live in the woods of Alabama, with my family, of course. I'm 17 and still live with my parents. I love it out here, but I can't lie when I say that sometimes things happen that you can't really explain. My brother and I each have a large Great Dane, and every few nights, I feel like I hear them going crazy barking in the deep woods. I obviously get worried and always go out to try to call them back to the house, but usually, they are already just outside the door on the back porch, staring tensely and completely rigid just looking into the woods. At first, I blamed it on the sound of their barking bouncing off objects and sounding further away than they really were. But after this hunting incident, I'm not so sure anymore. 
It was the single most intense moment I have ever experienced on the property, and it happened a couple of months ago, during the whitetail deer season. I'm usually an avid hunter, but I hadn't been out that season yet due to my concentration on the wrestling season, which goes on at around the same time. However, one day my dad called me and said my little cousin wanted to go hunting. He proceeded to ask if I could take him, and I immediately agreed. I love that little dude, and he's obsessed with hunting. An hour later, we were walking down the trail, and I couldn't stop smiling, seeing my cousin so happy in his little camo outfit. We walked down a very large hill and across a creek, then walked up another hill. Now we were at the small house, a shooting house, that we hunt out of. It overlooks a large green field that we started planting two years back. Off to the right of me is the stretch of creek, part of which we crossed over earlier, and some really thick underbrush. To the left of us and in front, there is green grass, and that goes out for hundreds of yards. Unfortunately, we did not bag a deer that day, but I did see something white flash through the brush behind the back of the field. It was small, probably four feet off the ground, so I did assume it was the tail of a white-tailed deer, since they tend to run with their tails straight up. But even if it was just a deer, what the heck was it running from? We had taken down all the coyotes the year before because they had been stealing chickens, and it was too far away to have noticed my cousin and I. I was sure of it. Anyway, that didn't really affect me much during the hunt, because I had no reason to believe there was something dark in those woods, something out of the ordinary. I was just frustrated at the lost opportunity at the deer, Soon after that, I thought I started hearing walking through the woods to my right, and on the other side of the small creek and brush. I shushed my cousin and told him that I think something is walking towards the field, and to keep his eyes out. I saw the look in his eyes, and he was growing more excited by the second. He thought it was a deer that I was hearing, but noticed I said something was walking, because I knew it was not a deer. When you're out in the woods long enough, you can identify a lot of animals by the sounds they make when walking through the woods. A deer, for instance, will often take about three steps and then pause, and then look around for danger before walking again. This creature I was hearing had a similar walking pattern to a squirrel. It would go kind of fast, then crash, like it was coming to a stop suddenly. But it was no squirrel, because squirrels are not heavy enough to break branches. The entity moved around outside of my sight for close to 45 minutes before suddenly stopping for good. I was unsettled, but still operating like nothing was wrong at that point. Another hour passed and it was growing dark, so me and my slightly disappointed cousin began to walk back to the house without any issue so far. We got to the house and my cousin suddenly chirped. Ah, I left my camo bag. After the disappointing hunt, I couldn't let him go home without his favorite bag, so I offered to go down and get it for him, even in spite of a dark and moonless night, and that was the choice that led me to the single most terrifying moment of my life. As I didn't have to worry about scaring off deer, I decided to take our new four-wheeler. I quickly made it to the shooting house and grabbed a bag and toboggan that my cousin had left. As I hopped back on the four-wheeler, I looked up just in time to see a small white figure dash out of the corner of my headlight beam at an impossible pace. The memory of those footsteps in the brush came rushing back, and I decided I'm about to use the full 750 cc's to get back home. I whip around at a speed that wouldn't be approved by any sane person and headed down into the creek. Suddenly, the footsteps came splashing through the water behind me at what sounded like Mach 7. I can hear these steps over the roar of my massive ATV engine, which shouldn't have been possible, and I cannot stress how fast it sounded. It was comparable to the speed of a jackhammer breaking concrete, but on water. I look back and nearly cause myself to crash, because what I see is a small white humanoid-shaped thing with black hair half the length of its body. The only reason I could see it was because it was close enough to me that my red tail light was illuminating it. That was enough. I pushed in the gas as hard as I could go and sent dirt and debris flying behind me. 
basically flying out of the creek and ripping a completely new trail back up the giant hill that leads to my house. Then I hit a bump at this insane speed, and the four-wheeler went airborne. This didn't faze me, too scared to let it, as I landed 15 feet from when I left the ground. I was already full throttle again, too. I whipped into the gravel driveway at enough speed to put deep ruts into the ground, and I hopped off, drawing my buck knife as I landed on the ground and scanned the area. The first thing I noticed was the white figure wasn't anywhere that I could see, but the second thing I noticed was neither was my cousin. I was past afraid and getting furious at this point. Chase me, I run, but mess with my six-year-old cousin, and I'll make you run. I was about to take off into the woods screaming his name when I glanced over and saw him, looking out of one of the windows of my house looking pretty shaken up. I ran inside and asked if he was all right, and he said he was terrified when he heard me flying through the woods that fast. He asked if I was running away from something, and I said, uh, no, I was just doing it for fun. He calmed down pretty quickly. As he left that night, my dad asked me why I wasn't already driving like a madman, but I gave him a look that said, I'm not going to talk about it. He said simply, don't mess up that four-wheeler. Then he left me alone. Since then, not much has happened. I still hear my dogs barking out of the woods when I know they're on the porch, but other than that, the thing hasn't made another in-person appearance, and I'm okay with that but that thing better steer clear of my family and my dogs, because I will blast it into kingdom come. Skinwalker Sighting in Illinois by Red Nakedness. I'm 20 years old and live in Illinois. I've been in the woods my entire life. In fact, my dad brought me hunting for the first time when I was only four years old. And no, he didn't give me a rifle just yet. He just let me sit and watch with him. Since then, I've been in love with all things outdoors. I mainly bow hunt for everything from deer to squirrels, but I'll often take my 22 or 17 HMR for coon or squirrel hunting. This particular event took place about a year ago. I was 19 then, and my friend who we'll call R was 17. R and I were at his house, which sat on a 10-acre plot of land and was surrounded by hundreds, if not thousands of acres that we practically had free reign over, as long as we didn't tear apart his neighbor's corn or beans on dirt bikes. So we spent almost every weekend out in the woods, either riding dirt bikes, hunting, or fishing in the farm ponds. So we knew the area and the animals in the area very well. Quite often, we'd go out at night to coon hunt or coyote hunt, and that is how this story starts. R and I had planned on taking his coon hound, Banjo, out to get some coons, then end the trip by camping out in the barn. And we had done just that. We'd finished up hunting, and we were hanging out in the barn with my AR-15, just watching TV and hanging out with his dad. I had brought my AR-15 because I had a new sight for it. I had put it on, so I had it next to me in the man cave. That's what the barn basically was. We always had at least one firearm easily accessible just in case we heard Banjo going at it. There was a chicken coop out there, and sometimes coons or coyotes trying to get a midnight snack. That night, at about 1 a.m., R was passed out on the couch, and I was just watching Family Guy half asleep, when I heard Banjo start to bark. I sat there thinking about how I didn't want to get out of the recliner to find out what he was barking at, but figured it was better than R's mom yelling at us about missing a rooster or chicken. So I got up and grabbed my AR, which still had about 10 rounds in the magazine. I turned on the torch that I had attached to the rail of it and walked out the door, leaving R passed out on the couch. When I walked out, I had to walk around another shed to be within 50 yards of the actual coop. So I walked around and started heading toward the coop, not really paying attention until I realized Banjo had stopped barking. Then the realization that I didn't hear the frogs or crickets or any wildlife at all hit me. Why was it so quiet? This immediately put me on edge. I began to scan the tree line with my light, not knowing what to expect, until my light got to Banjo's enclosure. 
There, there was this pale white thing leaning over the four foot high fencing they used for Banjo's area. It was looking right at his doghouse, and when the light fell on it, it turned its head to look at me. It stood up and was easily eight inches taller than me. It had bright yellow eyes, probably just reflecting my flashlight, and that was the first time in my life that I had legitimately frozen with fear. I couldn't move, and this thing was just staring me down while making this really low growling noise, something I've never heard before. After what had to have been 30 seconds, I finally regained self-control. I raised up the AR, thinking there was no way I could take down whatever this was, just wishing that I had a 12-gauge slug. I shot one round, and I missed, because I was shaking so bad. Then I emptied whatever was left in my magazine, and it wasn't until I stopped firing that I realized it had scurried off. When the AR went quiet, I heard the thing screaming and howling in the distance, rustling and scurrying away through the underbrush in the forest. As I stood there, mouth agape and panting, R and his dad came out of the barn, looking around and then at me frantically, asking me what the heck was going on. I stood there staring toward the trees where the thing had run off to, and without looking at R, I just said, we need to go inside. I spent the rest of the night keeping an eye out in the window of the main house, and the next morning I told R exactly what I saw. We continued to hunt at night there using Banjo, who also survived the ordeal, and now we have a bit of a morbid fascination hoping we can see the creature again. R believes me and would love to see it himself, but I'll have the right firepower next time, and it won't be getting away. Northern Horror by Water Reaper. My name is Luke. I'm 37 and love to hunt. I enjoy taking my two sons, Jordan and Mike, to hunt with me. We used to live out in the Rocky Mountains of Alberta in a heavily forested area, and that's actually when and where this story took place. It was winter at the time. I was walking down the local lake on the man-made path near my cabin. I had made that hunting trip almost every night with my sons, but tonight they were studying for an exam and decided to stay home. I was fine with that, as I had walked this path alone before a thousand times. The worst I'd seen was a wolf once, which wouldn't have been a problem since I had my hunting rifle with me. I had gotten to the lake when I started to hear noises in the forest, the cracking of tree limbs it sounded like, and I thought it was a bear, but when I heard the guttural scream... I knew it was something else. The silence that followed was entirely unnatural. All I could then hear was the howling of the wind and the groaning of the swaying trees. Seconds later, I saw something. Something that was nearly as tall as one of the trees. Something with a pale complexion and way too long arms. I was choking for air as I watched it, completely in disbelief immediately wondering what sort of thing I ate last night that had gone bad. And then it looked at me. It screamed that guttural scream again, and before it could move, I turned and booked it back the way I came. When I reached the trees, the taller ones, I climbed up the closest pine I could, and I crawled as fast as I could to reach a height taller than that thing, which was pretty difficult. Once I reached the top of the tree, something began shaking it from the bottom. The shaking soon stopped. I heard heavy footsteps thudding away from me, followed by an even more distant screaming. And when it was silent again, I crawled down and I raced home faster than ever, nearly knocking the door off its hinges when I tried to get inside. I've never been that scared before. I remember my sons looking at me thinking, what the heck is going on? but I simply attributed it to a mountain lion. I didn't want my son scared of the outdoors, even though it took me a long time not to be scared of them after that. Hunting with My Cousin by Jamie L. This happened five years ago when I was 13. 
my cousin and I had planned on going into the woods for a hunt, hoping to bag some deer or even raccoons. But what we actually found was nothing like what we expected. We didn't go by foot. We ended up using a four-wheeler for a faster trip. We drove along the path, and it wasn't long before my cousin saw a raccoon. This is what you get when you get in our trash, my cousin said. He tiptoed off the four-wheeler. I stayed put waiting for him, asking him to hurry up. As I waited for him, I heard footsteps like heavy boots nearby, and they weren't coming from the same direction my cousin was. Before I could look into it, my cousin was already back, saying that he lost the dang thing. I shush him, and he suddenly hears it too, the heavy footsteps. He whispers to me, you better get ready to run, especially if it's some angry stranger packing. That didn't help at all, and I was starting to get worried. But then I saw him. It looked like a man crawling around, unclothed, in the nearby bushes. Then the guy looked over at us. He stared and simply breathed heavily. All I remember was my cousin screaming what the F as we took back off down the trail at full speed. We went so fast, so suddenly, that I heard a crack in my neck. When we thought we were far enough away, we finally stopped and stared at each other, wondering what in the world that guy was doing out there, and wondered if he had been following us, especially considering how large the forest was, and the odds of us accidentally running into anyone were extremely low. My cousin and I took a break from hunting for a while after that, creeped out and altogether weirded out by the woods. Scary Strange Noise When Hunting by Average Redneck Back in 2017, I was deer hunting on some public land on a lake that is in Oklahoma. That spot that I hunt at is on an old railroad track from the late 1800s to early 1900s before the lake was built. Along the track, you can even find remnants of old houses, buildings, wells, and things like that. There is even a small creek that runs along the edge of the railroad track. Across the creek is an old town where everything was demolished in the process of creating this lake. There's even an old abandoned cemetery in the woods near the town. There are not many houses anywhere near where I hunt, just woods for miles, and a few houses on the border of the public land. Now that you know about the lay of the land, I will get on to my story. I was 16 years old and had been hunting basically my whole life up until then, and I've had so many strange occurrences while hunting that I didn't scare too easily. I hunted this particular spot for over four years at that point, so I knew the area extremely well and can quietly get to my stand without being noticed by game. That morning, I wanted to be in the spot extra early. I got up about two hours before legal shooting time, got my stuff and started to walk out to the stand. I had an uneventful walk to the railroad track, but when I got to the track, I started hearing it. I had about a 400 yard walk to get to the stand and when I first heard the noise, I immediately got chills. The noise was a very loud whistling type noise that lasted about 1.5 seconds and occurred in about five second intervals. And guess where the noise was coming from? Straight from my stand. I stayed where I was for about five minutes just listening to the sound. At that point, I found that the noise was coming from past the stand. So me being the avid hunter, I decided to risk it and go to the stand anyway. I slowly worked my way to the stand, stopping every few seconds to listen to the noise again, then continuing on. Finally, an hour before sunup, I made it to the stand and climbed up, but the noise was still going on in the distance, but louder now. I sat for a while taking recordings of the noise on my phone and researching what it could have been. It was 10 minutes before sunup now, and I hear the noise in the distance where it had previously been coming from, and then the noise comes again on the hilltop, only less than 100 yards away from me. Then, complete silence. I didn't hear it again. That was the first time I'd ever heard such a noise, 
It sounded like a roaring wind howling in the distance, except there was no wind at all that morning. There are no oil rigs in the area either, no civilization. So how, what made the noise? Any comments on this would be greatly appreciated. One day I went to visit a Native American friend that I knew. I ended up bringing up the recording of the sound. His eyes widened and he said it sounded exactly like a Native American flute. He had one of his own and began playing it and he was completely right. But how in the world would an instrument that small echo so loudly and clearly throughout the entire forest? Skinwalker by Kristen. This is a story from my brother Pete. Back in 2012, him and my grandpa used to hunt off of the Dober extension in a large area of woods. I should mention that both Pete and my grandpa were qualified army sharpshooters. The woods they hunt in don't have many houses or anything around except a small unmarked graveyard with about 10 graves in it. They were squirrel hunting when Pete heard something peculiar. He turned to see what looked like a large dog with mange. It either didn't have a tail or had it tucked between its legs where they couldn't see. They weren't sure. It walked across the path and into the woods. Our grandpa decided to call it a hellhound. Well, a few weeks later, my brother was hunting by himself and he saw it again. He wasn't sure what was wrong with it so he decided to try and put it out of its misery. So he shot at it a few times, but the thing never flinched. He knows he hit it though, because it wasn't standing very far from him. It ran and he followed it for a bit, but never saw any trace of it. No red splotches on the ground or even footprints. A few days after that, he went back to see if he could find the body to bury it, but all he found was a fresh pile of meat. He said it was so fresh, it was still steaming from the heat of the animal they were from. But there was no body or any evidence that anyone had been there, and again, no tracks either. My brother got a 9mm about a month later and wanted to try it out. Him and our grandpa went out again. They were walking along when they saw the creature once more. Pete ended up emptying the entire 9mm clip into it but you could probably guess again that the thing did not flinch. It simply growled and ran off. He hasn't really had much time to do any more hunting because his daughter was born the next year and our grandpa got sick and passed away a few years later. But the story remains with Pete. It's a story he often tells and it's always with a straight face. It touched my leg by Steely. It was 95 or 96. I must have been in my mid-30s, and all I ever found myself doing in my free time after work was going out in the woods, sitting in my deer stand, and waiting for the perfect target. I hunted for the fun of it and for the food. I couldn't get enough deer steak. I was raised on it and always loved it even if my wife thought it was annoying to have to cook deer steak so often. Well, on one experience, something horrifying happened and it stopped me from hunting for a couple of months, but overall, it couldn't get me to stop going out there altogether. I was sitting in my tree stand one afternoon. The sun was beginning to come down, but there was still a lot of visibility and a whole lot of orange. As it was getting darker, I began to hear movement coming from within 25 yards ahead of me. It was heavy movement too, and how I hadn't heard it before it got so close was beyond me. I looked through my scope to get a good look at what it was, but it blended in with the orange surroundings so much that it looked more like the plant life was coming to life, beginning to move around like one tangled mess. But as the creature drew closer, I realized it was fur that I was looking at fur that perfectly blended in with the autumn scenery. When it was about 15 yards away, I saw it completely, and I'm afraid to say that it saw me as well. My mouth froze wide open, and I stared at the thing, which was at least eight feet tall and covered with orange-brown fur from head to toe. 
It had the face of an ape, but eyes that were terribly similar to a man's. I could even see from that distance its eyes dilate as it seemed to lock in on me. And then it began to approach. Now I was armed, and I was thinking about taking aim at it, but something told me to hold off, told me that firing at it would be a bad idea. So I let it come closer. Ten yards away. Eight yards away. Four yards. Until it was so close that it literally reached up its arm and placed its massive hand on my boot. My size 13 boot. The hand of the thing completely enveloped my boot until I couldn't see it anymore. And I thought he was about to drag me down, yanking me from the tree stand. But he didn't. He stood there, seeming to be fascinated with the texture of my boot. It looked down at my feet to get a good look at what it was touching. Then it looked back up at me, and it walked away. I didn't stop staring until I could no longer see the thing. And when it was gone, I climbed out of the tree stand and walked slowly, quietly, and nervously home. Of course, what I saw I believed to be a Bigfoot, and everyone I've told, even my wife, doesn't believe it. Yet, that doesn't make my experience less real. Mysterious Cult in the Woods From Brian M. This story comes from my friend, Jay, so it will be told from her perspective. I'm an active hunter with my father, who was a drill sergeant for the US Army, and with my uncle, who has been hunting game for roughly 20 years of his life. I'm fairly new to the hunting scene with only seven months of experience, but nonetheless, I find it absolutely fun and appealing. This is the only experience in which I was actually scared for not only my life, but the lives of my father and uncle. This is how it began. It was a cold but fairly good Friday afternoon. I just got home from school and my uncle decided to stop by, planning a hunting trip to a new area we've never been to before. I forget the actual name of the place, but it was somewhere around Michigan. I was really happy since it would be the first time I've traveled there, and we were going to spend the whole weekend there as well. We got packed up and drove roughly about five hours, stopping by some gas stations on the way for some snacks and obviously some gas. I was starting to get car sick though, because I practically stuffed my face with some almond Hershey bars, my favorite. The whole ride there, my dad kept telling me to keep my eyes open, not to strive far from him or my uncle, since it would be a new area for all of us. We had multiple weapons in the car, including some pistols and a couple of bolt-action rifles, alongside a machete I brought from home. We finally arrived in Michigan, an area completely surrounded by woods, but we decided to stop and stay at a local motel for the remainder of the day, since it was already 10 p.m. and dark. Let me just say that motel gave off a really creepy vibe. We checked in and we were shown to our rooms. We settled down and prepared for the day ahead. It was an early Saturday morning, and we were having breakfast. That's when the weirdness started to happen. We were eating at a local diner, and everyone kept staring at us. Not to mention the whole place was silent, and the only sound filling the air was our spoons and forks hitting our plates. Then, from out of nowhere, a friendly old man came to us and introduced himself. Despite him being friendly, he probably gave out the creepiest vibe out of the whole entire place. He then proceeded to say, Aye, strangers, what brings you into these parts? You folks from around here? The whole time he was staring at me, and he smelled awful, like a mixture of cheap cigarettes and urine. My dad caught his gaze and replied, Hey there, no, we aren't from here. We traveled over here to do a little bit of hunting. We got tired of seeing the same old thing, so we decided to go somewhere new. The old man seemed a bit cautious at first, but then let out a huge smile. His teeth were fifty shades of black. Also, I noticed that everyone stopped looking at us, but the air still felt heavy for some reason. Ah, oh, okay. We enjoy seeing new faces around. Let me give you a piece of advice, though. 
If you start traveling too far into the woods and start seeing weird markings on the trees, I'd suggest you turn back. They don't take too kindly to new faces. The old man said ominously. They? My uncle asked, almost choking on some water. The wood folk, some sort of cult in the woods. Rumor is that they like to dress up as these creatures with the heads of skeletal remains like deer and wolves, only to take wandering strangers and sacrifice them to the wood spirits or something like that. That last part sounded as if the old man was just messing with us. I gave my father a weird look and he only managed to give half a smirk back. We told the old man we'd keep an eye out. After that weird experience, we decided to hurry up, and we went on our way. As soon as we got into the truck, we couldn't help ourselves. We started laughing. Taking everything the old man said, we practically threw it behind us. After all, he'd been joking, right? I kept telling myself that. If only I had taken it seriously. The remainder of the drive only took about 15 minutes from the motel. And during the ride, the only thing on my mind is how I found how gorgeous the scenery was. I felt as if I was in a different world. The forest gave off something only being there in person would cause. The closest thing I could compare it to was paradise. I was utterly mesmerized, totally forgetting what the old man had told us earlier. The first step I took while getting out of the car felt as if I had stepped through the gates of heaven. A peaceful, silent breeze made its way towards me. The fresh air hit my nose and I took a deep breath. When I exhaled, the release made me feel as if I had no negativity left in me. The forest itself sounded alive. I could hear the birds chirping, the squirrels making their way to their homes in the trees, and the sounds of branches moving slightly as the breeze hit them. All of this added up, making the place feel magical. Wow, my father said towards my uncle. This is totally different than what we see back home. I could see the smile on my uncle's face as if he had made the right decision to take us here. Finally, we grabbed our stuff and began to make our way to the site where we'd be camping. Unfortunately, it felt as if my rucksack weighed about a 100 pounds while my dad and uncle were walking with ease with their own rucksacks. For the 30 minutes of walking, I was only welcomed with friendly insults from my father and uncle. Eventually, we made it to the spot. We put our things down and established our tents and fire. It was afternoon by then, and the forest was still alive. I could have said that the walk with my rucksack was actually worth it. We started to hype ourselves up, making bets on who would bag the biggest catch. I made it my sole purpose to win that bet. After putting on camouflage and face paint, we began to head into the area in which we would be hunting. Another half hour or so, we found what appeared to be some tracks, but these tracks were weird because we didn't expect to find barefoot human tracks out here. Maybe we aren't the only ones out here, but the footprint does look fairly old, my uncle said. I'd forgotten about what the old man had said, and it seemed my uncle and father did too, since no one mentioned it. We decided to go further into the forest, leaving markings on the trees to know our way back to our campsite. We walked for roughly 45 minutes and my uncle was just about to mark the tree next to us when he saw that another marking was already there. We examined it and it looked like nothing we've seen. Best way I can describe it is a circle with a cross in it, with four different symbols in the spaces between the cross and the circle. That's when I remembered that old man had told us about markings. I couldn't help but get kind of anxious then, but I didn't need to bring it up because my father did. We all kind of looked at each other, my uncle saying that he had done some research in the area and found nothing about any cult in the woods, not a single thing. We all kind of chuckled, but we realized something. The woods had gone quiet, like too quiet. We knew that couldn't be good. We decided to go back to our camp since the sun was already setting by then. Not ten minutes go by when we hear movement to our right. There was a half-broken tree in the middle of a small clearing. It looked as if the grass there had died. 
the only area that seemed out of place, really. Then from behind the tree, I could have sworn I saw a figure, but it moved so fast, I couldn't tell. A moment after I saw it, it had moved behind another tree. Then we all heard it, a scream. Not a scream for help or in danger, but a scream that sounded territorial, as if it was getting ready to attack us. We booked it. We ran, just slightly able to see the markings we had left on the trees to show us our way back to our campsite. And for the life of me, I could have sworn I heard what sounded like multiple people running not too far from us. So I turned around and I saw something that still gives me goosebumps. There, roughly 15 feet behind us, were three figures, all roughly six feet tall, wearing some sort of animal skin. I only knew that because I could see their bare legs and they seemed to be wearing skeletal remains on their heads. I could also slightly make out that one of them had some sort of weapon and to make matters worse, they were all screaming or rather hollering, I could say. As I ran, my father and uncle stopped right alongside each other, turning around, firing warning shots into the air. That seemed to stop the figures. They just stood there, panting and staring right at us. I could make out a human face behind those skulls. We ran and ran until we got back to our campsite. We only took our weapons and booked it out from there. When we finally got back to the car, I must have blacked out, because when I woke up, I remember being on a highway, and my father and uncle had worried expressions on their faces when they noticed me. I could clearly see tears running down my uncle's face. My dad then stopped at a gas station. He gave me a hug, and after that, we made it home. My uncle blames himself, since the trip there was his idea. My father and I don't blame him, though. We're all just happy that we're safe. We've actually stopped hunting for a while. I didn't have any nightmares or anything like that. After a few weeks, we moved on from the experience. I'm sorry nothing cliche happened after the incident, but at times I still remember what that old man said. But that seems to be about it. We've told no one for the sake of my uncle. We didn't want people to blame him for something we all decided to do. But one thing I do know for sure. If you're out hunting in the woods in Michigan and you see those markings on the trees, leave immediately. Farm Life Near the Appalachian Trail From Anonymous I grew up on a farm pretty much in the middle of nowhere in lovely West Virginia. The log cabin I grew up in was very old. The land had so much history that photographers, historians, and others would sometimes find us and visit. We had about 245 acres of land in the Appalachian Mountains. My parents had only one rule out there, that I was not to go to the deepest part of the forest, so I didn't. Not even my older brothers would venture out that way when they hunted. Certain times of the year, my family would move our cattle to the field, right behind our cabin. I always thought this to be strange, because for the most part, they stayed in the valley that our home overlooked. As I got older and more involved with the farm, I would notice how my dad would start getting nervous towards that time of year. He would start making preparations to move them closer to the house, as he feared something in those woods. When I was around 10, I heard these strange sounds coming from outside my window. These windows were so thin, we had to put plastic and a big thick blanket over them to keep the cold out in winter. I heard the cows going wild in the field. Then there were these screeching, screaming, and growling sounds. I instantly thought coyotes were after our cattle, so I ran upstairs, waking up my father. He told me to go back to bed though, and he warned me not to look out the window and to not go outside. I thought this was very strange. On our land, we hunt coyotes. We hadn't seen any coyotes or bears in some time, but why? Why would my father just let these hounds attack our cattle? I couldn't sleep that night. I just thought of our poor cows and how scared they sounded. Even my pup was nervous. She stayed up all night with me. In the morning when the sun was up, my father and four of my brothers went out to the field with their shotguns. I followed along with them, and what we saw was 
terrifying to say the least. Something had brutally killed and dragged two of our cows into the woods. There was quite literally a blood trail leading to where they died into the forest. My father was very concerned. He was whispering to my brothers on what to do. He told them to make sure our home was secure in fear of whatever this was that it might get inside the house. I never understood how any animal could have done the carnage that I saw or how it might try to get into our home. Every year around the same time, some of our cattle would be killed by something, but I never dared to look out my window at night in fear of seeing what it was. Sometimes I swear I could hear something almost whispering in the fields to each other, or maybe even to me, as I sat by my window listening to them. Once, I swear I heard them say my name. We moved away from the farm when I was in my late teens, and from what I hear, no one has ever bought the land or lived on it since. The Moonlight Saved Me from Wicked Wendigo. The great state of Oregon is home to hundreds of miles of lush wilderness. There are many fun activities that can be done in such a vast place. One of my favorites is mushroom picking. I have family who live in northern Oregon, where mushroom picking is a very popular pastime. A couple of times a year, I'll take a trip up to my uncle's property to hunt for edible mushrooms. We've encountered some crazy stuff as one would imagine but this story is definitely the scariest encounter. My uncle's property is mostly dense forest. His house is just off a two-lane road and up a small hill. The main home is just up the hill surrounded by large oak, madrona, and aspen trees. The forest goes on for miles behind his home. Just to the left of the driveway is an 11-mile walking trail that circles his portion of land. This is where we travel to go hunting for mushrooms, We've had run-ins with mountain lions, skunks, abnormally aggressive bucks, and even a black bear. Sure, those were all terrifying, but nothing compared to what happened on a visit back in 2017. I arrived at my uncle's home late Friday afternoon. I'd planned on staying the entire weekend. I'd promised a few friends back home some delicious wild mushrooms, and I didn't plan on disappointing. I walked into my uncle's home and was instantly hit with the delicious smell of beef stroganoff. We greeted each other and I put my bag into the spare bedroom. Once dinner was done, we sat at his table and discussed the areas we'd be exploring the following day. After dinner, we hunkered down for the evening. I fell asleep shortly after. I awoke some time later, I'd guess early morning. I heard a car alarm blaring from the open bedroom window. The window was on the right side of the home, so you couldn't see the driveway from there, only the dense woods surrounding the home. I peeked out the window to see flashing red and yellow lights illuminating the trees. I quickly gained my composure and realized what was going on. I rushed out of the bedroom, passing my uncle's room on the way. He was still snoring loudly, unaware of the chaos that was occurring. I then peeked out of the kitchen window that looked out over the driveway. I noticed that my Ford Fusion was the vehicle responsible for the loud alarm. All four of my doors were wide open, and my headlights were flashing. I grabbed my keys from the kitchen counter and pressed the alarm button. The noise and flashing lights stopped. I started to make my way outside when I stopped at the window just by the front door. I couldn't see anything out of it but my own reflection due to the hallway lights being on behind me. I made my way down the hall flipped the light switch, and tiptoed back to the window. Looking back, obviously if anyone were outside, they would have noticed the lights turning off. So my tiptoeing was futile at hiding my location. Anyway, I made my way back to the window. I sat there for a few moments, letting my eyes adjust to the darkness. My face was pressed against the cool glass with my hands cupping the sides of my face when I saw it. In the dull blue moonlight, I could make out two silhouettes standing just behind my car. The man on the left stood about six foot two and had a muscular build. He had the unmistakable outline of an axe resting on his shoulder with his left hand on the handle. The other man was a few inches shorter and had a husky build. He held something in his right hand down by his side, 
but I couldn't make out what he had. I was crippled with fear. I didn't want to move lest they see me, but I felt as if they were staring at me already. I finally gathered up the courage to back away from the window. I rushed to my uncle's room. I shook him awake, and I quietly explained the situation. My uncle grabbed his phone and dialed 911. I grabbed the baseball bat from the hallway closet and stood by the front door. My uncle joined me soon after, sporting an old hockey stick. My uncle is a hippie, so unfortunately, he didn't own any firearms. He explained that since he didn't live so far from the nearest town that the county sheriff's office and the state police were en route, but it would take around 20 to 30 minutes. I knew if these men tried to enter the house, there would be little in the way of an advantage for us. We decided to sit against the wall near the front door and await whatever might happen next. We didn't dare look outside the window. I just pictured the axe-wielding man putting his blade through my head the second I put my face against the glass. So we just sat there waiting. Suddenly, we heard a few loud bangs followed by crashing brush and branches. After that, we finally saw the flashing red and blue LED lights illuminating the driveway. It was the longest 20-something minutes of my life. We went out to greet the state troopers and to give them our story. I noticed that my brake lights and rear passenger side window had been smashed. All my belongings inside my car were thrown all over my seats and outside on the ground. The trooper said that the impact areas on the window were consistent with a hammer. That explained what the chubby guy had been holding by his side. They took some pictures, gave us a report receipt, and told us they'd keep a deputy outside our driveway until the next morning. And that next morning, I drove home after convincing my uncle to finally invest in a firearm. Nothing ever came of the police report, and my uncle and I have yet to see the two men again. I shiver at the thought now, but if that moon hadn't been shining so brightly, I would have walked out to my car, and I would have been completely unaware of the two men that stood just behind it, with evil intentions. It almost got me. From Jacob R., it was a relatively chilly January afternoon on my grandfather's property in 2018. My father and I always go to Mississippi to go hunting on my grandfather's land. He owns about 150 acres of land that has been passed down through the family for generations. It was a year like any other when we arrived at my grandfather's house, and every year prior to this one we had amazing success with our hunts. But this year seemed to be a little bit lackluster, with us only killing two bucks and a doe. We were nearing the end of our trip, and as the last night fell upon us, I hopped on my four-wheeler and headed to my box stand, proudly carrying my 308 rifle with me. My father followed right behind me in his Razor UTV, seeing as the stands he and I were headed to were only about half a mile apart from each other. As he neared his stand, we wished each other good luck and parted ways. I arrived at my box stand around three o'clock in the afternoon, I got settled in a good position with clear visibility from all sides. I turned on my butane heater so I wouldn't freeze my tail off. To pass the time, I decided to play some pool with my dad on my phone while waiting for something to show itself. Half an hour turned into an hour, and then another. I was starting to get bored, and I decided to take a short nap. I woke up some time later as I heard something moving around in the brush. Keep in mind, I'm a very light sleeper, so any little noise can wake me up. I perked up, trying to listen for any more movement or what direction it was coming from, but I heard absolutely nothing. The woods that were so vibrant before with wildlife and sounds of the wind brushing through the trees and small shrubbery had come to a complete stop. I'd never had this happen to me before out here, so it startled me quite a bit, but being a dumb teenager, I brushed it off then dozed back to sleep. What a mistake that was. I was awakened once more 45 minutes later to the sound of something being chewed on, coming from my right side. I got excited, thinking that a buck or doe had wandered out of the thicket. But to my surprise, I didn't see anything around me. Getting frustrated, I shifted in my seat and accidentally bumped my rifle. It slid off the railing and fell on the floor of the box I was in. 
The chewing sound then came to a sudden stop. I heard something run off deep in the woods, which further angered me. Another 15 minutes went by, and at this point the sun was beginning to set, which meant shooting light was coming to a close. I started to hear footsteps coming from my left, but these weren't the footsteps of deer. They were from something walking on two legs. I looked in the direction of the sound, but once again, I didn't see a thing. Then I heard something that sent chills down my spine. Jacob, Jacob, I hope you have good luck. Only for a moment, it sounded like my dad's voice, but after repeating the phrase, I realized this wasn't my father. Whatever it was sounded recorded and distorted. It almost seemed like a forced imitation of my dad's voice. My heart raced to the point where I was ready to say screw it and leave. But just as I'd gotten ready to get up, something broke the wood line and came out of the opposite path that I came from to my box stand. It was this pale and lanky creature with grayish skin and almost no hair on its body. Upon its head, there appeared to be a decaying skull of a buck with black pits for eyes and a mouth full of razor sharp teeth. It was hunched over with arms so long, they were dragging their long, sharp claw-like hands on the ground. Even at its current posture, it towered well over me at seven feet tall. It was horrifying to look at, but I couldn't look away out of fear. I heard it repeat that same phrase for a third time. Then it stood up straight, with antlers darn near touching one of the highest branches of the tree next to it. I covered my mouth, so as to not make a sound. I could hear it sniffing the air. It let out a deep and guttural growl, saying, You can't run, Jacob. This was a voice that I did not at all recognize. At this point, my flight or fight instinct kicked in. I grabbed my rifle and flew down the ladder, trying to get to my four-wheeler as fast as I could. I hopped on, trying to start it, but all it did was crank over, Meanwhile, this creature began to come at me. I tried to fire a shot at it, but to no avail. When my rifle fell, it must have gotten jammed, and in a sheer moment of luck, the darn four-wheeler came to life, so I peeled out of there, and the creature gave chase coming up close on my rear. I had my four-wheeler topping out at its max speed, and this thing was still keeping pace with me. At one point, it even struck the back of the ATV, breaking the taillight off. Flying down that dirt trail, I passed my dad's path to his ground blind, hoping and praying that he isn't in sight of this thing. I finally broke out onto the main gravel road, and so did that creature, continuing to chase me for a mile and a half, before finally falling back and letting out an ear-piercing scream behind me. I see my grandfather's house in the distance, and I let out a sigh of relief. As I flew down the driveway, I saw my dad's UTV parked outside. I slammed on the brake, coming to a sliding halt with dust flying from behind me. I ran inside, and to my surprise, my dad wasn't in the house. My grandfather told me that he had run to the store to get some things to cook dinner for tonight. I sighed in relief again and went into my room to change and calm down. A few hours went by. During that time, I got packed up ready for the 17-hour drive back to Virginia. Then I went to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night by the sound of tapping on my window. Now, mind you, I'm on the second floor of the house, and from the outside I hear that same phrase from earlier in the same exact voice. Jacob, Jacob, I hope you have good luck. I couldn't bring myself to fall asleep after that, and I didn't sleep until we left the state of Mississippi altogether. If you plan to go hunting in Mississippi, be careful. There are terrifying things that roam those woods, and I think what I encountered that awful night was a skinwalker. A Face I Won't Forget From Black Flames 31 So this happened about a year ago. 
My friend John had been discussing the upcoming hunting season for mule deer here in southeast Idaho. He told me to go up a ridgeline near a place called Black Canyon. We discussed his recent trip up there and how there was a herd hanging around the area. You see, in Idaho, the deer are hard to find. The woods are so large there that an animal could go its whole life without seeing a single person. John and I had been discussing how I, a recently diagnosed type 1 diabetic, could find a deer that season without having to hike through miles upon miles of timber. As I was figuring out the details of my hunt in my head, John smirked and laughed to himself. I asked what was so funny. Ah, uh, my dad never goes up Black Canyon, John replied. I asked, why? He made a face and tried to imitate his dad's voice. There's something up there, drove off the bears onto the mine. John is a fairly no-nonsense person and his dad drinks a lot, so obviously he never takes his dad seriously. Well, I didn't think much of this info, so I forgot all about it. I figured a big sow with her cub was up there and keeping everything away. So I started to prepare for my hunt after the conversation. I couldn't hike super far yet, so I bought a cheap tree stand. I'm pretty much the only person in town to use a tree stand here for deer hunting, so I got made fun of when people found out. I ignored them though. To heck if I was gonna let diabetes take away my ability to hunt. I could still enjoy things. So I set up the stand on the edge of a small clearing up a black canyon with my dad. The clearing had plenty of deer signs, so we were in luck. There was also a well-established game trail nearby, so it was really turning out to be a great spot. A few weeks later, opening day, I got myself up to the tree stand and began to wait for deer. Morning soon turned to noon and I still hadn't seen a thing. I took the moment to climb down to stretch my legs. I decided I'd take a nap at the base of the tree, so I laid against my pack and snoozed a bit. I woke up about an hour or two later. I immediately began hearing this weird sound coming from up the canyon. It was a whooping sound, and it was quite high-pitched. I was struggling to guess what it was coming from. After about five whoops, I heard another whooping sound from the east wall of the canyon, and then silence. The whole forest went silent at this. I climbed back into my stand. It was going to start getting dark soon and the deer would be moving again. After a little while, I heard some brush moving and I got my rifle ready. That's when a doe popped out of the brush with a fawn. But my tag was for a buck, so I just watched them bound past me. All of a sudden, I heard a loud crack like a stick being broken in half after being stepped on. But this didn't sound like a stick. It was more like an entire tree had been snapped in half. I figured a moose was walking around, so I focused on the direction of the noise. I could see a black spot in between the trees, so I zeroed in on it with my scope. It took me a moment to register what I was looking at, but I realized that it was a face a black face with a wide mouth, a flat nose, dark eyes, and it was staring back at me. It looked human, but not. It felt weird. I looked over its body. It was huge, definitely as big as a moose, but it was quite wide, too wide to be a moose or a regular person. I don't remember much after that, because I heard the thing scream, and it was like 10 semi-trucks roaring their engines all at once. It was terrifying. I fired in its direction. I probably missed, but it was enough to scare the thing away. I climbed down. I was getting out of there, but before I could get more than a few feet from my stand, I suddenly blacked out. I woke up with my dad kneeling over me, he had called me but didn't get an answer, so he became concerned and came looking for me. I don't remember how he got me all the way to my car through those woods. 
All I know is that I haven't been in those woods since. I gave John the go-ahead to get my deer stand, and I told him he could even keep it. But when he found it, he told me a tree had fallen on the ladder and bent it up. I didn't know what to think of this. I don't think it was a tree that fell on it. I think that thing took a whack at it. So I wonder what would have happened to me if I hadn't left. I told my dad about the thing I saw. He said he believed me. He said, lots of weird things happen in the woods. <sighs> I plan on going back eventually, but not to Black Canyon and never alone because I don't want to get caught alone with something like that again. It wasn't a cougar from Gavin D. My grandpa died when I was 10 years old. Believe it or not, he was attacked and killed by a mountain lion. The area we live in is known for them, and I've heard them at night. They're howls that sound like a woman being attacked. We lived in a small rural neighborhood in Arkansas, where the nearest town is about 25 minutes drive away. So there's not much to do but swim, fish, and hunt. My grandpa used to hunt the area near the lake, as deer and other animals thrived around the lake during the winter and all year round. I used to go with him until I was around seven, when both my father and my grandpa told me I could no longer go hunting until they had taken care of more of the cougars that lived near the lake. Even though I was small, I'd always heard that cougars didn't usually attack people in groups, but I obeyed them without question. Sometimes, though, my family would go to the lake to camp or have a picnic. My father always told my sister and I to stay away from the darker area of the woods near the lake, always justifying his orders, saying they couldn't keep an eye on us if we went in there, or that it was very sneaky. We obeyed him, of course. I'm 17 now. I often take walks to the lake with my dog Heinrich, who's a two-year-old German shepherd. The lake is about five miles away from my house, so the walk takes a little more than an hour. I left the house one morning in the late spring to walk and clear my mind a bit, as my parents recently divorced, and my search for a job wasn't really going well. I absolutely loved nature, it has always comforted me. I told my dad where I was going and what time I planned to be back. I left with my 45 and a machete, and Heinrich happily followed me because he knew where I was going. It was a beautiful day out, not a cloud in the sky, and the wind was calm. After walking about 45 minutes, Heinrich started barking and ran after a large rabbit. I wanted to go after him, but he always came back, eventually. I kept going, and as I was about 10 to 15 minutes from the lake, I heard a really strange noise. It was like a painful groan, but from an animal. It sounded roughly like a dog or an injured deer. I feared Heinrich had come across a mountain lion, somehow without me hearing it. I ran toward the groaning noise, and then I heard footsteps running fast behind me. I spun around to see Heinrich behind me. He looked horrified, but otherwise unharmed. I was perplexed. Then I realized that the groaning had stopped, and along with it, everything else had gone silent too. I realized then that I was in the part of the woods that was darker than the rest, the area my father had always told me never to go in. Heinrich startled me when he began to growl. He was staring at something in the distance, and then I saw movement, light brown like a deer. But it looked wrong when it came into view. It was not a deer at all. It wasn't a cougar for that matter either. This was something I'd never seen or heard of before something I never even imagined could exist. The creature was frail but large, with yellow eyes and that freaking face. A face that looked like a rat was placed in a grinder head first, 
It had massive fangs and matted wet fur. Whatever it was, it quickly noticed us. Heinrich had alerted it with his growling. The creature stood up on back legs and walked toward me, one slow but sure step at a time. I panicked, and then I remembered I had a 45. I hoped that it would scare it away or hurt it enough that I could get away in time. I aimed down the sights and then fired three times quickly. I know at least one of those hit because it screamed the most god-awful sound I'd ever heard. Imagine an entire building going up in flames with hundreds of people screaming inside. That's what it sounded like. I ran, choking on my own breath, barely managing to call for Heinrich to follow me. He did, and we booked it. I heard heavy footsteps and breathing behind me. I took my 45 again and glanced behind me to fire. This thing was too close, at least 15 feet away from me. I shot twice and ran harder, and another scream erupted behind me. And suddenly, I didn't hear any more footsteps. But I did hear something else. Something that made me stop cold in my tracks. Gavin, don't go too far, son. That sounded an awful lot like my grandfather's voice. I know I shouldn't have stopped then, but I couldn't control myself. I stopped dead in my tracks. That voice came again. Come back over this way. I don't want you to get hurt. I screamed and unloaded the rest of my rounds into the forest. I could not see where it was now, but I fired hectically with blatant disregard of everything around me. When the chamber remained empty, I ran. Heinrich stayed close to me. As soon as I opened the door back home, I slammed it, and I collapsed on the floor. Heinrich lay beside me, just as tired and traumatized. The hell are you doing, son? My dad demanded when he saw me. I couldn't speak, though. I could just look back at him. He saw in my face that I was scared. He asked me a million questions and asked if a cougar had tried to attack me. I looked at him, and the only thing I could stutter was, not a cougar. He looked a bit confused. I took a deep breath and said, I, I don't think it was a cougar that got Grandpa. I told him my story, but I don't know if he believed me. I know what the heck I saw, and something makes me think my father does too, deep down. That was eight months ago. I sometimes hear my name being called from the woods. I dread seeing that thing again, but I feel as if it's waiting for me. That alone keeps me awake at night. The Bigfoot from Trevor L. This all started towards the end of spring in 2016. I was hunting in the woods one day. It was fairly quiet, and I didn't think much of it. After having bad luck with deer, I noticed some crawfish in the creek next to me. I bent down to try to pick one up. Suddenly, in the middle of the creek, there was this loud splash of a rock hitting the water. I jerked my head up and just stared at the water, afraid to move. I looked at the trees above, and I noticed that they were still, meaning the rock hadn't fallen. I immediately thought, Bigfoot, I've seen plenty of documentaries on Animal Planet to know about this creature and the rock throwing it supposedly does. For my own safety, I quickly moved away from the woods. This next experience came a few months later in the fall. At the time, I was a Boy Scout, and we were camping at Beaumont Scout Range. That night, we were doing a flag retirement ceremony. For those of you who don't know, a retirement ceremony means we burn the flags in a certain fashion, and for us it meant remaining silent for up to an hour. During this time, we began to hear the typical Missouri coyotes. There was apparently a pack south to our location. 
Then, in the middle of those calls, there was another call, much louder, much deeper than the coyotes. I was shaken by it, but I didn't say anything, even though I know we all heard it. On another occasion a month later, we were camping at the same location. This time it was about three in the morning. I had awakened for an unknown reason and was trying to get back to sleep, when from the hills to the east of our tent, I heard a loud scream. Who would have been screaming that early in the morning? And what human can scream like that? I tried to ignore it, but it kept going, and my mind was reeling. Then from the west, something began responding to it with the same type of call. If I had had my phone at the time, I would have gotten it out and began recording this sound. I eventually got back to sleep, doing my best to forget about it. Later on, I asked another camper about it, but he had apparently not heard anything. A couple of years passed, and it was soon the spring of 2018. I had forgotten the previous experiences and had resumed hiking in the woods behind my house. It was always so peaceful there, and on this particular day, I had been bird watching. I was walking home quietly, maybe talking to myself about something stupid, when a small reddish-brown animal ran across the creek, back up onto the bank, and then out of sight. I didn't see it for very long, but in the short period of time that I did, it reminded me of one thing, an adolescent ape. A month later, I was a few hundred feet from where I saw this thing, when from the other side of a ridge, I heard a splashing in the creek. Something was running around in the water, and I could hear it getting closer. I was expecting a massive ape to run over the ridge. The thought of this freaked me out, but nothing ever showed up. It just stopped instead. I waited where I was standing for what felt like hours, before hastily rushing to my home. I later read that some researchers believe that mother Bigfoots will drop their babies off at a location for periods at a time, sometimes days, while they go hunt. I believe that the areas behind my house are one of these nurseries, and that what I may have seen was a baby, and that maybe I was mock-charged by the parent. Of course, I'll never know. I'm going camping again this weekend, so maybe I'll experience some new activity. What I Didn't Know From Anonymous I have no idea what I found deep in those hillside woods. There was no precedence in my mind for the shape that presented itself in front of us that day. Well, 20 years ago, my life was fairly aimless. I was a year or so removed from high school and I was working at my family's business with the aim of eventually taking it over. Most of my friends had left our small town for college or greener pastures. So I, along with one of my few remaining friends, Jeff, would frequently spend our time enjoying some of the outdoor activities that our surroundings presented. Some days we fished, others we would swim or boat ride. When in season, we would hunt game, like white-tailed deer or the recently reintroduced elk species. We were riding in Jeff's Jeep, enjoying some off-roading on the logging trails that snaked their way through the surrounding mountains. It was about 9.30 in the evening, and the sun had just made its way beneath the horizon by the time we made it out onto the trails. Most of the paths we took were wide and flat, paved with gravel and bits of sandstone and coal that fell out of the big dump trucks as they went about their business hauling. The trail we had wandered onto was one that neither of us had ever encountered. It meandered its way around the back side of the mountain, and had become little more than a dirt path that was only slightly wider than our vehicle. Tree branches stretched out like the twisted leprous arms of some forgotten beasts in the wild. That aside, we were enjoying ourselves and didn't pay these ominous signs any attention. About an hour had passed before we realized that we were well off the main trail and we needed to turn around to keep ourselves from not being able to get out. Jeff spotted a trail up ahead of us that went out and to the left that emptied into a large field of high weeds ringed by maples and oaks. 
this would be where we turned around, and also where our perception of what was real in this world got turned on its head. As he slowed the jeep down and made the turn, the headlights swept out over the tops of the weed shafts and settled onto a large, dark silhouette. Jeff slammed his foot onto the brake pedal and sat motionless in his seat. So did I. We both stared out the windshield at a spot in front of the jeep where the lights settled, but our brains weren't making sense of what our vision was feeding it. Standing at a height of about eight to 10 feet tall and about four to five feet wide was something that I hadn't seen up to that point in my life, something that I have not witnessed yet again. Where the lights should have bounced off at different angles and shapes of the body in front of us, Instead, it seemed to soak into this shape. The black that made up the only discernible difference from the landscape around it was such an absence of any light that it honestly looked like it was drinking in the light. So instead of being able to see the shape illuminated by the lights, we could only see that it was there by looking at the trees and shrubs around it. Its shape was like that of a large man with a broad-rimmed hat and some kind of overcoat. The big hat shape that sat at the top of the shape in front of us sat on what could only be called a head with a slender neck that draped into lithe shoulders and down into arms that kind of disappeared into a borderless absence. There were no legs to speak of, nor were there any facial features. D do you see what I see? I managed to ask Jeff in a horribly shaky voice. He didn't reply, but instead threw the shifter into reverse and slammed the gas pedal against the floorboard. The back tires slung rock and dust alike into the air as we raced backward and away from this dark anomaly. The cloud enveloped the vehicle from behind and to the sides, blocking the creature from our view. Normal thought processes ceased to exist for the next few seconds as we tried in vain to grapple with what we had just seen. We only stopped racing backward when his truck slammed into a small dogwood tree on the other side of the trail we had been on. This seemed to shake some of the fog from our brains, as Jeff then put the gear shift into first and sped back down the little trail with me screaming a string of curse words that I didn't even know I knew. As the tires finally met with asphalt further down the mountain, we looked at each other for the first time since seeing the hat man. Neither of us spoke, as we knew what the other was thinking from expression alone. He dropped me off at my place, and I stepped out of his vehicle not knowing what to say. I turned to look at him. We both simply nodded to each other. Sadly, we never got the chance to talk about it again. This must have bothered Jeff on a disastrous level because only a few days after this, I got a call from his sister. Jeff had overdosed and died. Only over the past few years have I heard accounts of so-called hat men and watchers. Back then, I had absolutely no idea what I was looking at or what to call that thing. I did know it was there, though. I don't know if we just happened across something we weren't supposed to see, or what the case may have been, but I've carried that night with me for the past 20 years. This is my first time trying to put it on paper, and if I had a moral to share with you, it would be just be careful out there. I was the hunted from America's Hottest Redneck. This took place in the woods of Kentucky in the fall of 2018. My grandmother had given me a hunting rifle for my 17th birthday, so I was excited for a hunting season. Disappointment came when I did not get paid enough to purchase a hunting license or tags. My grandmother and mother surprised me with all the things I would need to hunt that year, though. My grandmother owned 32 acres of land in southwest Kentucky, so I was planning on hunting for deer on her property. That was a decision that I regret terribly. I went to her house that day excited to get outside. I showered, ate breakfast, 
and went out to the stand. When I made it to the stand, I climbed up into it and loaded my rifle. I sat very still as I waited for a deer to show up. I remember feeling very drowsy. I must have fallen asleep because when I woke up, two hours had passed. I checked my phone and saw the time. 12 p.m. It was lunchtime. I started down the ladder of the stand when I noticed something moving behind it. It was a tall creature standing in the darkness of the woods. I couldn't make out many details, except that it stood nearly at the top of my eight-foot ladder stand. I heard a low growl emit from it when it noticed that I had seen it. One word came to my mind. Run. I jumped down the rest of the way to the ground, and I sprinted. Whatever that thing was jumped into the sunlight after me, and I finally got a good look at it. It looked like the biggest wolf I'd ever seen, but wolves don't stand on their hind legs. I fired at it with my 30 6 hunting rifle. I heard an immense yelp, but instead of it slowing down or stopping, it charged me even faster. I did not think I could make it to my grandmother's house. At one point, I swear I could feel it breathing on my neck. But I made it back to the house. I shut the door and locked it and reloaded the rifle. My grandmother smiled and asked if I got anything. After taking a deep breath, I simply told her I had spotted one, fired and missed. Beware the woods of Kentucky. There are things that lurk in those woods that will kill you if they get a chance. I'm simply lucky that I made it out of there. I guess that massive wolf wasn't hungry enough, or it simply wanted me to leave its forest. Number 1. The Forest Behind My House Submitted by Norman I haven't shared this story with anyone because I don't like to relive the memory or more accurately, memories. I should clarify that I live on a 28-acre property in the northern US and behind the home that borders the road, there is a fairly large forest that stretches significantly to the south and west until it reaches I-75 on the western side. I don't exactly know which of the several events I've experienced would be considered the most or least horrifying per se, but I'll try to order them chronologically. Because, in my opinion, they've developed into progressively more horrifying encounters the older I am, and the more persistent my memory is. So forgive me if the arrangement is more of a bounce than a progression. I'll start with the time I was five years old. Throughout childhood, my grandfather would always remain soundly in holiday spirit. On each Halloween, he would put up old pillowcases with cloth hanging from trees to creepily decorate the edge of the forest I lived next to. On Christmas, he would strictly enforce the English tradition of telling ghost stories, and in the summer, he would eagerly anticipate the arrival of Independence Day solely to set off some M80 firecrackers, the big ones, at midnight. Although the dogs didn't like this, nor our sleeping neighbors, I always found contentness in his will to have a good time. This is besides the point. Let me get back to that point. Those fake ghosts he would hang from trees, the cloth and pillowcase entities that were about three to four feet long, were where this started for me. Until I was five, he did this every year, even before I was born from what I've learned from my mother. On Halloween of 2005, after returning from school, as I was being driven towards our house, I saw the human effigies he hung, and I was excited that another year of tradition was condoned. Upon closer inspection, I noticed one of the ghosts had red spots on its left torso, with a little bit of staining on the right shoulder. I asked my grandfather, what did you use to make that blood that's on them? He looked at me kind of silly as he opened the truck door. When I got out, he responded in a voice you'd use to treat a child babbling nonsense. I didn't put anything on them. 
At the angle the truck was now at, where we had driven up the lane, our house was now obstructing the view of the forest, so I asked him to walk around the home with me to see what I was talking about. I know what I saw, and I was absolutely positive it was a red shade. When we got to the other side of the house, around a spot where today a magnolia tree stands, I pointed at the effigies, but before I could mutter my brag of being right, I was horrified to see that there was no such effigy with blood on it, and even more chilling, there was one less effigy than there was before. Because originally, there had been three hung, always three, it was a simplicity thing. When I saw the blood-tainted effigy earlier, there were four. I thought nothing of this, but now it had become ironic that I paid no attention because of how bizarre and creepy it was. Because as an adult, as I look back on it, I know what I saw appeared to be a hanging child, which is a thought I do not fancy entertaining at all. It was so disturbing. Every time I recount my original view of the four effigies, I think about how real the bloodied one looked. Every now and then I have nightmares of it lifting its head and seeing myself with a noose around my neck. Anyway, I'll tell the second encounter I had with the forest, which occurred when I was nine. This one is slightly less clear, but more memorable. Every August, my grandfather would take me deer spotting in the forest. This was to get an idea if it was worth hunting back there each season, or if it was too much trouble. On this particular day, we were about 200 meters into the forest, lying atop a log concealed by a small hill. We had been there for at least four hours now, just sitting. As a nine-year-old child, I was definitely tired. I went to sleep, and to my terror, I had one of the recurring dreams I described earlier, of the boy hanging from a tree. Only my grandfather was the one hanging now. This troubled me deeply, and I woke up. As if things couldn't be worse, it was dark when I woke up. I don't even know how. My sleep felt like a power nap at most, nowhere near long enough to put daylight in the grave. I reached for my grandfather and found to my relief that he was still there, but he was asleep as well. Older folks easily drift off. I shook him awake and told him I needed to go home. I developed an overwhelming feeling of dread, but before I could convey that to him, he shushed me and said, Be quiet. I asked why, why there was no sound in the forest anymore, which I had only just noticed, which was entirely odd on its own. After a very quiet moment, he agreed that we should return home, so we began the journey back, ending the hunting day early. Luckily, the return was uneventful until we came upon the remains. They appeared to be dog bones. There was even a skull, which was odd for me to see because in the forest when we stumbled upon bones, the head was always gone for whatever reason. We continued cautiously past the discovery and were basically in my backyard now when a very distinct voice filled my ears from behind us. Be quiet. I turned to the forest expecting to see my grandfather behind me, but instead, there was no one there. But it sounded exactly like him. In fact, it sounded exactly how he had said it. Not like someone else trying to mimic him, but like someone had just repeated it from a tape. I turned back around to see my grandfather further ahead. Scared, I ran to catch up to him. But then I heard it again, and nearly cried when I heard it. It repeated the exact same words from last time so perfectly, like a recording. So I just power walked to my home and pretended nothing happened, even when my grandfather asked why I had just stood there for a moment. The next day, our neighbors that live north beside the church graveyard called and asked if I had seen their dog Josie that had went missing. Not wanting to crush their hopes of finding it in a slow and drawn out way, my grandfather informed them that we had seen bones the last night. This is important. 
because later that same day, they claimed their dog Josie had come back from the woods, but it was behaving extremely weird. And though it looked like Josie, they said it didn't act like Josie anymore. What did that even mean? That's all we ever heard of it, but it sounded more terrifying than anything yet. I'm pretty sure they never had the dog after the following of winter 2009. Fast forward six years, my sophomore year of high school. Me and a couple of buddies of mine had passed a college level exam for an advanced placement class, so with it being halfway through our high school life and that success being announced, we invited some more friends to see who was interested in having a party at my place. Most of the party was uneventful, just my family cooking in front of a bonfire on the side of the house closer to the church and graveyard. It was boring until we decided to play manhunt. Sometimes I look back on the decision to do this and don't comprehend how stupid we really were. I guess I just pushed the past out of my knowledge, rolling it all out as my childhood exaggeration and distortion of fact. It is an important detail to add that one of my friends, the main two being the friends I'm referring to, was playing my Xbox earlier without my permission and often treated my house like it was his own, putting his shoes up on furniture, etc. I wasn't happy about it, but I figured I'd get him back someday. Now on with the story. My friends, who I'll refer to as Ken and Paul for privacy reasons, were assembled with me and my cousins Nathan, Michael, and Gloriana in front of the bonfire. Before we ran across the property, I made it abundantly clear and painfully obvious I did not want anyone going in the woods. I voted myself to be it first, since I was hosting, and I got a flashlight. Forget how the round played out and what order I found people in, but for context, I'll say Ken was hiding behind a chimney, Eric was inside eating leftover hamburgers, Gloriana had stayed cleverly next to the fire, blending in with the crowd that was observing our game. Nathan was in a tree, and my friend Jake, who apparently joined mid-match, was under my grandfather's truck. I'd found them all, and they joined me for my search. After scanning basically the whole property, it became more worrying for me that Paul had probably once again defied the rules of my house and went into the woods. Before we could line up at the tree line, Paul came to us with a worried look on his face. Of course he had went into the woods, but seeing his face, I was no longer mad. I was concerned what we were about to learn, judging by his petrified stance and his whiter-than-snow skin. After questioning him, he explained he had indeed hopped into the forest and recounted a totally different version of events than the other players knew to happen. You see, when we play, the people that are found stay with the hunter and assist his search, so it slowly builds up and goes by faster. Thus, our accounts were all in a sequence. But according to Paul, we had come by him several times, walking in front of him. He said at one point, he threw a stick to draw our attention somewhere else, and instead of following it, the person who saw it looked right at him and stood next to him. It was at this point he explained to us he realized that this was not one of us. His best description of what it was detailed along the lines of an all-black person with an animalistic face like a coyote's. He claimed when he realized this, he hauled himself out of the brush and eventually ran into us after hearing no pursuit. When we heard his story, I told everyone to walk to the other side of the house where the fire was and stay there for the rest of the night, grill some marshmallows and all that to forget about what happened. Sometimes over Xbox, me, Ken, and Paul talk about this experience, but each time it becomes less serious to them. However, whenever we do have a meeting at my place from time to time, we still feel very on edge about something in that forest. From the research I've done, I'm almost positive that the dark entities in my forest are skinwalkers. To say the least, I don't venture out there anymore, and I keep my grandfather from doing the same. I hope anybody who has the experience for themselves has a great faith in God, because without religion, I don't know how you would protect yourself from things like that. 
and that forest is pure evil, and I am happier every day knowing I don't have to go back out there again. But sometimes I still have the dreams, but I'm safe in my home. It's been consecrated, and while I'm safe, I want to tell as many people as possible to know that these monsters, or rather the paranormal, are all too real. Stay safe. Number two. The Hunter Being Hunted, submitted by The Hunter 2434754444. When I was 12, I got my hunting license for hunting deer, and I would go hunting with my brother as often as possible. Now, before this hunting season, a fire swept through the area so everything was wide open and easy to see through. But let's just say this area had always creeped me out, even before the fire cleared it. I wasn't very sure if it all being open was a good thing. One day, my brother and I went out hunting, and we decided to split up. As I parted from his direction, I could have swore I saw him a few times. I saw quick shadows darting between the trees, I assumed it was just him in the distance, or him following a trail and doubling back a bit. The fire didn't strip the land of trees, only of the undergrowth, really, but there was plenty of small canyons and valleys. As I approached a nearby creek, I continued to see a shadow between the trees, and I assumed that my brother was trying to sneak up on me. I acted like I didn't see him, and I made my way up a small ridge top. When I got up there, I suddenly heard my brother on the Motorola radio. He asked if I could hear him through it. I said yes, while listening to what sounded like footsteps behind me in the distance. As they drew closer, I jumped and turned around, expecting to catch him out in the open, but there was no one there. After an hour or so, I lost radio contact with my brother, but I did make one last attempt to tell him that I was heading home. I didn't want to be caught out here at night. When I walked through the door, my brother wasn't there, though he usually beat me home. My dad got a text from him not too long after I arrived, saying he was on his way. I went out to meet him where he was, and immediately I got chills. Where I met him, where he'd been hunting, it was well over two miles away from where I had been. I didn't mention the shadows and footsteps to anybody. I didn't even know if it was real what I saw or heard, because it didn't make sense. I just wasn't sure of anything. About a week later, we go hunting again. This time, we didn't split up. Everything was dead silent, and for the first couple of hours, all we saw was a single doe, and that was it. After a lackluster day of hunting, I told him when we got back that I'd be going out again the next day. He wouldn't be in the mood, he said, so I'd be going alone. The next day, I left for the woods around five o'clock. I entered that valley area, and it was getting cold and windier by the second. After about a half hour, I began to hear the same footsteps I'd heard before. They were maybe a hundred yards back, but with the leaves on the ground, I could very clearly hear human-like footsteps. I kept on going, trying to keep my mind focused on the hunt. The last thing I wanted was another empty and fruitless day. When the footsteps in the distance stopped, the footsteps that had somehow been following me, the noise was immediately replaced with a strange tapping sound. Every time I tried to look through my scope at the area, the tapping came from a different direction. Even though I hadn't found my spot yet, I was considering loading my weapon, just in case I needed to be ready for anything. Maybe 20 or 30 yards away, birds rushed out of some bushes, and I jumped. Something had spooked them, something incredibly close. I began hearing movement, and the snapping of small branches, and more footsteps. Right away, I decided to head back to the top of the valley. When I get to the top, 
I hear footsteps following me still, but I didn't look back. It seems now, every time I go into those woods, something follows me. Something keeps me too scared to try to hunt at all. Whatever it is, I don't think it wants me out there. Later on, I ended up talking to some people about my experience, but nobody had any similar stories or explanations. When I talked to my grandma about it, she said that the valley does not give her a good feeling though. So, I wonder, what is it that's in that valley that despises hunters? Number three, Monster in Boggy Creek, submitted by Rosemorn1117. I'm from a small town in southwest Arkansas called Fook, a place that's famous for the Boggy Creek monster. It's said to be a sort of Sasquatch who in the 70s allegedly terrorized my hometown and the surrounding area which spawned the documentary, The Legend of Boggy Creek. I've sadly never seen this large ape-like wonder, but have seen first-hand evidence of it and far worse monsters out in the swamps and hills, the land my family and I have hunted our entire lives. When you're out in the woods as often as I am, you're bound to see some very scary things. There are a thousand stories I could tell here, but the one that bothers me the most, the reason I no longer feel safe in the backwoods of my own homeland, it all began one evening when I was 15. Where we live, despite what wildlife officials of any form will admit, there are numerous large and dangerous animals. A razorback boar can tear up a man's leg deep enough to cripple them or even end them if it can get you on the ground. Gators can grow to just about any length and the only thing they fear is a bigger gator. And then there are panthers. We've heard and witnessed panthers taking a calf weighing well over double their size straight up a tree and gnawing at it for days. Panthers scream like a terrified woman and can move silently through the brush or outright overtake almost anything. Quite frankly, they unnerve me. But what I found on my own deer lease close to a decade ago has shaken me ever since. I never walked those woods without protection, and I never will. Now, I'm a big guy, maybe 200 pounds or more, and an easy six foot two. While hunting, I always carried a Winchester seven millimeter, a Taurus Judge, and Kukri for brush or emergencies. Nothing, I believed, could stand back up from a straight round from my Winchester but whatever the heck this thing was, it didn't even notice it. Anyway, I followed what I thought to be a hog trail up a hill near a distant stand we used during the second day of deer season. I'd never seen such an easy game trail in my life, and to be honest, I was relieved as I only had about an hour of daylight left. And then I saw the splotches of red, not much but enough to know something was hurt. I could physically see the signs of the poor thing being goaded along with bits of tissue and sizable amounts of that red coating the ground every few feet. I hit the crest of a hill, and at the bottom, I found what thought was going to be it. But there was a leg, mangled and red, lying there alone. From the amount of viscera around this area, I deduced that it was over right here, that it had been put out of its misery, Worse still, the mess was so fresh that there was still steam coming off of it. The hog's track showed less than two hours and it had to be more than a hundred pounds. I fired the Winchester in the air twice to signal for help and then I began to search the area. Whatever did this, the poor hog had no chance of putting up a fight. The thing that had taken it didn't leave a single track of its own. I soon found a small red trail leading off from the area and left something personal there to clue the others. By this point, I had half an hour of daylight, so I used my kukri to mark a tree every few feet as I walked. Within 10 minutes, I found the rest of the boar, 
and it wasn't alone. There were dozens of other remains, ranging from deer, pigs, cattle, dogs, and even a panther. The panther's head was missing from the rest of it, and the remains and pieces of the remains were strewn about as if tossed all over the place, like some sickening display. Remembering it as I am now, I make the joke that it was a garden, a crimson fetid garden made in the deepest part of the woods where no man would be foolish enough to wander. Suddenly, I heard a noise and snapped out of my horror-stricken state. I chambered around and caught a glimpse of it. It was thin, pale, grayish-white skin. Its eyes were black, and it had long claws that were still dripping with the hog's innards. It tucked behind a tree and appeared ten feet closer without making a single sound. It was like it just materialized right there twenty feet in front of me. I didn't want to give it a chance to get close, so I fired and hit it in the chest. But either it went right through or it didn't hit at all because there was no hole, no recoil from the thing, just the flash of the muzzle. It was only 20 feet. I knew I had hit it, so I tried again, and still nothing happened, except for the smile that grew on its face. I kid you not, it grinned at me. Its hollow eyes stared at me with a big razor-toothed smile, with a mouth bigger than a man's, at least twice as large, and then it began to move. I can still see the thing in my nightmares even now, so when I say even its movements were unnatural, I mean it. It shuffled, I think is the word, forward with a strange posture. I could see now its arms were almost double the length of a man's, though its legs were more canine-like. It moved almost awkwardly, while walking on its feet and knuckles. I dropped the Winchester, and I reached for my revolver, but the creature was within arm's reach before I could even blink. I fell over, and I could feel urine soak my pants. I knew it. This was it, man. I was going to be this demonic thing's art project. That's when I heard the shotgun from behind me to the right, from the trail that I had marked. My father... My uncle and a close family friend had been nearby, wondering where I was when they heard the shots. They opened fire on this thing with two hunting rifles and a shotgun at point-blank range. It didn't show a single wound. It just turned to face them and then back to me, smiling. After that, it bolted away and vanished into the woods. My dad helped me up and looked at me dead in the eyes, saying something but my mind couldn't process it. There was no going back to camp that night. I was in the pickup and on my way home inside of two hours. When we made it back to town, I was finally recovering from the shock. My dad and uncle set me down to talk once we got home, and I got cleaned up. These men were veterans, special forces, yet they looked so pale. My dad gave me a cup of coffee and said that none of the rest of the people I know on this planet need to know what is out there. He knew the game warden, and they would take care of things. As for what I saw, he only had this to say. Your great-grandpa knew the Indians that lived in these parts, and they used to warn us of evil spirits. Your grandpa won't hunt anymore because of something he saw as a young man. I've seen men die firsthand, and yet something I saw when I was just a boy wakes me up at night. All of us have seen things we can't explain. You got lucky. I got lucky and didn't lose my son tonight. So you take as long as you need to talk about it, all right? The next day, 30 armed men, including a preacher, scoured those woods as my dad picked up our gear and told them where he had last seen it. Officials bought and closed off the land without saying a word to anyone as to why. It all disappeared. After a few months of therapy, I was doing pretty well. I only wonder what could have happened to me. That and when I'll stop dreaming of whatever it was. A popular internet phenomenon dubbed the closest thing I've ever seen to its description was the rake, or even a windigo. 
but none of that matters. Now that I'm a father myself, neither my boys nor I go out into the woods alone, because I personally know somewhere out there that thing is waiting, and I'm going to make sure my son isn't its next victim. Number four, hunting, submitted by Ronald. I was only 13 when this story took place. I'm 16 now. This happened when me and my uncle Frank thought we would do a late night raccoon hunt. We loaded the dogs into the truck, as well as the 22s. We took a nice drive from his house to a disclosed hunting spot we unloaded the dogs and watched them run into the forest to find the raccoons. Me and Frank loaded our 22s. We turned on our flashlights and headbands, then we walked into the forest and already felt a creepy vibe. At least I did. We began walking in the direction where we last saw the dogs running. I think we walked for at least an hour when we began to hear the dogs barking at something. We started walking in that direction we were maybe a hundred feet away from the dogs now and could barely see them with our flashlights. My uncle looked at me and said, turn the lights off. I replied, are you crazy? It's too dark out here. He told me to just do it, so I listened. As soon as I turned my light out, I felt that same creepy vibe that I felt when we walked into the forest. I was trying to walk behind my uncle because I couldn't barely see where I was going. I kept feeling like someone was watching me, and I was a little creeped out. I decided to stop and see if I could see who was possibly following us, but I could see no one. I whispered to my uncle, Can I at least turn on one light? I waited at least a minute to ask again, because he never answered. So I started to ask, Do you even know where we're going? Then we heard a noise coming from behind us, and in front of us, all around us. I just stood there and stopped. I tried to do something, but no matter where I tried to go, the sounds were coming from that direction. Something was cutting me off. As soon as I felt there was no hope, my uncle came running at me saying, Ron, what's going on? As soon as I heard his voice, I felt like I just woke up from a dream. He said to me, I didn't see the dogs but I did see something tracking them. I'd never seen anything like that. We need to get out of here. He picked me up and started running towards the truck. I still felt so out of it. It was at that moment that I finally seemed to come to. But I also saw something that was following us. What is that? I screamed, yelling and almost crying. As soon as we made it back to the truck and out of those woods, Everything felt right again. I saw the dogs cowering in fear and whimpering. My uncle opened the door only long enough for them to get inside. Then we started the truck and floored it out of there. I had nightmares about this experience for weeks, and we never went back to that part of the woods. Even my uncle knew that it was no longer safe there. And number five, Mississippi Wampus Cat. Submitted by J.T. This story comes out of northern Mississippi, where the Tennessee and Mississippi line meets. I'm 14, and I've been hunting all my life, but this experience has put me well over the edge. It was last December, around the end of the month. The day started out with waking up around 6 in the morning, I wanted to get out there to the deer stand as early as possible to have a good start. I packed up my Browning 243 lever action and I headed out on my ATV. When I entered the pine thicket, which leads into the woods, something felt off. I had this feeling where something bad was about to happen, but I ignored it, which no one should ever do. When I got to the stand, the feeling I had earlier had only gotten stronger. About an hour in, there were no deer to be found. Thirty minutes passed, and I heard something coming towards the stand. I waited for it to come out of the brush, so I could see it clearly. When I did, without a doubt what I saw was no deer. What I saw was not normal. It was about the size of a cheetah, 
It looked to be a cross between a badger, a wild cat, and something that sort of resembled a lobo wolf. It must have been attracted to the call I used for deer. What came to mind was the wampus cat. I've heard stories from my granddad about the wampus cat, and I'm pretty sure that's what I was looking at. The beast walked toward the stand, and I was freaking petrified. I couldn't move. Even if I tried, I was frozen. Something was telling me to fire at it. Now I'm young, but I'm not stupid. There was no way I was going to risk not taking that thing down with the lack of firepower I had. I'm pretty positive that it hadn't seen me yet. About 15 minutes later into looking at this thing, still frozen, it must have lost interest in the call that it had heard. In an instant, the creature turned tail and ran back into the woods. I kept waiting though. Another 15 minutes passed and I made sure the creature was absolutely gone. Then I gathered up my courage and I slowly climbed out of the stand, then booked it back to my ATV. When it started, I turned around and at the corner of my eye, I could see its black velvet fur in the distance. Without hesitation, I booked it out of those woods full throttle until I saw my grandparents' house. When I ran inside, my grandpa immediately asked me, Are you okay, JT? You seem spooked. Yes, sir, I'm fine, I replied. I unloaded my gear and ran up into my room, and I just cried. My grandpa came to check on me and again asked if I was alright. I finally broke down and told him my experience, and he believed me. I haven't gone back in those woods since. Number 1. They Followed Us Submitted by Stephen S. This is the first time I've shared my story to anyone besides my two friends and my cousin, Eric, because they outright refused to speak about it, and I don't blame them. This incident happened about two years ago, during our stay at my uncle's house, and no, my cousin wasn't his son. He had a daughter who moved out long ago. His house was near Copper Harbor, about a four mile drive from where we live. It was a very isolated place. The house was two stories, and there was only a 10 yard walk to the tree line of the nearby woods. That's how close they were. Like any other concerned parental figure, he prompted me and my cousin to not go out at night and if we were out, to be in the house before it got completely dark. We can understand his worry, but we weren't some fragile children, or so we thought. To give some background, at the time I was nearly 20, and Eric was 21 the month before. Now, I was only going to stay there for winter break, so I had about two weeks to spend with my family that I hardly see, considering I live in the freaking blazing hot deserts of Nevada. The first week there was honestly boring. We sat around doing nothing but watching TV, playing video games, or just getting drunk. My cousin then, out of nowhere, proposes that we go hunting for the first time in forever, asking if I still had it in me to kill, which I agreed arrogantly. I have a bit of an ego when it comes to things like hunting. I'd say I'm a pretty good tracker as well. However, at my uncle's, there was only small game to hunt, things like pheasant or hare. Reluctantly, I still agreed to go with Eric, though I never truly cared for the taste of rabbit haunches. It was a Saturday when we arrived at about 1 p.m. We found a good parking spot at the entrance of a dirt road gateway. We parked the truck, unloaded our gear, and set off, though we would have gotten here earlier if it hadn't been for intensive drinking the night before. The forest was booming with life, it seemed. We could hear almost every animal active and moving throughout the rich greenery as we trekked in search of a meal to snag. About two hours into our journey and about a mile out, we hadn't come across any smaller game. It was disappointing that we couldn't bag a buck because we had many opportunities to. One thing I've always remembered about hunting game is to walk against the wind so that whatever you prey upon, or could potentially prey upon you, 
doesn't pick up your scent before you even come into view. Doing just that, we stalked throughout the mildly thick brush, scanning any signs of movement we could. About 200 more yards in, we come across a beat down shack near the edge of a large stream. It seriously gave me an eerie vibe the way it looked. As we got closer, that sense of fear only grew as we could visibly make out massive claw marks on the side of it. And these marks were up at about six feet off the ground. Given the fact that it was set up at an ideal fishing spot, we chalked it up to nothing more than a little shack someone used to house their fishing gear in. Maybe they even cleaned their catches here as well. And maybe a bear happened upon the scent. We had to solidify that theory the only way we could, by taking a look inside the shack. It was relatively small, about 15 feet across and 20 feet high. Upon entering, we were filled by the nauseating stench of something rotting. Inside, it had looked like a hurricane passed through, and there was a workbench that had been shattered, scattered pieces of broken equipment, and torn sheets. But what got our attention the most were the bloody stains on the floor and the walls of this tiny enclosure. They were dried up now, but flies still rot the area as if something were freshly killed in there. This made both of us nervous and nauseous, but we weren't going to be swayed so easily. We would just have to proceed more cautiously and aware. Now that we were more on edge, we continued back into the woods for another 100 yards or so, and we began to notice the wildlife sightings we were seeing so much on the way were progressively beginning to decrease. By now, all we could hear was the chirping of a bird every now and then. Suddenly, we saw it something about 20 yards away, walking towards the hills of the woods. We thought it was a bear, but there was something off about it. Its ears were much longer, but it had the stature of a bear walking on all fours. It must have heard something. Maybe it heard us creeping up, because it took off at full speed towards the hills, and the way it ran was so peculiar, almost like it was wounded, we were baffled. We seriously wanted to know what was up with this thing while remaining a safe distance away from it. But at the speed it was galloping, we needed to pick up the pace just to keep up. When it went up and over the incline, we stopped, wondering if this was a good idea. Dusk was about to fall upon us, and our uncle would have a fit if we returned late. But we had already made it this far. Again, that ominous feeling came. It almost felt like we were walking into a trap. We stood there for a moment, finally pulling up the resolve to follow it, when we noticed that not even the birds were chirping anymore. It was completely silent. We continued to follow its tracks when we came up over the hill which led down into a small valley about 30 feet down from our vantage point. The foliage was a bit thicker on this side, but visibility was not completely lost even with the dimming sunlight. Even still, we didn't see the creature. It was almost like it vanished. But then we heard a bunch of rustling and branches snapping just below us. It, or actually they, came into view. There were two of them now. They came into a small clearing between the trees and they hunkered over in awkward positions as if they were crouching. We just looked at each other utterly astounded by what we were seeing. I've never seen a bear sit like that. And when we turned back to look at them again, they were both looking directly at us. I felt my heart drop into my stomach when I came to the realization that those things, they weren't bears. I still remember the sheer terror I felt when I turned back to those glowing eyes piercing through us then one of the creatures did the unthinkable. It stood up. It stood up on two legs. In that brief moment, before I nearly wet myself, I could make out its arms and more of its facial features because its demeanor went from inquisitive to aggressive. 
Even from our distance, I could see those huge fangs. Its muzzle was like that of a dog's, which would explain those ears. But its arms, its arms were like a person's with clawed fingers. The one that stood up lacked the amount of hair the one that we had followed had, which made it all the more menacing to look at. And that was it. We bolted down that hill so fast, almost tripping and tumbling over each other as we hit the bottom. Then we took off through the brush. I've never ran so hard in my life. I remember I dropped my hat and glasses at that moment, but I could care less about them. We each had Remington 700 rifles, but I guess utter terror made us forget we even had them. But then we heard something barreling through the woods behind us. We were being chased. I heard my cousin beginning to cry as we broke through the tree line and back out towards that shack. When we were in front of it, I pulled out my rifle and motioned him to do the same. I turned towards the tree line, ready to shoot at those things the moment they came into sight. It was now pretty dark and we waited for what seemed like forever. We waited for them to attack. The silence was only broken by the swaying of the trees in the wind and my cousin screaming, oh my God. He was pointing at one of the trees to our right. One of those things was in the tree branches. It quietly flanked us. This threw me in an utter panic. That only worsened when my cousin fired at it. He must have hit it because it let out this ungodly blood curdling scream that echoed throughout the woods. It was like a man screaming with the undertones of a deep guttural growl. I wanted to die right there. I only grew more afraid because he only angered the thing. I grabbed him by his coat and we booked it back to the truck. My lungs were on fire, but I couldn't stop in fear that that thing was right behind me or above me. As we neared the trail, we broke the tree line and the truck was in sight, finally. Then from behind me, my cousin cried out and I heard a loud thud on the ground. I turned around quickly, relieved to see that he had only tripped, but that relief was short-lived when I saw that one of those things was silently standing and watching us from the tree line. This creature was easily seven and a half feet tall. Its arms went down to its knees, and those claws bore a gruesome scene in my mind of our demise. I quickly rushed over to pick up my cousin as we raced for the car. We stumbled with the keys before I finally unlocked it, and as soon as we got in, I locked the car and started her up, but Eric let out a chilling scream before I could take off. I was frozen when I noticed he was looking at my side of the car, and I regret ever turning my head in that direction. Its face will forever be burned into my mind. I still can't close my eyes without seeing it. Right in front of my window, inches from my face, its snarling face fogged up the glass. I could clearly make out its face, its eyes almost human-like, widened in a fully maniacal look. It seemed so full of hate. The expression on its face was one of the utmost intimidation. The only thing that snapped me out of this glare was the car shaking from my cousin's side as another one of the things put its hands on the window, then pressed its whole muzzle against it, glaring deeply at both of us. I quickly snapped out of my trance-like state and I freaking floored it out of there. I sighed in relief until I saw in the rear view that they were easily keeping pace with the truck. I was going about 45, so I pushed it up to 70 until I couldn't see them trailing us anymore. But even then, I kept that speed until we got back. As soon as I parked, we both raced inside, locking all the doors and windows when my uncle came screaming at us about how late we came back. But then we all went quiet when we heard it. A loud screaming that ended off like a howl just outside the house. My uncle went and grabbed his rifle and we stuck the night out together in the living room. We heard scratching on the walls. We heard movement on the roof as well. Needless to say, none of us went to sleep. When dawn finally broke and the noises stopped, 
all of us exhausted and still afraid. My uncle just looked at us and said, see why I told you not to go out at night. Number two, I ran into the Mogollon monster, submitted by Kyle J. I don't live in Arizona, but I often go there to hunt. This story happened at Mogollon Rim in Arizona in 1995. If you don't know where that is, it's 185 miles south of the Grand Canyon. I was maybe 15, and my Uncle Fred and my Uncle Mort took me hunting at Mogollon Rim. I believe we were hunting deer that season. When we arrived, we searched for a good spot to camp, then we got set up. We were planning on staying there for five days. Then we were going down to Flagstaff and we would hunt there for a few more days. On the second night, we were sleeping in our tents when we began to hear a little rustling just outside. We all silently headed outside together to see what was making the noise, but whatever it was was gone when we got out there. The thing had gotten into our cooler and took some of our food Uncle Fred just said, dang raccoons, but then Uncle Mort quickly chimed in. Fred, that was no raccoon. And then they both got into an argument. On the third day, we went out to find more deer, and as we were walking, Uncle Mort pointed at something in the distance. Uncle Fred looked into his scope. It was a dead deer. We ran up to it and saw something that gave me chills, a sight that I will never forget. There was this thing eating the deer. It looked like a Bigfoot, but it was smaller. It had like this big white beard going down to its knees, and its hands were bare naked, with nails that were like claws that were two inches long. The creature looked up at us, then it stood up, and this thing didn't act like a Bigfoot. It acted more human than anything. It picked up a club of some sort, then began to swing at us, we backed up and the thing ran out into the woods, disappearing from sight. Uncle Fred took aim before it disappeared and shot at the thing, and as soon as he did, there was this chilling scream flooding everywhere around us. It made us all plug our ears. I know Fred shot it. We didn't stay there any longer. We packed up and left right when we got back to camp. A couple of days back, I looked up the Arizona Bigfoot when I found something familiar. Whatever that thing was, people are calling it the Mogollon Monster. The description of that thing perfectly matches the creature we saw that day. Number three, Stalked by a Mountain Lion. Submitted by Matthew L. I was 19 years old back then. I was visiting my dad in a small town called Rio Grande City. He has a house inside his ranch, which is perfect because I love hunting. My dad and stepmom were going to be out for a few hours. They were heading out to a party and wouldn't be back until late. My dad tried urging me to come, but I didn't want to. But later on, I regretted that decision. As my parents left, I went to my room, grabbing my bow and arrow, as well as my father's 38 Special revolver. I headed out deep into the ranch, trying to make it out there before it got too dark. I was hoping to find a deer or a bobcat to snatch real fast. I used to be an expert with that bow, and I wanted to see if I still had it. I go to my usual spot, which has a deer blind my dad had bought me when I was six. There I waited, and I waited, until darkness was upon me. I was quite disappointed that no animals had shown up. I decided it was time to head back home. As I exited the deer blind, I could barely see anything except for the moonlight. Stupid me forgot to bring a flashlight for when I was done. But nevertheless, I had my phone on me, so I opened up a flashlight app. I continued my slow walk home in the dark when I got the eerie feeling that I was being watched. I brushed it off, assuming it was my imagination, 
It was pretty dark out after all. Plus, I was all alone out there. Even with the light on my phone, I could barely see that much in front of me. When all of a sudden, I stopped because I heard a twig break nearby. Maybe I wasn't as alone as I thought I was. Instantly, I looked around, but saw nothing. Once again, I brushed it off as maybe a rabbit or a roadrunner. We had a lot of those on my dad's ranch. I continued to walk, picking up the pace a little bit, until I heard the sound of branches being brushed up against by something. This time, it caught my attention. I knew for sure someone or something was following me. I picked up my pace even more, and I walked much faster. I was getting more nervous by the minute. Whenever I moved, whatever was following me was moving at the same time. Then the worst thing happened. My battery on my phone died, shutting off the light from my phone, leaving me alone in complete darkness in the middle of the woods. What happened next literally sent chills down my spine. Something roared at me, and I recognized the sound of that roar. It was the intimidating roar of a mountain lion, and it was close. I dropped my bow quickly, and I drew my revolver, and I fired all six shots in every direction, then took off in a sprint back home, hoping that I could make it out alive. As I got home safely, I saw that my parents were home as well. My dad asked what was the matter, and I told him what happened. My dad was shocked and skeptical at the same time. He told me that he hasn't seen a cougar in these parts since he was a child. Nevertheless, my dad took my word for it and grabbed his rifle. Then he told me to go with him to retrieve my bow. After five or 10 minutes of driving around searching for that spot, we stopped as we saw my bow lying on the ground. Me and my dad stepped out of the truck, fingers on our triggers, ready to fire. My dad had his flashlight and was looking around when he found something. Tracks, fresh tracks. He showed them to me and confirmed that they were in fact the tracks of a mountain lion and that I was lucky to be alive because they were nearly on top of my footprints. Number four, Bigfoot encounter while hunting. Submitted by Mystery Man. Let me start off by saying that this isn't my story. It's from an old friend of my great grandfather's and it's been a few years since I was told this story. So the memory might be a bit hazy. It may not be the scariest to some people, but I thought it'd be great to share. This story happened in upstate New York. My great-grandfather's friend was hunting with one other person. For privacy reasons, I won't use their names. They came across a road and decided to split up, going in opposite directions on the road. He perched himself on a rock and waited until four in the afternoon. But unfortunately, nothing showed. At this time, he decided to meet up with his friend. Right when he began to move off of the rock he was sitting on, he saw something walking in the woods across a clearing, not too far from him. The thing walked out of the trees and it had its right side facing him. From there, he couldn't tell if it was a bear or a person, so he didn't know whether to call out to it or stay silent. He then decided to do something in between. He whistled at it. The thing walked away from him on two legs back into the forest. It disappeared from his sight. It then walked back out of the forest, this time facing him, and they stared each other down before that thing slowly walked back into the woods and then out of sight. My grandfather's friend walked back down the road away from the thing he saw, where he saw his friend walking up to him. He asked him if he had been down where he saw that creature. He wanted to be sure that it wasn't a person that he saw but he said that he had never been down that way. To this day, he insists that this was no bear. It walked deliberately on two tall legs. It walked without trouble, without stumbling or anything like that. He swears it wasn't a person because they would have alerted him of their presence, 
Besides that, people aren't completely covered with hair. He insists that what he saw that day was a Bigfoot. And number five, Bigfooted Freak Stalking Me. Submitted by The Fallen Creature. I'm a hunter, a fisherman, skeet shooter, your average outdoors guy. I live right across the street from a national forest. Also, we live in the state of Georgia. However, things didn't start happening until the summer of 2016, when we started going fishing by ourselves. For the most part, it was just me and a friend. But one day when we went, we were greeted by the sound of someone following us. We tried to think nothing of it, we kept going on our three mile trek to the river, occasionally checking around us, always seeing nothing. Now we get to the river and we start moving around trying to find a fishing spot until we notice a high pitched scraping noise. We turned our heads up towards the cliff. It was coming from just above the river. We heard the noise stop when we began to look, but we still saw nobody around us. It was strange and a bit eerie. The cliff was bare there, and there was no possible way anyone could be up there without us seeing. So again, we tried to brush it off and have a good time. We move about a mile upstream. We began to feel better about the situation, more at ease, as we didn't hear any more footsteps following us, and no more odd noises. We continued for about an hour, and we noticed that the wildlife around us had completely gone silent. I mean, besides our breathing, there was no other noise out there at all. I know it sounds like a bunch of crap, but this really happened, and anyone who lives in this neighborhood can confirm the same feeling of someone or something following them and watching them. It's about 7.30 by then, and it's getting dark, so me and my friend decide to head out on our two-hour journey back home. As soon as we packed up and we began heading back upstream, we were greeted by this smell, the smell of something rotting and decaying and dead. It was creepy and we didn't want to be a part of it, so we picked up our pace a bit, at this point getting freaked out since we were just on this part of the trail hours ago and the smell wasn't there, meaning this was fresh kill and I didn't want to become the next fresh prey. As we continue along, we're just about to go on the trail that takes us back home. We depart from the river when we find huge footprints in the sand, right where I'd been standing earlier fishing. I called my friend over, and at this point, we're both getting seriously worried. We gunned it out of there, only to be greeted by the sound of footsteps keeping pace with us, very heavy, footsteps. We break into a run, and at about halfway from where the trail meets the road, whatever was following us just stopped, but we weren't taking any chances. Whatever that was out there, it sounded huge, so we just kept running until we finally reached the road. We took a break to catch our breath, and then we started walking back to my house. As soon as we went inside, my mother saw the looks of worry on our faces and asked us what was wrong. I debated on whether or not to tell her, and we opted not to, just in case we sounded weird, and I didn't want to scare my poor mother. A few weeks after all of this happened, a friend of mine was leaving my house one night, and he was walking through the woods back to his place. But as he was sliding through the fence, he looked over at the national forest, only to see a bunch of outlines of what appeared to be people. They all had heavy duty flashlights, chanting. He couldn't tell what they were saying, but they were saying it all in unison. He was getting freaked out, so he raced back home, banging on the doors for his family to let him in. The next morning, he went back out to investigate, to look around where the strange people were seen. He found the foundation of an old and long abandoned church with old cement pews and a well, along with what appeared to be an old graveyard. Lately, someone or something has been following us both, even after we got back from our fishing trip, 
every night lately. The neighborhood dogs have been going ballistic at night, and I'm always sure that when I go out these days that I have a gun with me, especially what happened just last night. I saw someone through my kitchen window in the middle of the freaking night. They were about 40 yards away, standing at the tree line of the forest, staring at me with eyes that were at least eight feet off the ground. It was a towering figure, but it just kept staring until I raised up my gun to take a shot. It bolted back into the forest. Honestly, now I'm not sure what to do, and I don't know what the heck that thing was. It can't possibly be human. Its body was huge. I posted this, wondering if anyone else has had any experiences with similar creatures. My first time hunting from OK Chloe, location unknown. I was 16 years old in 2012 when this happened. My family has been avid hunters for years, so when I got my hunting license, they immediately put in a request to hunt in one of the most popular areas in my state. I'll set the scene a bit. My grandfather and I were going to be staying in that area for two and a half weeks inside an RV. Then a couple of my cousins would be driving to us, staying for their turn, then drive the RV back at the end of the season. My granddad, Kay, packed everything he could think of, even an ATV to travel the area quicker and enough food to feed a small army. Only I had a hunting permit, but my family didn't think a young girl being alone for two and a half weeks would be safe. On this trip, I took a 30-06 Springfield for safety, as well as for hunting, of course. We were up in the mountains in early winter, but there wasn't any substantial snow, which was odd for the time. Kay decided that we should go deeper into the area, as there were many other hunters. So we parked in a half-open clearing, about an hour in. Every road and trail seemed overgrown. Almost no one had been there. After the RV was unpacked and the generator was connected, we took the ATV for a spin. After a few hours, we didn't see any deer, and as the sun began to set, we went. The entire time we were out there, I had this uneasy feeling. At first, I tried to rationalize it. It was my first time hunting like this, after all. Of course, I'd be jumpy and on edge, right? The forest was quiet, but we chalked it up to the animals hiding from the hunters. On that first night, we went to bed. I had a hard time sleeping, while Kay had been asleep for 40 minutes already. There were three beds in the RV, a bunk bed and a queen-size bed, both on opposite ends of the RV. Something told me to stay awake that night, to be vigilant. My paranoia was getting the better of me, so much so that I had my Springfield next to me. It was unloaded and the safety was on, but I had the ammo box close just in case. There was this leaf crunching sound outside the door and it made my eyes jolt open. Immediately, I tried to convince myself it was the wind or a deer that had strayed too close to the RV, finally coming out to eat when it felt it was safe. I looked at the clock nearby. I think I had fallen asleep for a while, apparently, because it was now 3 a.m. I became hypervigilant, focusing on the leaves crunching. Slowly, the thought of someone or something outside became maddening. It circled the RV, slowly, but became quieter next to the windows. There was something definitely outside. I dared not move, but kept trying to see anything outside the tiny window that I had next to the bottom bunk. All the windows were naturally tinted along with shutters, so I couldn't see anything. Dread truly seeped into my mind when I felt the RV tip slightly over. The only time this happened was when someone put pressure on the first step to get inside the RV. The solid grip I didn't even realize I had on my Springfield got harder. My heart was pounding louder in my ears. I knew the door was locked, but I couldn't help but imagine it wasn't. I expected the door to fly open at any moment, and whatever was there would run in, 
taking me and Kay out. Whatever was there didn't even try to open the door. Instead, its weight was lifted off the step, causing the RV to sway back into its proper position with a small shake. Immediately, Kay started to stir, and I wondered how he could be sleeping at a time like this. I heard the leaves crunching again, now getting further and further away. By how they were paced, I guessed it had to have been human. Not too long after Kay woke up, I didn't want to say anything to him. The last thing I wanted was for him to think I was crazy and never come hunting with me again. He knew that I had nightmares often. When we came out of the RV when the sun came up, I saw that it wasn't just a dream. There were huge boot prints in the leaves around the RV. Our car, generator, and AT had been tampered with. Still, I didn't say anything. Kay figured some other hunter was using, if you know what I mean. Maybe they thought this was their camp. When he fired up the ATV, it wouldn't start. It wasn't until later we found out that the battery and gas lines had been cut. Huh, nothing was taken, but our transportation was cut, as if someone wanted to strand us out here. What was even weirder was the fact that the car wasn't damaged, so why would they only cut the ATV? For the next two and a half weeks, I heard the sound of someone circling our camp and RV every night. They, whoever it was, didn't try stepping on the stairs again, though. One night, I heard them messing with the generator. I imagine they were trying to stop it heating. Why would they do that? They had to know that we were armed. We were hunting, after all. Why would they try to lure us outside of the RV on their own? That was what I was thinking. They were trying to get us outside of the RV for some reason. And later on, I thought it was because there were more people than just that one person I was hearing. My veins ran cold when I thought of this. We met many other hunters on the trail, and none of them were young females. I was the only one, but I can't entirely be sure that was the reason. Later that next spring, I asked my cousins if they experienced anything weird on their round of the trip. They said the only weird thing they experienced was the campsite being thrashed after they came back one night, and there were dozens of different boot prints. Mystery people who tried to lure me and my grandpa outside. I hope we never actually meet. I think I saw a skinwalker. From Here Comes Dat Boy. Location, Alabama. This story takes place at my grandparents' farm in southern Alabama. They have 30 acres of land, and there's tons of deer up there. Of course, my grandpa and I like to go hunting here. We had planned a hunting trip for the morning. That morning, I went one way and my grandpa went the other. He was going to a tree stand he had put deep in the woods, and I went to a ladder stand. This stand had a little box around it, and it was big enough for two people. I sat down and was watching around for deer. Two hours later, it was about 9 a.m. I hadn't had much luck, when suddenly I heard a branch snap to my right. I raised my Marlin 3030 lever action, ready to bag a nice big buck, but what walked out was not a deer. Whatever it actually was, was standing on its hind legs. They were veiny and muscular, and it was at least eight feet tall with red liquid oozing from its mouth, which was curled into a constant snarl. The creature was unnaturally skinny, with abnormally long arms with four-inch claws at the end. I quickly ducked down, praying that it hadn't heard me do it. I would peek over to get a look at it every few seconds, until I saw it sniffing the air. Was it on to me? I thought. Surely it couldn't smell me. I was basically praying hoping. Luckily, the thing began to walk away, but I waited there for another few hours, paralyzed with fear. I didn't stir until I heard the sound of our Coleman UTV. I was relieved. My grandpa had come to pick me up. 
We got in and went back to the house, and I didn't utter a word to him, even though I knew he knew that something was wrong. This was one of the scariest moments of my entire life, and I hope none of you have to experience the fear that I did. It watched me the whole time. From Dracula's Nightmare, location, Kentucky. I own land in Hart County, Kentucky, and I've had multiple weird counters with things I don't think I understand there. This story occurred just a month ago, so I can remember pretty much everything there was to it. I was hunting in a large field. It was deer season, and I hadn't seen anything. Until finally, a doe stepped out into the field. I took aim, and I got a direct hit. It was starting to get dark by then, and I waited a few more minutes before going to retrieve the animal. I called my brother, and he told me that it was getting late, so I should get it before the coyotes did. I sighed and hung up, grabbing my stuff and stepping out of the blind that I was in. I began to walk across the field. Just so you know, I was in the corner of the field, because I don't want to walk too much to get a deer into my truck. I got to my truck and of course drove where I'd seen it, and I followed the trail. I found it lying there. It was far gone. I loaded the animal up and drove all the way to about half a mile from the end of the area. That's when I noticed an extremely bright light up ahead. I thought it was strange, but assumed that maybe it was the game warden. He patrolled these areas often for night poachers, but there was something odd about this light. It didn't look like a vehicle, and it was just sitting in one spot, watching the same part of the area. I didn't think much more than it was just strange. That was until the light suddenly took off and zoomed straight over my truck. And when I say it was fast, it was insane. In just a few seconds, it was above me. A spotlight shined directly on top of my truck. I began to floor it, but it easily kept up. I was beginning to panic and I lost control of myself. I drove as fast as possible but it kept following me all the way back to the cabin. When I made it back, I was able to actually see the shape of the aircraft. And to my surprise, it was just a perfect pure black cube. I almost passed out as it flew off faster than I could even blink. My friends and brother who were there at the time came running out, panicking from the sound and lights they'd seen. Nobody said anything for a few seconds, it felt like hours as we watched the sky, looking for that cube, but it never came back. We never said a single word about it, and I think we all stayed up that night. We went home the next morning and kept our mouths shut. I'll always remember this, even in my final moments. If I rethink my life, this will pop up first. We never saw the cube again, but we still didn't feel safe that night and we don't feel safe out there to this day. Dogman versus the Game Warden from Tanner. Location unknown. I'm a 30-year-old Marine Corps vet, and I currently work for a job that has me going out into the woods to keep the law in peace for wildlife. My partner is a five-year-old Belgium Malinois named Phoenix. I also have my friend who I work with and was in the Marines with. His name is David. One night, dispatch tells me I'm being requested for a missing person, and I hurry over. As I pull up, David and one of my other coworkers, who we will call Mike, are getting ready for the search. I get out, and David walks up, saying that it's pretty serious and that I better go talk to the person's family. When I visit with the distraught family, the father tells me that he and his eight-year-old son were squirrel hunting. When the father walked away for a moment to use the bathroom, he suddenly heard his son screaming. When he came back, he was gone. At first, I didn't know what to think of this story, and I tell my partners I'm calling BS on it. But they tell me they already have been looking for the kid. And due to finding certain fur where it took place, they believe he may have been taken by a bear. And if that was the case... He wouldn't be alive. Bears aren't common there, but they're not unheard of. I say okay, 
and I get Phoenix all ready to go. Then we head out into the woods. At first, Phoenix wasn't getting anything, and then all at once he starts crying and moving back and forth. Then the crying turns into a growl, and he backs up to me and starts to bark. I tell him to calm down, and for the most part, he does. But then I hear, we got something big from Mike. I look up, and about 10 yards in front of us, this little boy runs out with his clothes ripped up. He looks like he's hurt, but not too bad. I grab him, and I take a good look at him. He was going to be fine. Maybe scarred for life, but fine. I look at Mike with a laugh. Oh yeah, he's real big, huh? I then look back at the kid, but he's pointing in the same direction that he just ran out of, and I hear him say under his breath, It's coming. I look at him and ask what he means. The dog's going crazier now. Then David suddenly screams a curse. I look up, and I know what they're all freaking out about now because I see this big, wolf-like thing. It looks like it belongs in Game of Thrones as a dire wolf. It's only a few yards away. It's staring us down and growling. Phoenix then lunges at the thing. Luckily, I pull on the leash in time before the two make contact. When we gather ourselves and back up away from it, it suddenly stands on two legs and approaches us like that. We didn't know what to do other than run. We get back to the family's house, kind of cooling down. The kid's fine now and back with his family. We didn't mention the wolf thing to anyone and it was about time to head home. Mike and David had already left to go home, but I'm talking to the boy's father. I ask him if he saw anything weird when his son was taken or went missing. He says he saw someone carry the boy away, but that's all the info he could give me. As I'm driving down the road, I notice this thing standing in the middle of it. I assume it's some guy who's been drinking a bit too much, but as I get closer, I notice that it's not as human as it should be, and before long I realize it's the same creature that I saw when we found the little boy in the woods. I come to a complete stop, making eye contact with it. At this point, I'm more confident, more curious than scared, so I do something stupid. I'm beginning to open my door when all of a sudden my dog starts going nuts again and I look to my right, seeing the exact same thing standing right in front of me now. No, it's another one of those creatures. Two of them now. I then look to my left and there's another one there. These things have my vehicle surrounded, but then when the one in the middle of the road gets up and walks back into the woods, the other two follow. Confused, I head home and take a nice long vacation. I didn't talk about the incident again until one day me and David were out doing target practice with clay pigeons. I asked him what he thinks he saw that day. He looked at me and said that the family moved days after that and no one has bought their property due to the rumors of wolves and dogs running about. I asked again, Asked him if he believed in that type of stuff. He says, I've seen a lot of messed up things in my life, but that's by far the creepiest thing I've ever seen, and I don't want to talk about it. It makes me wonder, what else is out there in the woods? Osceola, New York, Werewolf, from Charcoal Pitbull 23. Location, Osceola, New York. I was 13 at the time. I was at my stepdad's house. It's in a heavily wooded area. I just got done hunting for the first time with them. It was 4.30 p.m. in the fall, and the sun was just barely above the horizon. We were hanging up the deer when I was about to close the side door to the garage. I heard a twig snap to my right. I looked over and there I saw the weirdest thing I had ever seen. It had white fur and dark blue eyes, and it was poking out from behind a tree, curiously. I froze and locked eyes with it, trying to understand if what I was seeing was real. I tried to back up, and when it began to approach me, I nearly soiled myself. It was six feet tall, 
and walked on two legs like a man. I wasn't looking where I was going and tripped over a root sticking up from the ground. When I fell, it took off in a charge towards me. When I tried to pick myself back up, I saw that my pant leg was stuck on the root. It was the first time I ever thought to myself that I was going to perish. I tugged and pulled at my pant leg until finally the fabric gave. When I looked back up, the creature I'd seen was gone. It could have had me if it wanted me. Where did it go? I quickly booked it back inside, locking the door, and I hid behind the couch and waited for my stepdad. Later that night, after telling him what went down, he laughed at me, told me, yeah, sure thing, but... But as soon as he said that, there was a howl in the distance, and I saw his face go white. I could tell by the look on his face that he was doubting not believing my story now. We still go out in those woods to hunt, but I've never been more aware of my surroundings. I saw something behind my house that I can't explain. From Cody 203. Location, unknown. Being 16 years old, 5 foot 8 and 115 pounds soaking wet, I'm not too intimidating to anything or anyone. The area I live is rich with Native American history, mainly Creek, I believe. So about two weeks ago, I decided to go walking behind my house at about 10 p.m. at night. I stayed inside all day playing video games, and I went hunting in these woods all the time so I could use the exercise, and maybe I could see something that I could take back home with me. Squirrel do make for some good dumplings. Anyway, I knew these woods like the back of my hand. Me, along with my two dogs, Mike and Jojo, with a flashlight, walked for a little bit. There was nothing out of the ordinary, and soon enough we were turning back to make it back home. But the moment I turned around, it was like a trigger. That relaxed feeling I'd had the whole night disappeared and was replaced with dread. It's like that stereotypical feeling of being watched or followed. We were walking back down the trail when one of my dogs, Mike, who had been walking ahead of me, began to bark and chase something in the woods. That's not unusual for him because he always chases armadillos. I ran to catch up to him to see what he was barking at. After a few seconds of pursuing him, I heard him go quiet and I began to worry. A chill went up my spine. I was always told that when that happens, there's something in the area that you need to look out for. I called my dog's name for a few minutes. There was no response. I was beginning to really feel worried. He always comes to his name. Then, out of nowhere, my dog comes hightailing it out of the woods with his tail tucked between his legs. He was shaking violently. I thought he was hurt, so I tried to see what was wrong with him. That's when I heard one of the most unnatural sounds I've ever heard. It was like a wolf howling, mixed with a person moaning. That was enough for me to grab my two dogs by their collars and take off running back to my house. As I ran, I swear to God I could hear something moving along the tree line, keeping up with me. It was like something was just tearing down through the bushes and trees, not caring what was in its way. I'd say I was about halfway back to the house when I had this urge to look back. This was one of the worst mistakes I've ever made because what I saw in the middle of that trail is enough to give me nightmares forever. It was almost like a person, but it was like someone took its skin and stretched it across its bones, vacuum sealed like a plastic bag. Parts of its skin seemed to be decomposing and there were patches of brown hair and red liquid dripping from its body. It looked like it hadn't eaten in weeks, and when my flashlight shone onto it, it let out another inhuman scream. It pushed itself up to two legs, and it started to run straight at me. I expected to be thrown to the ground and devoured, but then, in the blink of an eye, it was gone, as if it was never there. Even so, I ran all the way back to my house, and I about busted down the door to get in. I took my two dogs into my room where I stayed up the rest of the night. 
I tried to go to sleep to just forget about it, but I swear I could hear screaming still coming from the woods all throughout the night. I thought I could hear scraping sounds and clicking noises coming from outside my window, but except for that night, I never heard any of these sounds again, and I haven't seen that skin-stretched creature. I did go back the next day to see what I would find in its wake. I went back to the trail where it had chased me, and sure enough, it looked like a bulldozer had paved a straight line through the forest. In all my years and days being outdoors and hunting, I've never seen anything like that. The Forest Behind My House, submitted by Norman. I haven't shared this story with anyone because I don't like to relive the memory or more accurately, memories. I should clarify that I live on a 28-acre property in the northern US, and behind the home that borders the road, there is a fairly large forest that stretches significantly to the south and west until it reaches I-75 on the western side. I don't exactly know which of the several events I've experienced would be considered the most or least horrifying per se, but I'll try to order them chronologically. Because, in my opinion, they've developed into progressively more horrifying encounters the older I am, and the more persistent my memory is. So forgive me if the arrangement is more of a bounce than a progression. I'll start with the time I was five years old. Throughout childhood, my grandfather would always remain soundly in holiday spirit. On each Halloween, he would put up old pillowcases with cloth hanging from trees to creepily decorate the edge of the forest I lived next to. On Christmas, he would strictly enforce the English tradition of telling ghost stories, and in the summer, he would eagerly anticipate the arrival of Independence Day, solely to set off some M80 firecrackers, the big ones, at midnight. Although the dogs didn't like this, nor our sleeping neighbors, I always found contentness in his will to have a good time. This is besides the point. Let me get back to that point. Those fake ghosts he would hang from trees, the cloth and pillowcase entities that were about three to four feet long, were where this started for me. Until I was five, he did this every year, even before I was born from what I've learned from my mother. On Halloween of 2005, after returning from school, as I was being driven towards our house, I saw the human effigies he hung, and I was excited that another year of tradition was condoned. Upon closer inspection, I noticed one of the ghosts had red spots on its left torso, with a little bit of staining on the right shoulder. I asked my grandfather, what did you use to make that blood that's on them? He looked at me kind of silly as he opened the truck door. When I got out, he responded in a voice you'd use to treat a child babbling nonsense. I didn't put anything on them. At the angle the truck was now at, where we had driven up the lane, our house was now obstructing the view of the forest, so I asked him to walk around the home with me to see what I was talking about. I know what I saw, and I was absolutely positive it was a red shade. When we got to the other side of the house, around a spot where today a magnolia tree stands, I pointed at the effigies, but before I could mutter my brag of being right, I was horrified to see that there was no such effigy with blood on it, and even more chilling, there was one less effigy than there was before. Because originally, there had been three hung, always three, it was a simplicity thing, when I saw the blood-tainted effigy earlier, there were four. I thought nothing of this, but now it had become ironic that I paid no attention because of how bizarre and creepy it was. Because as an adult, as I look back on it, I know what I saw appeared to be a hanging child, which is a thought I do not fancy entertaining at all. It was so disturbing. Every time I recount my original view of the four effigies, I think about how real the bloodied one looked. Every now and then I have nightmares of it lifting its head and seeing myself with a noose around my neck. Anyway, 
I'll tell the second encounter I had with the forest, which occurred when I was nine. This one is slightly less clear, but more memorable. Every August, my grandfather would take me deer spotting in the forest. This was to get an idea if it was worth hunting back there each season, or if it was too much trouble. On this particular day, we were about 200 meters into the forest, lying atop a log concealed by a small hill. We had been there for at least four hours now, just sitting. As a nine-year-old child, I was definitely tired. I went to sleep, and to my terror, I had one of the recurring dreams I described earlier, of the boy hanging from a tree. Only my grandfather was the one hanging now. This troubled me deeply, and I woke up. As if things couldn't be worse, it was dark when I woke up. I don't even know how. My sleep felt like a power nap at most. Nowhere near long enough to put daylight in the grave. I reached for my grandfather and found to my relief that he was still there, but he was asleep as well. Older folks easily drift off. I shook him awake and told him I needed to go home. I developed an overwhelming feeling of dread, but before I could convey that to him, he shushed me and said, Be quiet. I asked why, why there was no sound in the forest anymore, which I had only just noticed, which was entirely odd on its own. After a very quiet moment, he agreed that we should return home, so we began the journey back, ending the hunting day early. Luckily, the return was uneventful until we came upon the remains. They appeared to be dog bones. There was even a skull, which was odd for me to see, because in the forest when we stumbled upon bones, the head was always gone for whatever reason. We continued cautiously past the discovery and were basically in my backyard now when a very distinct voice filled my ears from behind us. Be quiet. I turned to the forest expecting to see my grandfather behind me, but instead, there was no one there. But it sounded exactly like him. In fact, it sounded exactly how he had said it. Not like someone else trying to mimic him, but like someone had just repeated it from a tape. I turned back around to see my grandfather further ahead. Scared, I ran to catch up to him. But then I heard it again, and nearly cried when I heard it. It repeated the exact same words from last time so perfectly, like a recording. So I just power walked to my home, and pretended nothing happened, even when my grandfather asked why I had just stood there for a moment. The next day, our neighbors that live north beside the church graveyard called and asked if I had seen their dog Josie, that had went missing. Not wanting to crush their hopes of finding it in a slow and drawn out way, my grandfather informed them that we had seen bones the last night. This is important, because later that same day, they claimed their dog Josie had come back from the woods, but it was behaving extremely weird. And though it looked like Josie, they said it didn't act like Josie anymore. What did that even mean? That's all we ever heard of it, but it sounded more terrifying than anything yet. I'm pretty sure they never had the dog after the following of winter 2009. Fast forward six years, my sophomore year of high school. Me and a couple of buddies of mine had passed a college level exam for an advanced placement class, so with it being halfway through our high school life and that success being announced, we invited some more friends to see who was interested in having a party at my place. Most of the party was uneventful, just my family cooking in front of a bonfire on the side of the house closer to the church and graveyard. It was boring until we decided to play manhunt. Sometimes I look back on the decision to do this and don't comprehend how stupid we really were. I guess I just pushed the past out of my knowledge rolling it all out as my childhood exaggeration and distortion of fact. It is an important detail to add that one of my friends, the main two being the friends I'm referring to, was playing my Xbox earlier without my permission. 
and often treated my house like it was his own, putting his shoes up on furniture, etc. I wasn't happy about it, but I figured I'd get him back someday. Now on with the story. My friends, who I'll refer to as Ken and Paul for privacy reasons, were assembled with me and my cousins Nathan, Michael, and Gloriana in front of the bonfire. Before we ran across the property, I made it abundantly clear and painfully obvious I did not want anyone going in the woods. I voted myself to be it first, since I was hosting, and I got a flashlight. Forget how the round played out and what order I found people in, but for context, I'll say Ken was hiding behind the chimney, Eric was inside eating leftover hamburgers, Gloriana had stayed cleverly next to the fire, blending in with the crowd that was observing our game. Nathan was in a tree, and my friend Jake, who apparently joined mid-match, was under my grandfather's truck. I'd found them all, and they joined me for my search. After scanning basically the whole property, it became more worrying for me that Paul had probably once again defied the rules of my house and went into the woods. Before we could line up at the tree line, Paul came to us with a worried look on his face. Of course he had went into the woods, but seeing his face, I was no longer mad. I was concerned what we were about to learn, judging by his petrified stance and his whiter-than-snow skin. After questioning him, he explained he had indeed hopped into the forest and recounted a totally different version of events than the other players knew to happen. You see, when we play, the people that are found stay with the hunter and assist his search, so it slowly builds up and goes by faster. Thus, our accounts were all in a sequence. But according to Paul, we had come by him several times, walking in front of him. He said at one point, he threw a stick to draw our attention somewhere else, and instead of following it, the person who saw it looked right at him and stood next to him. It was at this point he explained to us he realized that this was not one of us. His best description of what it was detailed along the lines of an all-black person with an animalistic face like a coyote's. He claimed when he realized this, he hauled himself out of the brush and eventually ran into us after hearing no pursuit. When we heard his story, I told everyone to walk to the other side of the house where the fire was and stay there for the rest of the night, grill some marshmallows and all that to forget about what happened. Sometimes over Xbox, me, Ken, and Paul talk about this experience, but each time it becomes less serious to them. However, whenever we do have a meeting at my place from time to time, we still feel very on edge about something in that forest. From the research I've done, I'm almost positive that the dark entities in my forest are skinwalkers. To say the least, I don't venture out there anymore, and I keep my grandfather from doing the same. I hope anybody who has the experience for themselves has a great faith in God, because without religion, I don't know how you would protect yourself from things like that. That forest is pure evil, and I am happier every day knowing I don't have to go back out there again. But sometimes, I still have the dreams, but I'm safe in my home. It's been consecrated, and while I'm safe, I want to tell as many people as possible to know that these monsters, or rather the paranormal, are all too real. Stay safe. Number one, something is out there. Submitted by Jody and Marco. Me and my good friend are avid hunters. We've been hunting together for many years all over Texas and never had a problem until we got to Nacogdoches. My name is Jody and my friend's name is Marco. First, let me say that we have two places there that we hunt. We have 200 acres and 400 acres of land that are about 15 miles apart. We'd been hunting the 200 the first year, but never went to the 400, so we decided to go check out the 400 acres, and we spent the day hiking the land, and were going to camp out overnight. So we packed up one Saturday morning and headed to the lease to look around. As soon as we got there, it started. 
but it was like a really eerie feeling. We kind of just shrugged it off and continued on. Then we noticed there were no animals or bugs, nothing at all. We walked all day long, hiking and checking out the property, which borders a national forest. That evening, we split up and tried hunting a little bit. As we were hunting, I heard voices very low, so I could not make out what was being said. I thought it was very strange because we are the only people on the land, but I thought maybe my friend was talking on the phone and his voice was somehow reaching me. I headed back to the place we decided to make camp for the night, where I was greeted by my friend. He asked me why I was making so much noise. Apparently, he had heard the voices too, but then he told me that something went... right in his ear before something pushed him. As that was being said, we started to realize something was wrong. He picked up his rifle. I have never in my life seen something like this before, but his rifle was pulled out of his hand and levitated about five feet and fell to the ground. We were both like, what the hell? What just happened? He picked up his gun, cleaned it off, and yelled in the name of God, leave us alone. It seemed to help for a while. By now it was dark. We had a fire going, but we just wanted to get out of there. We packed up. I said, I'll go get the truck if you can get everything together. He said, no way, we need to stay together. So we started the hike back without the equipment. When we got about 600 yards from the truck, we started hearing screaming, screeching, and many unfamiliar noises, and they were very, very loud. It was coming from a little ways in the brush. My friend stopped with his flashlight, trying to see what it was. I said, come on, we need to go, right when whatever it was came into sight from the thick brush. We could tell it was not human, but it looked to be a gray humanoid type figure, and it ran out on the trail on all fours, screaming. I don't know what that thing was, but I've never seen anything like it. We emptied our rifles on it, and at about 50 yards away, it just stood up and looked at us. I reloaded and my buddy started praying and saying in the name of God, get out of here and leave us alone. I emptied my 44 mag in it and I started running to the truck. My friend came with me. We still heard the screeching and screaming. We got back in the truck and started it and we hauled it out of there. My friend kept telling me to calm down and slow down. The road was clay and it was hard and could pop the tires and we definitely didn't want to get stuck out there with whatever that thing was. When we made it to the main road, the atmosphere was like someone flipped a switch. We got back to the other land, the 200 acres, and the usual animals were out. Armadillos, rabbits, bugs, the sounds of crickets, it was all there, like it was supposed to be. I can genuinely say I'll never go back to that 400 acres. We called the landowner and told him our experience. He had a very surprising response. He said we were the first people to rent it out for the last 10 years. He said that it had been some sort of sacred Indian land. He also said one of the hunters that hunted there before was killed on the land under mysterious circumstances. Surprisingly enough, it almost felt like I was in a graveyard. All of the prior hunter's stuff was still on the land. All the deer blinds, all the feeders are all rotting away. It's like they forgot everything and just left. I would really like to know what happened to us out there in the woods in Nacogdoches, Texas. The only other thing I found in research of the area is that Davy Crockett himself had an encounter in those woods before he went to the Alamo. I wanted to share this story so that others could be aware of what might be lurking in the woods of Nacogdoches. Number two. My friend saw something he'd never forget. Submitted by Felix M. This happened to a friend of mine. For safety purposes, I will be calling my friend John. John and his dad had built a small hut-like building out in the forest behind their house, and they used it a lot when hunting because it looked out on a lake that animals seemed to use when drinking. Now, John was out there at around 10 to 10.30 at night when this happened, and he had already collected a deer or two during the month, so he was feeling pretty darn lucky by then. He was just getting ready to pack up and head home as it was getting fairly late and he didn't want to be lost in the woods after dark with coyotes and such moving about. Right as he was getting ready to stand up, he heard a splash in the lake water and excitedly swooped his head around to look for the source of the noise. Yet he didn't see anything, 
but a ripple in the pond. Thinking this was strange, he used the scope on his rifle to look around at the area around the pond to see if maybe there was something hanging around in the trees. As he looked back to the shore, he realized there were more ripples coming from the opposite end, so he quickly looked towards that end of the lake, hoping to see another deer. Instead, he saw a small bump poking out of the water, and that bump was moving. Slowly, the bump turned into a head, then the upper body came out, and soon there was everything above the ankles above the water. He said it looked like a woman, and she was hunched over and covered in what looked like seaweed. He watched in awed curiosity as this creature exited the lake, then stood stock still for what felt like hours. Then, very slowly, the woman turned her head and looked directly at my friend in his hut. Upon seeing her face, he almost screamed. In the few seconds he saw it, there was a wide, almost inhuman grin on her face and inky black pits where her eyes should have been. When he saw this, he dropped his rifle and slid down the ladder of his hut. He started running and mentally refused to turn around for fear of what he would see behind him. When he made it back home, he almost blew the door off its hinges when he rushed inside. He asked his dad about it, and all his dad had to say was that he shouldn't tell anyone what he saw. Then he told everyone at school the next day. No one was ever sure what it was, but he knows that when he got back to the hut, it had been torn apart and his gun was missing. Number three, Creature in the Bayou. Submitted by 2020 Grad. At the time this happened, I was about eight or nine years old. My mom and I took a trip to go see my family in Wynn, Arkansas. We stayed and chatted with my family for a while, but being a child, I started to get really bored. And about five minutes later, my uncle asked if I wanted to go hunting with him and my cousin Cody. Of course, I said yes, so we packed the guns and headed out. But on the way there, I got a bad feeling like something was going to happen, but I ruled it out as just being paranoid or nervous. We got there about 25 minutes later and started to set up. We went about five miles into thick wood of the Mercer Bayou, setting up snares for deer and wild hogs. We went a couple miles further into the woods. Later on, we set up a platform on a tree about 10 feet off the ground. Then we sat, ate lunch, and talked for a while. But after a few hours of nothing, my uncle and cousin decided to go back and check the traps. Before they left, my uncle asked me, will you be okay here for about 30 minutes? I just looked at him and simply replied, yeah, I'll be fine. I did have a shotgun and an old knife after all. I think it was the one my uncle used in the Marine Corps, but I figured I could handle myself while they were gone. So my uncle and cousin went down the ladder and left. After a while, I started to doze off. I think I was out for 20 minutes and I woke up to the sound of a branch snapping off to the left of me. I propped up on the tree and waited, thinking it was my family coming back. I knew I was wrong. I knew it wasn't them the moment I heard a small yip coming from the trees. I grabbed my shotgun, getting ready for whatever it was. I waited for five minutes, then from the corner of my eye I saw something coming from the trees. My god, what I saw scared the living hell out of me. It was a huge creature about eight feet tall. It was covered with reddish brown hair. Its arms reached down to its thighs and at the end of them hung massive claws that could probably gut a person in one second flat. I was absolutely frozen with fear. I locked eyes with the beast, praying to God that it would go away. I'm not sure if my prayer was answered or if it was just luck because I heard another animal in the distance. So that thing turned to it and walked away. I waited for a while until it was completely out of sight. And when it was gone, I jumped down from the platform and ran as quick as my legs could carry me. But then I heard heavy footsteps coming from behind me. They were getting louder and louder and closer. I started to cry and suddenly everything went silent. Dead silent. Still, I kept running until I ran into something coming out from behind a tree. I was so relieved when I saw it was my uncle and cousin. My uncle told me, Whoa, chill, it looks like you saw a ghost. I just looked at him and under my sobs I said, No, it's worse than that. Then he asked me, What do you mean? Right before I was about to reply, I was interrupted by a blood-curdling cry coming from behind us. They looked at me with disbelief. I heard my uncle ask under his breath, You saw it? 
Immediately, we got up and ran until we got in the truck. I asked my uncle, What was that? It was silent for a while before he finally said, What you just saw was the monster of Boggy Creek. After that, I was quiet the whole way back, just thinking what it could have done to me if I was still asleep when it came by. But then I remembered, when I had jumped down from that platform to get away, I saw claw marks on the ladder leading up to where I had been sitting. It must have been there right below me when I was asleep. Number 4 Creepy Crawlies Submitted by Corn. These incidents happened around 9 years ago when I was 6. I annually went to visit my cousin in North Texas during the summer. This summer was no exception, but instead of staying at his house, we stayed at a cabin his dad rented. It was only us guys there, so I was fairly happy about hanging out, doing stuff in the woods. The first day was rather boring, though. All we did was fish and watch my uncle hunt. The second day, though, was when it started. My uncle had told my cousin and I to skin the fish he had caught yesterday, since he was going to hunt some small game. About a half hour later, since he left, we had almost finished up skinning. I left my cousin to do the rest while I took a break in the bathroom. I had finished up my business and walked out of the bathroom, but something was off. I didn't hear anything coming from the kitchen. When we were skinning the fish, we both had the water running, so I thought that this was odd. I then assumed he must have been done. I walked out into the kitchen, and my heart sank. He wasn't there. I looked in the back room where the bedroom was and he wasn't there either, so at this point I assumed he was outside on the porch. I started walking to the door, and that's when I heard a knock to my right. That freaked me out, so I looked around. Suddenly a trap door opens up and my cousin pops out of it. He tells me to bring a flashlight because he found a cave. I regret this decision even now, but I got a flashlight and jumped down into the hole with him. I turned on the flashlight and it illuminated a small concrete room. There was a reddish brown wooden table in the middle of the room, and I felt fear all around me. It was getting dark, so my cousin and I jumped back up into the cabin and waited for my uncle to return. The next day, we told him about the room, and he decided to go down there himself, but he asked us to wait up here. About five minutes pass, until he climbs back up frantically. He tells us to quickly pack our things, so we do. We leave in the car in silence. Neither of us ask what had happened. A week ago, I was in North Texas again, and I was with my uncle. We were talking about the conversation, and eventually we ended up with hunting. That sparked my memory, so I asked him, why did he make us leave early that day? His happy face soon turned serious and told me that there was a journal in there. The journal contained crossed out sketches of people and various information about people, including their height, weight, hobbies, and address. But that's not the creepiest part. Apparently, he had seen sketches of us three, and the sketches weren't crossed out yet. The following story isn't hunting in the usual sense, but more animal watching. But I had to include it because it is pretty terrifying. Number five. Our Family's Monster, submitted by Catany Catpuff. Before I begin, I need to tell you that this took place in Australia. I would like to reference myself as Lily for this story. So, when I was little, I always went out to the little bush area near our home. It was a small nature reserve with the kangaroos coming down for what we called grazing season. I loved going down there, and the only incident I really had was when a kangaroo tried to kick me, which it did succeed in. Now this story took place when I was around 13. I grew up with my uncle as a father figure, and he would always take me out animal watching. We would never hunt, since we're that kind of family, but it was fun all the same. We built a treehouse and a huge tree which we would hide in to look for animals. One night, we saw a rare albino kangaroo. I thought it was beautiful, and I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It turned its head to me, and just as it did, a hand covered my face. It was my uncle's. He told me, Never look any albino in the eyes. You got it? I shook my head, yes. He said it was bad luck. I believed it, as you can tell I was a child who believed everything. 
The next night, I was lying in bed not being able to sleep, and suddenly, I heard a few leaves shuffling outside my window. I looked to the window and saw an albino kangaroo just staring at me. It was so pretty, I thought, but then I remembered my uncle's warning. I quickly looked away, but then I heard a noise. Please, Please Lily, let, let me in. in. I hate being outside in the dark. I turned around and looked again, only to see the animal now looking in through the frame of the window. I wanted to let it in as I had a soft spot for animals, but it took me a moment to realize for some reason that it was bizarre for an animal to talk at all. It began to put its paw up to the window, but it wasn't a paw. Instead, it was a clawed hand with two long fingers and no thumb. It touched the glass, leaving a mark that was black. I was too scared for words as the beast bashed the window again and again. After a while, it just left. And as it did, I saw its body, a tall anorexic body hunched over as it left. The kangaroo head was still on its body, but it looked too much like a mask on the thing. There was no way that was its actual head. Somehow I fell asleep that night and I woke up the next morning. I told my uncle everything that had happened that night when I saw him next. I told him because for some reason I knew he would believe me more than my mom would. He looked at me wide-eyed, and I think I saw a trickle of sweat roll down his face. He ran to my granddad and told my story. Lily, I heard my grandfather say, can we talk? I walked into the living room where he pointed to the couch across the chair he was already sitting on. Sit down for a moment, will you, dear? I sat down, waiting for him to speak. He looked as though he were choosing his words carefully. Finally, he spoke. Lily, we must talk. He said in his deep, serious voice. You see, what I think you saw was a monster that lives out there. He explained while pointing outside. It's always lived here, and we thought it left for a long time. But I guess we were wrong. Now that it has shown us that it's back, I don't want anyone to go outside to that part of the bush again. I was shocked to hear this. But why? What will it do? I mean, it didn't even show itself for years. I was almost demanding answers. Lily, Lily, that thing is the reason I lost my brother and father. He told me, tears welling up in his eyes. This worried me. I'd never seen my grandfather cry before. I shook my head a solemn yes. I walked back to my room, and my mom came up and hugged me tight and told me, If that thing comes back, just run straight to me, all right? I once again shook a solemn yes and hugged her back. That was a few years ago, and I'm now in my last few years of high school, and I almost forgot this incident because I left the house with my mom so she could get a better job. I only remember it now because my uncle died a few weeks ago. They found him with a weird black mark on his arm. One. Failed attempt, or was it? By Lupine Bane. This is going to sound crazy at first, but as the story goes on, I hope it begins to make sense to you. I am a hunter, and oftentimes that means I'm an explorer too. I go traditional bow hunting in extremely rural places, and on this night in particular, that was forever changed. Like a fool, I was alone, and I had pushed on much further than I wanted to. The Blue Ridge Mountains in North Georgia will do that to you. I've always considered myself a good bushcrafter, and had confidence in my skills to keep safe in most situations. It was almost dark, and I had been climbing down some hills, and knew I should just camp and go back in the morning. I cooked up some rabbit, and of course took some cool bushcraft selfies, Soon I was dozing off, when suddenly there was a loud, deafening boom that made me jump out of my skin. The sound was metallic, like tin roofing being slammed. I quickly thought it was moonshiners or another type of shady people. I shoved everything back into my small pack and then I put out my fire. I sat still, waiting to hear anything, and then I heard it again that metallic bang. 
It was more like stressed metal about to give. My fingers trembled on my bow. Anxious at the thought that I may have to use it in self-defense, I crept down the ridge, hoping to see a pickup, simply loading up some gear and leaving. But I saw darkness. No fire, no flashlights, no other people anywhere. I stood there, contemplating what to do next, and as I went to take my next step, I heard the loud, crashing sound again. I froze solid. The sound was coming from right in front of me, just down the hill. As my eyes adjusted, I could make out a large homemade cage, like the ones you would see at the mouth of a mine. I could then see what looked like a campsite that had been abandoned quickly. There were small fire pits with smoking ash still. Then I could make out an unsettling amount of animal bones. That's when the smell hit me, the rot of meat. I was so zoned in at what I was looking at that I hadn't really given the cage much attention, thinking at that point it was probably the skeleton to make a makeshift tent. And that's when it happened. I was still behind the rocks in the hill, mostly hidden, but the feeling of dread came over me hard, and it nearly made me sick. It was like the most primal sense of knowing your prey and you're about to meet your demise. I dropped my bow, not giving two craps about hunting or stealth at that point, and I grabbed my sidearm instead. Before I could look over the rocks again, the most disturbing and horrifying scream bellowed out. It was so loud and deep, I could feel it rumbling in my chest. It was all wrong. There was nothing on God's green earth that makes that sound. It was like some sort of siren, and a man's fading screams were played in reverse at the same time. As I began to nope out of there, I heard the metal clanging again, and I stopped. I thought, what if someone is stuck under a rock? What if someone needs help? It happens all the time out here. I ponied up, and I ran down the hill. As I approached the cage out of the darkness, I see a massive shape throw itself at the side, desperately trying to get at me. I jumped back and screamed, thinking it wasn't a trapped climber, rather a bear mauling in progress. Without a single thought, I fired through what I now knew to be a steel trap of some kind. The thing yelped and slammed into the corner and sat still. Its breathing sounded almost like a car idle. It sat there, breathing heavily in the cage that it could not escape. I soon began to fear that it was a person in that cage, for what reason I don't know, but I had still fired at it. My assumption of it being human quickly perished, as it stood back up on two legs and lunged at me, a hairy arm poking out through the bars of the cage and nearly clawing my face to shreds. Being so confused, so terrified, I turned around and I ran. Nothing made sense that night, and I was too scared to even struggle to think straight. As I put distance between us, I could hear the thing from the cage screaming again. The sound was horrible and made me nauseous. I ran till I got sick. I threw up and I kept running. When I made it to a paved road, I called the police and the rangers, but when they arrived, all that amounted to was them suspecting me of something. I passed their little tests with flying colors. I was completely sober, but they didn't pay my story much mind. I can't stop thinking about it. What kind of camp did I stumble upon? What was that in the cage? Just what in the world is going on in the Blue Mountains? Two, The Wendigo by Frank L. I remember it clear as day. It was back in 1989. I was 12 years old, and I was with my dad, my uncle Vincent, and my brother Joe. We had gone turkey hunting in Tennessee for a week. One day, we went out a couple of yards away from our camp, because Vincent had caught sight of some turkeys. We went out and split up. 
Me and my dad went to the right, and Joe and Vincent went to the left. We were walking around, silently, searching for our prey. It was quiet for a long time, and both me and my dad were beginning to think that Vincent hadn't seen anything. Maybe he had just dreamt of the turkeys. That's when we heard a sound. My dad shushed me and gave me the hand signal to follow. I did as he told me. We slowly walked up a hill. As we reached the top, my dad stopped and I nearly ran into him. I could see the side of his face. He was looking in the distance and his skin was growing so pale. I don't think I'd ever seen his eyes so wide. I went up beside him and I poked him, trying to figure out what was going on. He didn't budge, either ignoring me or just completely unaware that I was still there. Curious and worried, I followed his gaze and I quickly saw what he was staring at. It was tall and pale, its arms stretched to the length of its body and it was staring in the distance, just standing still as if enjoying the slight breeze. We watched in horror too afraid to even breathe in case it might alert this odd creature. The tall, thin, and lumbering thing turned and walked back in the opposite direction, disappearing in the trees. And a few seconds later, a bone-chilling howl erupted from where it had disappeared. That's when my father and I ran back. We nearly collided with Joe and Vincent, and the looks on their faces told us that they had seen it too. In complete wordless silence, the four of us packed up and left for home. It wasn't until 19 years later that Vincent brought up the event again, asking us if we remembered what we saw that day. I hesitantly nodded my head, only for Vincent to say something else that horrified me. Yeah, it was bizarre enough that something like that exists but to think there were two of them, unbelievable. Vincent and Joe had seen two of the things, and somehow that makes the event all the more terrifying. Three, I barely outran it by B-Dog. It was a cold evening when my dad and I set out to go hunting. He told me beforehand that for better chances at seeing deer, we would head off in separate directions, but he reminded me that he'd be very close at all times, so I didn't have to worry. I nervously said, okay. My dad said he would stay on the hillside we were on, and he told me to keep hiking until my judgment told me that I had found a good spot. Soon I was alone and on my way, like my father had instructed me. I continued on, a sick feeling building up inside me. This was the first time I had gone on my own like this, but I reminded myself that if anything happened, I had my firearm and my dad wasn't too far away. I ignored the feeling and didn't think about it until later when I heard a noise behind me about 20 yards away. I immediately turned in that direction to check it out, thinking it was my dad who had decided to join me. But I saw nothing, save for some swaying branches that were motionless when I had passed them. When I turned forward once more to continue on my way, I nearly shouted because my dad was in front of me. His lips were pursed and he had his finger over them telling me to be quiet. I was confused. How did he get in front of me so fast and so quietly? Why was he here at all? He grabbed me by the forearm and dragged me back in the direction that we had come from. Without a word, I simply followed him. Something had spooked him, and if it had spooked my dad, then I didn't want to be in the woods any longer. But not long after that, I began to hear branches breaking and heavy footsteps gaining on us. When I turned around, I saw the head of something. What I remember, something that is scarred into my mind, were massive antlers seven and a half feet off the ground. 
Whatever it was, it was huge, and it was coming right for us. When we made it back to the truck, luckily in one piece, my dad peeled out of there. Halfway home, he finally said something after a long silence. He said, I'm sorry. He looked at me with tears in his eyes and said he promised he would never make me go alone again. Four, The Thing That Ate My Dog by Blade6109. It was maybe six years ago. I was 13 at the time. Me, my dad, and my brother were going coon hunting. We would go out nearly every night, taking the dogs with us to train them to compete in our local coon hunting clubs and maybe even some bigger competitions. It was January. The three of us got our stuff together one night and went out to one of our usual hunting spots and began our hunt. At that point, I had been hunting for years and so the dark never really scared me anymore, not like it did when I was a child. I actually came to enjoy it, seeing the different creatures that came out in the night and hearing all the bugs chirping. Oftentimes, you'd even hear a pack of coyotes out in the distance. It was all very peaceful to me, but it wasn't that night. That night was cold, quiet. The bright full moon should have been a sign of an easy hunt, but rather, it seemed like a terrifying omen. The three of us had just set the dogs loose and watched them scurry away, quickly trying to find the scent of a coon and began to track. We followed the dogs. They began barking at a tree. Apparently, one of them had picked up the scent. Right away, though, I knew something was wrong. His barking wasn't the same as it usually was, it instead sounded like he was chasing something instead of tracking a scent. Not too long after, the other dog began to do the same. I looked over to my dad, and he had a puzzled look on his face. We waited a few minutes listening to the dogs and whatever they were chasing. When the barking suddenly stopped, my stomach sank. Now, we have Garmin tracking collars on both the dogs, and we had a handheld GPS that allowed us to find them. We looked at our mini map to see where they had gone. We saw their blips on the map, and they had both gone completely still. Me, my brother, and my father, we looked at each other and quickly made our way to where the collars were, hoping that they were still attached. I was thinking maybe they ran down an armadillo hole, and that's why we couldn't hear them anymore. But soon after, we heard one of the dogs let out a very loud and painful yelp, like it was being attacked or it had gotten injured. Then it went quiet again. My brother, my father, and I stood there, checking the GPS tracker again, watching the screen and waiting for the dogs to move, but they still didn't. I was already feeling scared and had that feeling of, we need to get home fast. My dad said to us, We've got to go after them. They're probably in a hole again. They're going to get themselves hurt. But my dad didn't believe that himself. There was a faltering in his voice. He was afraid. My dad is a big guy who has the don't mess with me look. He's six foot six, and he was a veteran of 20 years. He was hardly ever scared of anything. I let out a groan, and we all started following the tracker again towards the dog's location. It was quiet. Not even the bugs were chirping anymore, just the sound of our feet smashing through the forest. We get about 350 yards from the dog's location on the GPS, and all of a sudden, my dad says, Stop. My brother and I listened and looked at him. His eyes were glued to the screen of the GPS, we ask him what's wrong, and he shows it to us. It showed one of the dogs flying through the forest, zigzagging quickly, but the other one was still motionless. We sat there for five minutes, and my dad starts walking toward the other dog, the stationary one. We arrive at a creek and follow it up to the dog's location and get right on it, but we don't see the dog. We look around for a minute, then suddenly my dad says loudly, 
My God. I go over to where he's standing and shine my light into the creek, and I can see the red stains in the water. I follow the red trail up to the side of the creek, only to find half of what was left of the dog. I puked, busted a few blood vessels in my face. When I look back at my dad, he was loading his weapon, and he was mad. My brother and I were standing there, shaking in our boots, just ready to go home. My dad tells me to go and get the tracker off the dog and get back up the bank. I wasted no time, and I went to get the tracker, but halfway up the bank, I froze. There was a loud boom. My dad had fired, seemingly right over my head. I looked over to where he shot, and standing there on the other side of the creek, about 200 feet from me, stood something at about seven feet tall. It was hard to make out much detail, but I could see its massive yellow eyes and shimmering moist fur. My dad yells at me to run, and the three of us bolt back to the truck. I didn't turn back, but I heard the most awful sound in my life, a loud, deep, chilling howl. A few seconds later, we heard it crashing through the water and chasing after us. It seemed like ages before we finally saw the truck. We climbed in quickly. We started it up and turned on our lights and light bar. Standing just to the left of the truck was this, was this thing that looked like a wolf. Lips curled back, revealing large teeth and a foaming mouth. It stood on all fours, but it was definitely no wolf because it stood at half the size of our truck. My dad kicks it into drive, and as we pull away, he tries to run the thing over, but it jumps to the side. Then my dad floors it down the trail and hits the road soon, speeding twice the limit all the way home. We all sat quietly in the truck. My little brother starts crying, and I'm sitting there frozen with a what the heck just happened look on my face. I thought of the GPS tracker and asked my dad to let me see it. He hands it over, and I look at the screen. I can feel my skin turn pale. The tracker had stopped transmitting, but the last known location of the other dog that had been zigzagging all over the radar was right where we had parked, right where the thing had been standing. It was inside whatever that creature was. The following two stories are about ghost hunting, but hey, it's still hunting nonetheless. Five, A Demon Hates Me by John M. About five or six years ago, I was dating this girl named Anne. I was 21 and she was 24. We had been dating for a few months but had known each other for years, and we decided to move in together and found a nice apartment. I worked part-time on nights, and sometimes while I was gone, Anne would pass the time by going ghost hunting with friends. One night before I went to work, I went shopping into a local store where I was friends with the manager when I received a call from Anne. She was begging me to come home right away, because she had heard someone forcing their way in through the back door. Our back door was in the center of the apartment, locked from our side, and there was a set of stairs that led down to another outside door that was locked from the inside. So I didn't believe her until I heard the inner door slamming like someone was hitting it. I left the store and immediately ran home. When I got there, Anne and our friend Sarah were standing in the corner of our kitchen, I unlocked the door and slowly opened it, but there was no one there. I walked down the stairs and unlocked and opened the back door, yet I didn't see anyone still, not even any footprints in the snow. I turned to go back up the stairs, and when I did, I finally saw it. Bare human footprints on the steps all the way to the last step at the top of the stairs. I didn't know what to think about it at the time, honestly. Skip ahead a few weeks, and there were no incidents, and we forgot all about it. One night, after Anne had gone ghost hunting, 
We were sleeping in our bed. It was just us, because her daughter's father had her daughter for overnight visits this week. At around one in the morning, Anne woke up and started screaming. I jumped up, covered in goosebumps, and asked her what was wrong, and she told me she had had a nightmare and that she had seen a dark figure with red smoky eyes that told her it was following her and that it was mad at me. Before disappearing, it promised to prove itself real. We went back to sleep after an hour or so. That next night, at about midnight, our stereo turned on by itself. I thought Anne was pulling a prank to scare me, so I unplugged the stereo and I hid the remote. Only 15 minutes later, it came on again. I asked her to stop messing around and she said it wasn't her. I noticed she was still next to me in bed, so I got up and checked the stereo. And when I looked behind it, I was shocked. It was still unplugged. I tried to figure out how it turned on by itself, but I couldn't. I was dumbfounded. The next morning, Anne seemed a little off, which I thought was just from a lack of sleep. I was out trying to find a second job when I received a text stating that she could not be with me anymore because something said that it would never stop until I was gone. Anne then confessed about all the things she had been doing while ghost hunting, some of which was pretty sketchy. She said she thinks something is now following her, but she still doesn't want to give up ghost hunting, and that was the end of that. I still don't know if it was a real demon or just Anne's psychotic way of dumping me. But the two of us haven't spoken since. And from what I've heard, Anne is still single and is not looking for a relationship. Six, College Haunting by Darkest Hour Videos. Everyone in town knows that our college campus is haunted. It's one of those things that you grow up telling spooky stories about at sleepovers, making all the other girls squill when you suddenly pull out the jump scare. It wasn't anything a lot of people really ever worried about unless you went to the school. I started college there back in the fall of 2010 as an art major. That meant I had to spend a lot of time in the humanities building. According to rumor, that was the most haunted building on campus. Over the years being there, I'd felt many weird things. It felt more eerie rather than dangerous though, and I was very curious about it. Though I would get very bad feelings around the backstage area and going on the stairs that led down to the basement. But again, I would generally shrug it off as me just being a paranoid kid. After the first month or so, I got involved with a small group of people that enjoyed going ghost hunting on the weekends. They ended up getting special permission from one of the art professors to stay in the building late that night. I was invited to go on this little hunt as my first tester trip. They wanted to make sure that I would stay calm. We get there and go through a little safety spill and break up into groups. Nothing much happens for the first little while but then I suggest we head to the dark room on the second floor. Earlier that week, I had an experience in there and thought that maybe we could find something. Two of us out of the group go inside while the other two wait in the hallway. We begin a bit of radio silence to start the EVP session. During that time, I kept feeling something touching the back of my shirt and gently tugging down on it. I stay quiet and ignore it, hoping that maybe a voice was caught on the recording. We started to ask questions, and the tugs on the back of my shirt became harder and more obvious. I told the person with me, and he began to ask who it was that was tugging on my shirt. I began to feel extremely warm and uncomfortable in there, and I said I really wanted to get out of that room. I was quite claustrophobic, and two people in a small dark room was pushing it for me. However, the thought of an unseen entity wanting to mess with me while I was in such an uncomfortable position made it worse. We went out into the hallway and listened to the recordings. There was nothing there but white noise, our voices, 
and some whispering that we couldn't really make out. We chalked that up to the AC units in the building kicking on. It was still hot as heck, even though the summer was wrapping up. The rest of the time spent in two small groups was rather uneventful. We regrouped at 2 a.m., and we all went down to the basement together, and I wish I'd never gone. We all took our positions in the prop-filled basement. There was costume and prop storage down there, and we turned on a UV light. One of the guys said that he had read somewhere that entities may be attracted to it. A volunteer went and shut off the lights for the basement, and we began to wait. Once the lead said he was ready to turn out the lights, I got the distinct feeling that doing that would lead to a bad time. I had told him not to, basically begged him not to, but out went the light anyway. And immediately after, I felt something cold closing around my neck. I couldn't breathe. It felt like something was pulling all of the air out of my lungs, and I couldn't stand either. One of the guys caught me, and that ended the night's investigations. I had red marks on my neck that faded after a little while, but the guy that caught me had very tiny scratches near his eyes. We didn't do any more investigations for the rest of the summer, but the following semester, we all decided that we needed to have one more go at the building and see if what had happened was just a fluke. We broke up into groups again and had a rather uneventful night, until a little after midnight. While I was inside of a piano practice room with one of the others, the piece of the building was shattered because we heard a scream, the sounds of running going down the stairs, the door to the stairway opening and closing, and the door to the outside opening and closing as well. And then the stairway door opened and closed again. The only problem with the second opening and closing of the stairway door was the fact that there were no footsteps to go along with it. We were all called to the auditorium for a little meeting. Turns out, the two that ran out of the building had been investigating near the second floor darkroom. While near the darkroom, they began to hear noises from inside the room and gentle knocks in the women's restroom door. On an EVP, they heard something say, my name, right before something inside the dark room fell. And that's what had them running out of the building. Because of this, I was asked to leave for the safety of the rest of the group. I was bummed out, of course, but I left. One of my friends in the group said they would come and see me afterwards. The rest of the story was told to me by this friend, and I have no personal recollection of this, and that really freaks me out. My friend came to my house after the investigation was over, and he found me sitting in the middle of my living room floor with papers covered in weird ramblings and drawings spread all around me. He freaked, called a friend of ours that practiced Wicca. She came over to smudge and bless the house, hoping to get rid of whatever was there. He said I was pretty out of it the entire time, but I seemed normal the next day. I'm so grateful that he came to see me instead of going straight home. There's no telling what would have happened if I had remained like that. Now, all these years later, I still sometimes feel something dark in my house. I'm not sure if this entity followed me from the college or had been there before all of it, but I do know that I now sleep with holy water and my father's rosary beside my bed. Seven, Skinwalker in My Dream by Eli A. I'm 15 years old, and I live two hours from Kenora, Ontario. It all began with a strange dream. In it, my father and I had brought home a deer, but as soon as we began to prep it, after we turned around for a moment and looked back, it had disappeared. All that was left was a red trail on the ground leading into the woods, and that was the dream. Simple and nothing out of the ordinary, right? Skip to a couple of months later. I went hunting with my dad on our property far from our town. It was about six in the morning and it was freezing that day. I've never been so cold in my life. I was struggling to stay warm and I didn't realize the forest was dead silent. 
which was weird because it's usually full of sounds like cows mooing nearby and birds, but there was nothing. Anyway, my dad and I were in two different tree stands about 10 feet apart, and we were watching a trail in between them on the ground. After two hours of inactivity, my dad managed to fall asleep waiting while I sat there still. I started to hear the very faint sound of leaves crushing underfoot as it slowly grew louder. I knew it was heading this way. I started to see a little bit of movement in the tall grass nearby, and when my eyes focused, I saw a huge male white-tailed deer eating some seeds on the ground. I reached slowly to grab my firearm while my dad was still sleeping. I looked through the scope toward the deer, and I saw that it was looking in my direction. I knew I had to make the shot before it fully realized we were there, but I couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger that time. The most horrifying thing happened next. The deer stood up on two legs. Now that I had a full body look at it, I saw that it was not a deer, more like a man with a deer's legs and a head with antlers. It stared for about 30 seconds and then it ran towards me. I freaked out, thinking it was going to come after me, but then it walked right under my tree stand and went the opposite way. I sat in the cold silence, wondering what on earth I just saw. The sounds began again, the wind, the cows, and birds. My dad woke up, and I told him we needed to go, that there's nothing here. We packed up and left. I still come out to the property every once in a while, but whenever I do, I always bring protection, hunting or not. Eight, Red Eyes by Kyle. I've lived in Michigan my entire life. Wolves and wild dogs are pretty rare in my area. With that being said, one night, my friend, his dad, and my dad were out on a late night drive through our fields and forests. We were on our way back to the house. I was riding in the bed of the pickup truck when I looked in the grass and saw a pair of blood-soaked red eyes staring back at me. I jumped. The thing almost looked like a mix between a dog and a cat. I quickly told my dad, and he said it was probably just a panther. But those eyes proved otherwise. I've never seen anything like them. It looked more like a bloodhound or a wendigo from the children's stories and legends. To make things worse, I've been going squirrel hunting ever since I got my hunter's safety permit and license, so I spend a lot of time in the woods during squirrel season. One day, while in a patch of snowy woods, a strong wind knocked me out of my chair and sent my gear blowing in front of me. I grabbed my pack and firearm and decided to call it a day. I began to walk back to the house, and while looking back at the woods, I saw those red eyes again, following me. I believe that big gust of wind had something to do with it, but maybe not. At night in that area, though, sometimes I hear loud screaming in the woods, and I wonder what it is. 9. Glad I wasn't alone by Full Auto Airsoft. It was three months ago, September as of writing this. Me and my friend Justin were gathering our gear to go for a deer hunt. It was a little past noon, so we didn't expect animals to start moving around yet. We had plenty of time to get prepared. Our usual hunting spot is only a mile and a half walk from the property. The spot we like to sit at gives us a view of the whole area, it's on top of a hill in a field. The wood line is directly behind us, so we're quite close to some deer bedding. I was armed with a compound bow while Justin had a crossbow with the scope. Our plan was to sit till about six, as it usually gets dark at around 5.45. One thing that was off about our hunt that day was that the whole place was a bit quiet, besides the occasional leaf falling or wind gusts. Since we saw nothing, we decided to move down the hill to get a different vantage point. 
I was putting my water bottle back in my day pack, preparing to move, but a sudden crunch made us both freeze in place. I slowly drew my bow, expecting a deer or a coyote, but what we saw still haunts me to this day. I saw deer-like horns sticking out of the brush, so naturally I aimed in that direction, ready for a deer to come out any moment. But something was wrong. It was about 70 yards away, so I waited for it to come out into the open, but when it revealed itself, I was petrified, and I'm sure Justin was just the same. The whole place smelled of a rotten stench, something like sulfur. When it walked out, the creature had the head of a deer. One part of it in particular was burnt into my brain, and that was its eyes, dark, empty black pits in the creature's head. It was about four and a half feet tall on all fours, but that creature stood up like a man on its hind legs, scaling in at over eight feet tall. It stood there, gazing out at the empty highway about a mile out. We did not want to get its attention, so we tried to be silent. I've never been so horrified in my life. Luckily, when a semi-engine braked, it scared the creature back into the woods. We waited five minutes, though, in silence, so if we ran, it wouldn't hear us, or at least it wouldn't catch up with us. All I can say is that if you're going out into the woods for any reason, it's always best to not go alone if you can. Take it from me, because no one wants an encounter like this to happen to them. 10. Skinwalker Hunting by James I was 14 when I saw this. I've always been an outdoorsy type of kid. I used to grab one of my guns and go out into the woods 200 yards behind my house, and I would fire at anything that moved, or I would go on hunting. One day during October, I thought it was a good idea to go squirrel hunting, so I grabbed my 12 gauge and a box of shells. I made my way out and passed my mom, telling her I was going to a friend's place. I walked for a good two hours, not really seeing much of anything for the entire walk. I made it to the shelter I'd made when I was younger, and it's usually a hot spot for squirrels, but there was no activity whatsoever. I walked for another half hour before I got a weird feeling, like I was being watched. I thought some neighbor kid was trying to scare me, so I was at the ready and still, until an ear-splitting screech nearly made me drop my 12 gauge. It was the loudest thing I'd ever heard in my life, but even so, I could tell it was a distance away from me. The last thing I wanted was for something that loud and terrifying to come any closer. I calmed myself down and gave a quick prayer. As it remained silent for a few more minutes, I was able to keep going and actually got a few squirrels before going back home. I was making my way back toward the shelter, but as I passed it, it was getting dark and I was beginning to hear the sound of running all around me, like something was in the woods encircling me. Of course, that's when the ear-splitting shriek came again. This time, it was so close, I thought my ears were going to bleed. Right after that, I began to hear something jumping through the branches on the trees. It sounded much heavier than your usual wildlife. I choked down a scream, and I watched something with a vaguely human shape jumping from branch to branch. I crawled into my hut and I waited. When the sounds of the swaying branches carried off in the distance, that's when I ran. It was my opening to get away and I took it. It took me 45 minutes to make it back to the house, but when I did, I broke through that door and slammed it shut. My mom ran into the living room wondering what all the ruckus was about. Despite me crying and telling her my story, she was mad at me and grounded me, saying that staying out so late had given me nightmares and a fear of the dark. But that doesn't explain what I saw. What I saw was very real and far from natural. Warning. 
The following story contains visceral depictions of animals fighting for survival. Battle of the Backwoods From Anonymous Nothing haunts a man more than the decisions of the past. The world threw something impossible for me to comprehend at an early age. I would soon find out that life is not all rainbows and cotton candy. Many people come here and see the majestic mist rising from the mountains early in the morning and think of it as pure beauty. However, all I see is gases the hills belch up from whatever they swallowed up the night before. Because for me, the mountains have tainted my very soul and left holes in my heart forever. The wilderness can grant many gifts, growth, new life, clarity, and a vast amount of opportunities. But also, the wild can suffocate you in sorrow and drown you in dread, given the right circumstances. Have you ever asked yourself what you would do in the event of needing a helping hand in a dire situation? This was the difficulty that I was faced with, which changed my life forever. I grew up in the foothills of eastern Kentucky, what I consider to be the base of the Appalachian Mountains on my grandparents' farm, mostly. I spent the majority of my childhood learning lessons of life with my grandfather. The value of a dollar was also how I had my fun digging ginseng roots, hunting for substance, and wildlife population management in our area. My grandfather was a fur bearer, like his father before him. Anything that was hard work pretty much is part of my upbringing. Looking back on those years, I would not trade them for anything. We went to church every Wednesday and Sunday, and always had a lot of cousins around to play within the creeks and streams around the farm. Taught early survival in the wilderness, I learned lessons that never came easy, but always held lasting impressions. We only went to town a couple of days a week when we visited the feed store for our livestock, and sometimes I would rent a movie from the video store uptown. That was as close as I got to the big city lifestyle as a child. The main thing we did most nights when the whippoorwills started singing and the lightning bugs came out was to gather our hound dogs and travel to the Daniel Boone National Forest to go raccoon hunting. We did this because, as I said, my grandfather and I were fur bearers. The raccoon population in our area is very thick, so this was part of our lifestyle to chase that hard-earned dollar. Also for wildlife management population control, because raccoons can carry and transmit more types of diseases than most animals in our area. We had two dogs at that time. Our young dog's name was Bo. He was a red tick hound, beautiful in every way. He was mostly red in color with a few white specks on him, almost the color of strawberry wine. Our older dog was a treeing walker hound. Around here we just call his breed Walker, and his name was Old Jake. He was a giant of a dog for his breed, at somewhere around 120 pounds. He was a tricolored dog, meaning he was black, white, and tan. He was an absolutely great hound, and had a heck of a good nose on him for tracking critters through the mountains of the Daniel Boone National Forest. Old Jake wasn't afraid of anything at all. Once he would track a raccoon to a tree, it was his domain. On this particular night, it was the opening night of raccoon hunting season in the state of Kentucky, October 1st, 2003. My grandfather and I had decided to go on a hunting adventure into the Daniel Boone National Forest. He was in poor health, so I always had to handle our dogs and take care of them when we went out on our nightly hunts. We had a bit of a late start that evening, so we had to travel off of the beaten path on a six-mile road called Shooting Range Road near the Clear Creek and Leatherwood area of the Daniel Boone. Once we got to the very end of the road and it came to a dead end, we parked our truck. We then got out, dropped the tailgate down, and opened up the dog box door. Bo and old Jake jumped to the ground, ran straight down a creek in the forest, and started hunting for a raccoon scent. A short while after, old Jake started barking on the scent track he smelled, and then Bo joined in with him, making that sweet southern hound music 
that whistled a gravely song through the crisp night air. They tracked the scent of the raccoon they were chasing up the side of a mountain and over a cliff a good 700 yards away from the truck. Shortly after that, the raccoon got tired of running and decided to climb a tree. Both the dogs let out what is called a location bark, letting us know that they found the animal location they had been chasing and will continue to bark until I get to the tree they're at. That's just how they're trained. My grandfather looked at me and said, Sounds to me they found it. Go on, grab the gun out of the truck and take the two-way radio with you so we can keep in touch. As I said before, my grandfather was in poor health. He could not travel on foot very far. So I did just as he said, strapping the gun to my back, grabbing the two-way radio, and starting into the forest towards the location of our dogs. As I made my way in, I heard the sound of a pack of coyotes off in the distance, barking and howling going on crazy as a coyote pack does. Grandfather called me on the radio, saying, Do you hear that pack of coyotes? You better get in there quick to the dogs. That way when they see you, they'll run away. I know that might sound crazy to a lot of people, but in our area of Kentucky, coyotes are hunted hard because they can cause harm to livestock so they're mostly nocturnal in our area and are terrified of people. In almost every case when a coyote sees a human, they run as fast as they can to get away from them, at least in Kentucky. After that, I started picking up my pace, trying to get to our hounds. However, it was too late. Just minutes later, the pack of coyotes had made it to our hounds, and within seconds, a massive fight broke out. I heard them grab a hold of Bo. He began to whimper and took off running to get away from them. But not old Jake. He held his ground right next to the tree he tracked the raccoon to. In his mind, he probably thought the coyotes were coming to take the tree away from him. But really, they just wanted to eat him. Old Jake fought all over the place with the pack of coyotes. He was holding his ground for a while. Soon after, the whole dynamic of the struggle changed and the coyotes were starting to fight old Jake as a pack. My grandfather called me again. Get in there quick. They're gonna kill him. So I started running through the forest, scared for my dog's life. Suddenly, again, the fight changed, and Bo had circled back around and came back to help old Jake fight the pack of coyotes. Once again, old Jake was holding his ground, or so I thought. The coyotes were whimpering and screaming. It was just pure mayhem in the woods, an absolute battle. I soon made it to old Jake, and once I shined my flashlight on him, I saw that he had a coyote by the throat. Once he saw me, old Jake let go. That coyote took off running along with the rest of the pack. I walked over to old Jake, bent over and patted him on the head, checking him out. There were a few cuts and gashes on him. Overall, he was in good shape, being that he was just in a fight with a pack of coyotes and lived. Just in front of us was a huge black oak tree. And behind it, I heard the sound of a coyote whimpering, doing what I would call a blood gargle, choking on its own blood. Old Jake and I walked around to check it out. I was thinking that around this tree, we'd see that Bo had killed a coyote, but once we could see, I then noticed that it wasn't Bo. It wasn't Bo at all. It was a great big dog, very broad, bigger than the size of a Saint Bernard. It turns and looks at me while holding a dead coyote in its mouth by the ribcage. No part of the dead coyote was touching the ground. I stopped. The strange dog dropped the coyote out of its mouth and looked at me. That's when I realized how much I underestimated the massive size of this animal. It leaned forward and stood up on its hind legs in a really slow motion that I can only compare to an elderly person trying to get out of a rocking chair. At this moment, I thought it was leaning against something. That was the only logical explanation. This thing then took two steps forward while standing on two legs. I then noticed the chest. It didn't have a dog's chest. It had the chest of a man, 
a man's abdomen too. Then the hands caught my attention. It was moving them up beside itself, and the hands were more similar to that of a man, but more like claws. I saw its face was charcoal colored, with solid black eyes of eternal darkness, with blood coating dripping down its mouth to its chest, like hot candle wax running down a wick. So much blood, not like the blood you would normally see in any type of animal fight. It was more so like it was eating the coyote alive during the previous attack, before my arrival. Again, the creature took another step towards me. I broke out into a cold sweat, my mind finally realizing what I was looking at was a darn werewolf. That is not supposed to be of this world. The feeling in my mind was just absolute horror, as if the world around me no longer existed. I was immersed in some sort of overwhelming sense of dread. In a millisecond, my fight or flight emotion kicked in. I jumped back and started to run. I shone my flashlight forward as I ran, and then back behind me, over and over to see what was happening. During this time, the sounds of my oversized gumboots were clicking loudly in the stillness of the night and the crunching of the dead leaves beneath each stride that I took. The creature then began to chase after me, moving at a pace I'd never seen. Soon after, the monster took only a few steps. Old Jake hit into him, lunging his body weight towards the dogman-type creature that made a loud thud noise of Old Jake's body, slamming into the monster. Old Jake snapped his jaws together, growling trying to protect me from any harm. As I shined my light behind me, the werewolf just pushed old Jake off of him with one hand like he was just a gnat, a fly, a flea, like he was nothing and it didn't bother the creature at all, while old Jake rolled back onto the ground four or five feet. Then the creature continued to chase me, like I was the only thing in the world it was interested in. I started to yell out, Put it to him, Jake! Put it to him! Come on! You can do it! All the while, I continued to run for my life, my gun still strapped to my back. It was only a 22 caliber rifle. That wouldn't cause any harm to this creature, other than maybe aggravated even more. I stood at 5 foot 10, and this creature towered over me at least another 2 feet in height. As I'm running, once again old Jake attempts to stop him as it chases me, throwing his own body weight into the monster, and like the first time, it pushes him aside with ease. So back to the chase, the werewolf went in my direction as I ran, it had its mind set on me and me alone. I'm running with everything I had, all the energy my legs could produce through the forest towards the direction of the truck. I tried screaming again. Come on, old Jake, put it to him! Get him, Jake! Get him! Come on, Jake, I need you! Yet this thing was gaining ground on me quickly. For the third time, old Jake comes in towards the monster and hits him again with his body weight. This time, I heard a loud popping noise, sounded like the jaws of death locking down on the creature. Before I turned around, I just knew that old Jake had finally made good contact with the monster. That's when I saw Jake had his mouth latched onto the hip of the werewolf, just hanging onto there like a chihuahua on a mailman. That was essentially the size difference. Old Jake just wasn't anywhere near the same size as this animal. The monster then stopped and grabbed old Jake with both of its hands. And as sure as I'm telling you this story now, it threw old Jake through the woods like a bag of garbage. I could see old Jake's body flying through the air, hitting low-hanging tree branches, leaves, and brush. I knew at that point old Jake was dead. It was just me and the monster at this moment. I continued to run, tears now rolling down my face, a sense of both sorrow and dread with the thoughts in my mind that this thing just killed my dog. I'm all alone. No one here to save me. Not even Daniel Boone himself can come up from the grave and help me at this point. I'm a goner, for sure. The monster continued to run after me. It was so close to me that I could feel the heat on the back of my neck, I'm trying to run in a zigzag type of movement. While being overwhelmed with emotion, I started yelling once again, 
Come on, old Jake, please. I need you. But no matter how many times I yelled and screamed for help, none came. Old Jake was gone. I stumbled over a fallen tree branch and fell face down on my belly into an old treetop that had blown over in the forest, maybe after a storm or something. I rolled over on my back, and the creature dropped down on all four feet. I started to crawl back into the mangled tree branches and decaying leaves while the monster continued to pursue me. By then, the animal and I were at point-blank range, just a couple of feet from each other. It snapped its mouth and snarled, blood from the freshly killed coyote still dripping down its mouth. Mixed with snot and drool while blowing its breath right on me, the smell of rot and decay coming with it. The whole time, I continued to yell, Come on, Jake, come on! But I knew that was it. This was the end, and I was trying to crawl for my life backward while facing the animal just trying to find a way out. As the creature was now in range to grab a hold of me, out of nowhere, old Jake hits the monster broadside, throwing himself into it and it rolls over onto its back. Jake climbs up on top of it and starts mauling him, snapping his jaws just munching on the beast. Old Jake was really putting the hurt to this dog from hell. I heard Jake's jaws lock down someplace on the creature and the sounds of bones crushing. The monster let out a painful howl that felt as if it rattled the very earth I was crawling on. I realized this was my chance I stood up and ran across the mountain once again. The whole time I could hear the battle that was taking place behind me, and I was no longer looking back. Unfortunately, the situation changed, and I could hear the monster finally turn back on old Jake. It... it sounded like it was ripping him apart. He was letting out painful barks and whimpers, making my stomach turn into knots hearing the pain old Jake was going through. At this time, I came upon a clearing not far from the truck, and I turned around, took the rifle off my back, and began to fire. The gunshots echoed off the mountains around me. I began to yell, Come on, Jake! Let's go! But the forest had gone completely silent, and it seemed no noise at all could be heard. I ran down to the truck, opening the door and climbing inside. My grandfather said, What on earth is going on? I said to him, Just drive. We have to go. We need to get out of here. I started to tell him what happened. Every detail I could. I was trembling in pure terror. Calmly, my grandfather said, Listen, if you want to hunt, fish, and do stuff as a man, then you need to realize that there are things in the woods that I cannot explain, and you have to come to terms with that if you want to continue to live this lifestyle. In his humbling words, he then said, Since you are so upset, I'll go ahead and take you home. But we will come back in the morning to look for Bo and old Jake. I said to him, No point in coming back. I heard what happened to old Jake. He's dead. Papa, he's gone. He fought for my life, but he just didn't make it. Once again, my grandfather spoke. If everything you said is true, then you owe it to old Jake to at least come back in the morning and look for him. He fought tooth and nail for your life. As a boy of just 15 years old, what my grandfather said was both the law and the truth to me. Every single word was one of wisdom and knowledge, well beyond my years. We drove home, and I didn't sleep very much at all the rest of the night. Knowing as soon as day broke, we were going to drive back out to that area to look for the hounds. Meanwhile, still being filled with mixed emotions about the event that happened just hours before, I felt everything from fear to heartbreak, an absolutely traumatic event. But as the morning came and the fog was lifted from the mountains... We loaded up in the truck and traveled back out to the location we had been hunting the night before. My grandfather got out of the truck, and I just rolled my window down. We both began to call for the dogs. Here, Jake. Here. Let's go home. 
We yelled for Bo, too, but he had run far away when the coyotes had bitten him, so at the time I wasn't that worried about him. We would drive up and down the gravel road, repeating the same actions time and time again with no luck. So my grandfather said we would go home and return that evening to try once again. So that evening when we drove back to where we last saw our hounds, we started to call and whistle for them again. On down the road a bit, we could hear something moving through the forest coming out towards the road, and once it stepped out, my grandfather said, Hey, Bo just came out of the woods, that big red tick dog of yours, so grab your dog leash and go get him. I said, All right, Papa. I started to walk towards Bo. He was just barely moving slowly, and as I got closer to him, I realized that wasn't Bo. It was old Jake, covered from head to toenail in blood, some dry, most still moist. His injuries were beyond severe. Anyone who would have seen him at the time would have questioned how he was even standing, with a couple of broken bones and major flesh wounds across his body, but he was still alive. My grandfather walked over and grabbed all 120 pounds of old Jake's mangled body. He picked him up and carried him over to the vehicle, putting him in the back of the truck. I had never seen my grandfather do something like that. He was a tough love type of guy, but he was just as heartbroken at that moment as I was. Then we drove out of Daniel Boone National Forest back to the farm. Most people, I believe, would have probably, with a dog that was so severely injured, put him out of his misery and buried him. But we didn't. My mamma did a lot of veterinarian work with our animals on the farm, and somehow against all odds, she was able to doctor old Jake up and pretty much bring him back to life. From that moment on, old Jake and I had a special bond. We were always best friends, and he lived a long and happy life. I'll never forget what old Jake did for me that night in the Battle of the Backwoods. If a dog loves its human enough, they will battle something that is unbeatable to keep you safe from harm. I gave up on old Jake's life multiple times that terrible night, and he fought for me repeatedly. That was a difficult thing to live with, on top of the trauma I was not ready for at that time in my life. Moreover, if it weren't for the wisdom of my humble grandfather... Then we would have lost old Jake forever. Both have now left this world and have been called way up yonder to hunt in the hills of heaven, hopefully. You can say what you want to say about what terrifies you the most, but to me, it will always be the thing I saw. I guess you could say it was a dogman, werewolf, hellhound, skinwalker. I'm uncertain, but what I do know is it bled and felt pain just like any other animal in the world and so I know what I saw was tangible and real. By the way, about a week later, someone found Bo at a local country store, so we were able to get him back as well. If you don't have anyone to lend you a helping hand in a dire situation, then I pray you will at least bring a paw to pull you out, as I did that October night. Rest in peace, Papa Hank and old Jake. Your friend, Double A. Suffolk Skinwalker From Jacob R. As of writing this, this happened about a month ago, right at the start of the urban archery season. My dad and I are avid hunters, hunting for both food and for the trophy of the hunt. We own about 38 acres out in Suffolk, Virginia. We've been hunting there for about 7 or 8 years now but this has been the worst hunting trip of my life. My dad and I got out to the property at about 12.30 in the afternoon. We got our hunting gear on and parted our separate ways to our chosen ground blinds. I got into mine around one and got in and situated. As I sat there and waited, I decided to play Clash of Clans on my phone. Yeah, I know it's an old game, but it helps to pass the time. About an hour and a half into the hunting trip, I start to feel like I'm being watched, but I just passed it off as paranoia, so I go back to playing my game. After another half hour passes, I start to get bored, deciding to take a nap 
I slowly doze off and fall asleep for about an hour. When I woke up, I texted my dad to see how things were going on his end. Lo and behold, my phone doesn't have any service. At this point, the feeling of being watched returns twofold, and the forest has grown to be eerily silent. I see the reeds and branches moving from the slight breeze that's coming through, but I hear nothing. Then from my left, I hear my dad's voice say, Jacob? Jacob? I need your help. Please come help me. I look out of my ground blind, but I don't see him. I go back in, and by this point, the sounds of the forest have returned. So I go back to sleep for another hour or so. When I wake up for the second time, the sun has started to set, and I see this massive buck come out of the underbrush. I draw my crossbow and get ready to pull the trigger, making as little noise as possible. I start to hear what sounds like bones breaking, and the buck stands up on its hind legs. I look closer at it, and I see that its head is a skinless and meatless skull with rows of razor-sharp canine-like teeth. Before I know it, it no longer resembles a deer. It looks more like a malnourished person. Its skin is a light gray color, and it barely has any hair on its body. Its arms are so long they are barely touching the ground, and the figure is hunched over. Even in its current pose, it towers well over seven feet tall. It opens its mouth and lets out the same phrase I heard earlier in my dad's voice. Jacob? Jacob? I need your help. Please come help me. But the voice is distorted from my dad's actual voice. Chills go down my spine and I start to tremble. The creature then puts its head in the air and starts to sniff. It lets out a low growl and says, I can smell you. You're afraid. I start to slowly unzip the ground blind. It quickly snaps its head towards me, letting out an ear-piercing screech. Then it chases me. I take off running to the truck, dropping my phone in the process. The forest is dead silent once again and all that I can hear behind me is leaves crunching and twigs snapping as this creature inches closer and closer behind me. I'm almost to the truck when I trip on a root. I turn around with fear in my eyes and a cold sweat running down my face as this thing slows down to a walk and stumbles towards me. I'm cowering on the ground and just at that point, I hear my dad's actual voice coming from behind me telling me, Jacob, run. I do as I'm told, and all I hear behind me are the gunshots from my dad's pistol. About two minutes later, everything is quiet, and I see my dad running out of the woods towards me. We both hop in the truck and peel out of there. Since that day, we haven't gone into the property by ourselves. We always walk in together. Every now and then my dad and I still hear that screech way off in the distance, and we both shudder. My advice to you, don't go into the woodlands of Suffolk on your own, if you value your life and your sanity. Warning, the following story contains depictions of a dead animal. My Unforgettable Hunting Story from John 897. I'm a 37-year-old male. At 6 foot 7, I'm a pretty big guy, but I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk about the time I almost died on a hunting trip. Let's begin. I was going to my hunting cabin in the woods with some pals of mine. About a quarter mile from my cabin on the gravel road I take to get there, I found a dead deer, but it was more than dead. It was mutilated. The body was in pieces, and the head was just gone. My hunting party and I got in my truck and floored it to the cabin. We were ready to get away from that thing and whatever might have done that to it. Later that night, we were out hunting as planned. At a certain point, we heard a stick snap about 30 feet behind us. Again, after seeing the dead deer earlier, we were spooked. 
So we headed back to the cabin. We fell asleep, but about an hour later we all woke up to thudding on the walls of the cabin. We grabbed our rifles and went to check what made the sound. We expected to see a moose or bear, but what we saw out there I could only describe as a wolf man. It stood at what had to have been around eight feet tall. We were all horrified. It took a step towards us, and we just snapped out of our fear and began to fire at it. It screamed so loud, it brought all of us to our knees, but we kept shooting. Then it bolted into the forest and we ran to my truck. Once we started the truck, we didn't stop until we were back in the city we lived in. It was years before I went back to my hunting cabin. I haven't had anything like this happen to me since. However, I still wonder what would have happened if we didn't have our guns. What if we didn't go to hunt? What if we went for a different reason? A reason that didn't require guns. Warning. The following account contains depictions of violence against animals and also contains depictions of assault against men and women. My Two Paranormal Experiences From Tyler H. G. 2021 These stories are not one but two of the most strange, terrifying, and paranormal things that ever happened to me in my life. I will never forget them. Both of my stories, these creatures I encountered, were totally different from each other. This first encounter happened when I was hunting with some friends back in September of 2011. The other encounter occurred at a cabin in October of 2014. While these stories are true, I will change the names of those involved for confidentiality. Now let's get started. I live towards the Glacier National Park, just northwest of Montana, where I grew up. Most of my life, I lived on the Blackfeet Indian Reservation, a place where you'll hear scary tales of the Goat Man, stories of campers going missing in the middle of the woods where the stick Indians come out and take people away in the night. Now, I would describe myself as six foot two, a medium build with a beard. Being of mixed race and having very light skin living on the reservation all my life, I hung around a lot with my cousin Dan. Dan was two years younger than me, liked sports, and was very good at basketball and played for the high school team. Together we did a lot of hiking and hunting, also a bit of drinking, smoking, chasing women, and just kicking it with the boys every now and then. My cousin introduced me to his two friends for the first time out on a hunting trip back in 2008. We'll call them Big Tom and Mouse. Big Tom was just a big, silly guy who enjoyed talking about football and would always start singing to the country music playing on the radio, sitting in the front passenger seat in the truck. We would drive down the country roads and he would crack open a cold one. Mouse was five foot six, wore glasses, and had what you call a short man complex. He always had to get competitive over who's the best at what all the time. Later down the road, on my own, I would also start getting into different varieties of hunting wild game. Ducks, grouses, other bird hunting, varmint trapping, and learning how to make coyote hides. I would always go for the more exotic type of hunting rifles and guns. I would usually go for the guns that were the most efficient and accurate for the purposes I needed them. I would carry a Remington 7600 pump action, while the other guys just carried bolt action rifles. Sometime in September of 2011, all of us were in our early to mid-twenties at the time. It was just the beginning of rifle season. I picked up my cousin at his house in my white 1995 Ford Bronco with two big light bars on the top, which I used for spotlighting sometimes. On our way up, we picked up Big Tom and Mouse. We were all trying to decide what place we wanted to go to do some hunting for the day. Big Tom suggested we go out to his uncle's place which is about 43 miles north out of town. As we get about 30 miles out of town, we came to a dirt road. Out that far, there was nothing but flats and hills, a few old-time grain bins, and some solar panels and oil rig pumps that you can see out in the distance. As we came up to this old radar base, a green and silver-striped Dodge Ram Charger passed us on the road. 
Inside were what appeared to be two older looking men. We tried to wave at them, but the two guys just gave us odd looks as we drove by them. After making it to Big Tom's uncle's place, he goes in to check to see if he's home first, to make sure his uncle knows that we'll be out there doing some hunting in the area. Big Tom warned us about his uncle, saying that he can be a bit of a looney tune at times. As we were getting ready and geared up to hunt, Big Tom comes back out, letting us know his uncle wasn't home, but it would still be okay to hunt, as long as his uncle was still away. Big Tom was saying he had to go really bad all day and luckily his uncle had an outhouse just outside the place. After that's done, we start to walk into what's probably about 200 acres of forest. There is a creek running through it, just behind Big Tom's uncle's place. We decided to split up into twos. Tom and Mouse headed out together, while my cousin Dan and I began to follow the creek all the way up. Then we made a plan to all meet up with Big Tom and Mouse down the trail. As Dan and I walked about two miles into the forest, we came across two competitive white-tailed bucks fighting for dominance. Dan and I got down on our knees and belly crawled, taking our time and approaching the deer closer and closer while they were distracted with each other. Soon, they were only about ten yards into the brush in front of us. Dan and I take the shot, each killing a deer. We then waited for Big Tom and Mouse to show up. As Dan and I started to walk further into the brush, we were suddenly startled by some birds. Then, right there in front of us, we saw a horse. However, right away, we noticed something odd about it. It looked strange and was just standing stiff. We approached this horse, realizing it wasn't moving, and it appeared to be hunched over a log. As we walked around the animal, let's just say what we saw was not a very pretty sight to look at. The rear end of this horse was torn wide open, and there were buzzards all over the place. I didn't see any other wounds on the dead animal, and I couldn't help but notice the tail had been braided. Later, when we met up with Big Tom and Mouse, we told them about the dead horse and took them to see it as well. A stiff and still standing dead horse with a chunk out of its rear. We cracked a joke then, saying that Mouse was just the right size to fit into that gaping hole in the horse and make a bed for the night. It was getting late then. We started to quarter up me and Dan's deer. We found some good long pointy sticks lying on the ground nearby. We used it to poke through each front and hind quarter and carry the meat over our shoulders. Getting back on the road, we found some tracks that went into the forest behind Big Tom's uncle's place. I'd turn only my light bars on while driving through a creepy dark forest at night, and this was just such an occasion. With my light bars on brighter than heck, we spotted some porcupines in the brush. I reached into the back of my Bronco and take out my laser-sided crossbow. I loaded a bolt, put my sighting on it, and used the lace to aim and shoot it. I retrieved my prey and wrapped it up, throwing it in the back with the rest of the quartered deer. While leaving from there, we were talking and joking until suddenly, wham, something runs up and hits the side of my Bronco. We all were startled and jumped. I was driving at the time, and I said, what the heck was that? We rolled down the windows to look around. Big Tom even pointed his 44 Magnum outside the car. We looked around a bit, but didn't see anything weird. So we just kept going. A few days later, I told one of my other friends who's kind of a conspiracy theorist. He said a guy named Victor, who lives on the reservation, told him about something called a witch's braid. These appear on horses overnight. He mentioned a story where the woman thought it was cute that something would braid her horse's tail's hair at night. The same woman even said she witnessed Bigfoot attacking her horse and would even hold on to the tail while doing so. This caused the horse's tail hair to get all tangled in a braid-like pattern. When I told my conspiracy theorist friend about this, he mentioned that his grandpa told his mom that the tribe believed that Bigfoot would sometimes even kidnap women. In the Paiute tribe in California, there's a legend that states that a woman was kidnapped and assaulted by Bigfoot. The woman escaped, but it is said that she had a hybrid baby. The boy looked mostly normal, but was hairier. He grew up to have immense strength, better senses of smell and sight than normal people. In recent years, there was an article written about Bigfoot attempting to take a male Colorado hunter while he hunted in the forest, 
And there's a 2006 Bigfoot documentary that took place near the Glacier National Park, where someone found a small Bigfoot leg that had weird webbed feet. I think the documentary is called Bigfoot Lives. I'm not sure if it's still on Netflix. So basically, maybe it was Bigfoot we encountered out there. Maybe that's what ran up on our truck and hit it. Some weird stuff is going on out in those woods. Now on to my second story. Going back to 2000, my dad just bought a cabin from an old guy who used to work for the railroads. It was a small yellow cabin, which had a small bunkhouse just three feet in front of the cabin. About 500 feet west from the cabin, there was a train car. You couldn't see it unless you walked behind some pine trees. Also about 200 feet from the cabin in a different direction was one of those old, barely-traveled country highways. This was truly out in the middle of nowhere. When my dad got to the cabin, I was only 12 at the time and my brother was 9 or 10, and it was our first time going into the cabin. I could see a pellet gun just sitting there in the corner. I took it outside and began shooting it around. I walked down to the bushes where there was a pond nearby. As I looked around, I saw some ducks swimming. I pointed the pellet gun ready to shoot at the ducks, but my dad caught me and said, don't be shooting those ducks now. He even told me, would you like it if I shot you? When my dad went back inside the cabin and was out of hearing range, I grabbed the pellet gun and took a shot, killing a duck. I watched it floating there in the water. I guess I just wanted to see what it was like to shoot something for the first time. I was a kid, and I didn't really understand what I was doing. Then I remember having this really scary dream at the cabin. In it, I was walking out to the living room, and I looked out the window, and I saw a deer, which should have been dead by the looks of it, but it was standing there looking back at me. It had these white, dead, lifeless eyes, and as it ran off into the woods, it made this unsettling screeching sound. That dream always psychologically disturbed me every time I thought about it. My dad would tell me I must have seen something on TV that gave me a nightmare. Much later in August of 2013, my cousin Dan and I, along with his dad, went for a little hike towards the mountain hillside in the Lewis and Clark National Forest. It was just south of the Glacier National Park nearby where the cabin was. I brought with me a 12-inch single-shot tin gauge that I'd inherited from my grandpa after he passed away eight years before. As we went deeper into the woods, we stumbled across an old run-down trailer house and some kind of barn shed on the side of the trailer used for putting horses in. When I stepped into the barn shed part, I was startled by these big yellow eyes that I saw staring back at me. It was an owl. My cousin's dad told me that it was a bad omen, that it would bring me bad luck if I didn't kill it. So I did as he said and pointed my tin gauge at it. I pulled the hammer, then took the shot. As I watched the bird hit the ground, I walked away. I wanted to go check out what was all in the trailer after that. I walked around the living room of the old rundown trailer home, and I heard a thud. I turned around to see what made the noise. Standing on a table staring right at me with big yellow eyes was another owl, or perhaps the same owl, but it should have been dead. Just as before, I took my grandpa's tin gauge, pointed it at the bird, then fired. After leaving the place and getting up a little ways, I was looking around again using binoculars. I could see my dad's cabin about five or six miles north from our location. I told my cousin where my dad's cabin was in the distance and that we should check it out later, and he agreed. Later that day, my cousin and I picked up a few girls and decided to make our way up to that cabin. We got into my dad's cabin and the first thing we noticed was there was no electricity. We hadn't lived in it for a while, and my dad didn't pay on the bill for a long time. We were sitting around in the living room in the cabin, and we found some old chopped up wood. While making a fire, we started to tell jokes and drink. After a while, me and Dan get really blacked out and started a fist fight. After that happened, Dan and the two girls headed out. I was left at the cabin alone. I was getting tired, and I decided to head for bed. It was a king-sized bed with a bed frame made out of logs. While sleeping, I felt as if I couldn't move all of a sudden, and then I began to hear a voice, but I couldn't make out what it was saying at first. When I turned my head just a bit, I saw at the foot of my bed a sort of undead human-like entity. 
It had bleeding eyes and was staring at me angrily. It seemed really teed off. I'm not sure what about. It kept repeating the words, The devil is here. The devil is here. But when it would talk, its mouth would not move at all. Somehow still words came from it. In appearance, it reminded me of a ghoul from Fallout 3. After a while, it disappeared, and the next morning I left. The next week, me and my cousin Dan get over the fight that we had that day and decided to make up. Dan's dad, my cousin Dan, and me decided to go for a hike at the same place. After hiking for a while, we stopped by a creek and smoked a bit. After smoking, Dan and his dad decided to take a little walk. I waited down by the creek as they took their time walking through the woods and happened to just doze off while waiting for Dan and his dad to get back. As I lay there on the rocks, I heard this chilling voice call my name. I heard it coming from the forest when I woke from my short little nap. I realized Dan and his dad weren't back yet, so I got up and walked around to loosen up a bit. I needed it as I kept thinking about that weird voice that called my name. I remember it sounding really strange and disorienting, sort of like a hollow echo. What if nature was teed off at me and the wilderness was trying to send me some kind of message? A year after that, September of 2014, one afternoon around 2 p.m., I was in my newly purchased truck with a lever action rifle hanging on the gun racks behind my head. I was driving down the road coming up from the mountain pass. After arriving at my dad's cabin, I realized I hadn't been there in a year. The last time I was there, me and Dan got drunk and fought. I decided to stop at the cabin on the way through. After getting out of the truck and walking up to the cabin, I peered into the window and I saw someone inside. It was a man with light brown hair. He was wearing glasses and looked to be about five foot ten. He was sitting on the couch, changing his socks. His face looked very startled when he saw me through the window. I ran inside, hitting him in the face and breaking his glasses. He was knocked to the floor. He looked up at me with his hand covering his nose. I told him, what the heck are you doing here? Get out! My dad owns this place. The guy looked really ashamed and embarrassed. He apologized over and over and got up and left. After I told my dad that a man broke into his cabin, he told me to check for anything missing or if anything looked out of place. I let my dad know nothing was missing, but the back door was broken down and there was a nail stuck through the latch on the side of the window. Likely, the guy put it there so that the window wouldn't shut all the way and he could get back in. My dad decided that maybe it would be a good idea if I stayed at the cabin, and he said he would get the electricity turned back on if I did. Remembering what I saw that day last year, I thought maybe it wouldn't be as bad staying there this time with some light in the place, and maybe some company. My dad and I fixed the place up a little. We boarded up the back door and tried to get the side window shut. It was nailed down pretty good. Only a month later in October of 2014, we got the place fixed up decent enough. At 8pm one night, I went out to visit the cabin to see if the lights were on. When entering the cabin, there was a small shed in the front about the size of an elevator. There are kerosene lamps, a handsaw, and some snowshoes on the wall. Anyway, everything in the cabin looked good so far. The lights were running again, and I could hear the radio playing on the kitchen counter. I was thinking about staying for the night. I thought I could use some company though, so I decided to run to town. As I was leaving, pulling out of the driveway in my truck, I saw at the corner of my eye something just fly by. It landed somewhere on the ground in the dark. I didn't get too good of a look at it, but I thought I saw something that had a really long wingspan, more than just an ordinary bird around these parts. I then continued on my way, going to pick up my brother and our two friends, Ed and Cole. Ed was six foot two and always wore a green alien cap. He had short dark hair, had a beard like me, and always enjoyed talking about conspiracy theories like UFOs and the paranormal. Cole had really long hair and wore black Cannibal Corpse t-shirts. All four of us liked metal music, and we'd all talk about going to a music concert one day. My younger brother Anthony was also big into music, but he wasn't into as hardcore of bands as Cole was. At the time, Anthony would sometimes have really bad seizures. I made sure to keep a really close eye on him. 
Back at the cabin, we were all sitting around inside, passing a blunt, listening to the radio. We picked up a station from the reservation of two native guys telling scary stories about skinwalkers and goatmen. It was probably just for the Halloween weekend, I guessed, as it was October. After a while, I stood up to go take a look out the window. I was peeking through the big red curtains of the living room window and I saw something very strange. About 150 feet from the road in front of the cabin and about 30 feet behind my truck standing on the ground, I saw a bird-like creature. But it wasn't just any kind of bird I saw. Something didn't look right about it. It had a head and a neck almost like a man, but it had something weird above its head. It looked like some kind of horns. I couldn't make out what the face looked like. The bird thing stood there just staring back at the cabin. I tried to tell the other guys what I saw outside. I tried showing them, but about the time we all looked out the window together, it was gone. Soon after, we all got tired. Ed and Cole headed for the back bedroom with two extra beds. My brother headed for a different bedroom, and I slept in the living room. Alone in the living room, I soon noticed there were two wooden owl statues. I figured my dad must have picked them up at a thrift store and put them there when we were fixing the place up. Both of them were standing on the top shelf, just on the far side from each other, right above the TV. I went ahead and made a fire on the wood stove. When I went back to sit on the couch, I looked up at one of the owls. Thoughts were going through my mind as the creepy owl statue stared back at me, now lit by the light of the fire. I couldn't help but feel guilty as I thought back to the day I killed those owls last year. I began getting these creepy vibes, so I turned on the lamp by the window. I then decided to crash out on the couch. At some point, I was awakened and began to hear something just out of the half-opened window. It was the one that wouldn't shut all the way, which was just behind the coffee table and lamp I just turned on. The sound outside got closer and closer to the window. I started to feel like I couldn't move. It was all happening again, just like last time. I could only move my eyes, and I could only hear what was around me. Then, I heard something that sounded really weird. It was right outside the window by the coffee table. It sounded like a growl mixed with a muffled noise. I looked out the window. There, I saw that bird thing I'd seen outside, now bursting its head through the crack in the window. It was flapping and screeching about. Now that I got a close-up look at it, I saw that the creature had no face and had a mix of feathers and fur with long, pointy horns, sort of like an antelope. The creature was trying to get in through the window. Its head was convulsing and swinging, flapping around fast and unnaturally. I finally snapped out of my sleep paralysis nightmare. I jumped up from the couch and rushed to the gun rack to my grandpa's single-shot, 10-gauge shotgun. I spun around as fast as I could, and I shot the window where I saw the creature trying to enter through. But once I came to my senses, I realized the creature was now gone. Not long after that, my brother, Ed, and Cole came rushing out, looking surprised and concerned at what they just heard. The blast was very loud, after all. My brother was like, What the heck are you doing? Dad's going to be teed off. You shot out the window. We all stood there mostly confused, trying to make sense of what just happened. I told everyone about what I saw. We looked out the window but didn't see anything weird. Ed, with his conspiracy theories, thought probably the entity could have used some kind of telepathic power to invade my dreams. Maybe it wanted to reveal itself and terrorize me. It seemed to have looked like it had the features and traits of all the animals I killed combined into one, coming back as a nightmare to get revenge on me for all the animals I've killed. Cole heard the same growling, mumbling sounds that I heard. Meanwhile, there was no other damage to the cabin, save for what we cleaned up, which would be broken glass lying around. We then cut out some cardboard and placed it on the side window to cover the crack. The lampshade was pretty shredded up, though. After the incident, we all tried going back to bed. Later on, I got up to go to the kitchen. I then suddenly saw this black figure going into the bedroom where Anthony was sleeping. I went to check on my brother to see if he was okay. When I opened the door, there he was on the bed, 
He was bleeding from the mouth and going into a seizure. I rushed in fast, getting over him and pulling out my wallet, trying to get it into his mouth to keep him from biting his tongue. I called out to Ed and Cole for help. I said, that's it. We're taking him to the hospital. It was around 3 a.m. then and we carried him out to the truck. As I drove out of the driveway and got up the road, we all headed for town. I'll never forget that night. Around that time, two of my closest relatives to me passed away in 2016. It almost seemed more than a coincidence that I killed two owls and around that same year those two people died. The next time you ever go into the woods and you see a messenger like owl, do not kill it. You might get haunted by some kind of creature or nightmare out for revenge. Mushroom Hunting From David Chase One night in the middle of May of 2018, two of my friends and I had been hanging out, drinking and joking around, just having a good time. It was around 2 a.m. by then, and we decided to go moral hunting out at the river, which is less than a five-minute walk away. Morals are an edible mushroom, by the way. As we half-drunkenly looked for morals, we weren't having any luck and soon lost hope. We sat down on a dead fallen tree to take a break for a while, before we would head back to the car, which was about a quarter mile away by then. As we were sitting there, drinking some beers, we started talking about creepy places to explore and stories we've heard. As we got around to finally leaving, we joked about Bigfoot. We got the idea to do some wood knocks since all three of us were into these kinds of things and supposedly Bigfoot liked to knock on wood. We started walking farther into the woods paralleling the river, joking and making whooping yells and doing wood knocks, the same kind of stuff you see on those Bigfoot hunting TV shows but no luck with any responses. We eventually came to a stop, and that's when we had a new idea. We'd try whistling really loud. Now, on this side of the river, you could holler and make all the noise you wanted, but you never got a good echo here, not unless you were on the cliff on the opposite side of the river. Well, one of my friends whistled as loud as they could, and it wasn't about three seconds later that we heard the exact same whistle like someone or something had mimicked it. And soon after that mimic, the woods fell completely silent. Now, why wouldn't the woods go silent for my friend's whistle and only go quiet for the mimic? Our little group looked at each other in shock. My friend made another whistle, but a different kind, and it was mimicked back just as before. It came from the other side of the river, but it was closer now than before. It was at that second we decided we needed to leave. My friends wanted to run, but I told them no, because if there was something out there hunting us, it may pounce on us or chase us if we ran. I led them to the ATV trail. We told each other to only step on the sand, that way we'd make as little noise as possible. As we steadily marched in the direction of the car, we began to hear sticks and leaves crunching on one side of us. We stopped. Whatever it was took one more step and stopped too. Then we started to walk faster. We were almost to the bend then. That was near where the car was parked. We stopped once more and we heard the crunch again. And once again the follower stopped. Except now it was way closer, still on the other side of us. By the time we came within about 25 feet of the car, we unlocked it via the remote and we couldn't stop ourselves any longer from running. We got away okay, and we never went back. Still to this day, I refuse to drive through that area after sunset, at least not without a gun. Almost Caught by the Rake From William J. I was 12 years old when I went on a hunting trip with my father. That day, we woke up at 8 o'clock in the morning and got our stuff ready. We went to this wooded area somewhere in California. Sorry if my memory's a bit vague. We got into our spot we always went to. It was this place with a little dirt mound and small trees around it. However, that day when we got there, I immediately felt that there was something off. The whole forest was quiet. 
Normally, there would be bugs and birds and a whole lot of other stuff, but there was just silence. The only noise was the leaves and twigs that snapped under our boots as we walked. We arrived at the mound and began waiting for a good buck to bag, but nothing came. About an hour after we arrived at the mound, we began to hear the familiar sound of leaves crunching. You hear that? I whispered. Yep, my dad replied. We kept hearing the leaves, then out of nowhere, there came this horrific scream. I jumped and so did my dad. After we heard that scream, we decided it was time to leave. We began walking away, always keeping an eye out for whatever that thing had been. But then I saw it. A tall man, except it wasn't a normal man. It was far too tall, maybe eight to ten feet tall, and had paper white skin that was so tight on it that he could see every last bone inside. The thing had bony long fingers and giant claws. Its face, oh, its face was horrible. It had black beady eyes and a triangular shaped mouth that emitted another horrible sounding scream. My dad and I hightailed it out of there, with the creature staying right behind us the whole way. We got to the truck and looked behind us at the tree line. We saw the thing just standing there. Then it walked back into the forest, never to be seen again by me nor my father. Easy to say I could have been snatched up by that thing so easy that day. And I'd say I'm pretty lucky to be here and to be alive. Stalked in the Swamp from Zachary L. I've always loved being outdoors and being in the wilderness, but I'm a bit new to being a hunter. This particular encounter happened during late deer season, so around late December. The reason I got into hunting recently was because of my dad. He really wanted me to get into it. He thought bagging my own deer was a great rite of passage for a young man. Plus, I've been curious about it for a while. He talked with a friend of his who had a reasonable amount of land. He got permission for me to hunt on his land. We spent the next few days scouting the land, finding hotspots of animal activity, making sure we had the best spots for where we'd like to hunt. We found a few places and set up some tree stands, blinds, the whole nine yards. One of those spots was a blind all the way at the end of his property in the swamp. The only problem is during that time while we were surveilling the area, we would come across large dog-like footprints and would get the occasional flash of something running on four legs away from us when one of us would step on a twig or branch. So one night, I decided I would get up early and go ahead to the blind. I woke up at around 2 a.m. and made the drive there. I arrived by 3 a.m. by myself. My dad had to work the next day. I made it out there and got my gear ready and sprayed some no-scent smell on me, along with some deer urine on my drag, so I smelt like a deer coming through. I was armed with a Mossberg 500 and a small headlamp. Now that I was prepared, I headed out into the forest. Now, I don't know about y'all, but there's something spooky about walking in the woods in complete darkness, especially alone. I was slowly making my way to the blind. I must have been a hundred yards out, give or take. That's when I began to hear this howl. So I stopped for a moment and I began to listen. The sound sent chills down my spine, made me feel helpless. It was a chilling reminder that I was out here in the swamp alone. Then the darkness felt even darker. I put my shotgun off of safety, and I sat there for a while. All of a sudden, I hear something running quickly, so I turn my headlamp on and aim towards the sound. Immediately, the sound stops. I could barely see something, just as it began to run off. It appeared to be some sort of large canine. I swallow hard, and I wait a few more minutes. Then I begin to walk to the blind once more. 
Soon enough, I make it there. I sit down inside the blind, taking off my drag and zipping up the blind from the inside. A few minutes later, I hear something scratching at the door of my blind. This startles me, so I look over. I'm horrified. Whatever's outside is pressing its entire body and face into the blind. It's no longer scratching at it, so much as it is desperately trying to chew its way through, trying to get to me. I can hear growling and snarling, the gnashing of teeth. I literally jump up, grabbing my shotgun and pointing it at the door. I stopped and shouted, and then the thing ran away. I got a real good look at it too. I honestly thought it was a wolf, but it was just a coyote. The biggest freaking coyote I'd ever seen in my life. And despite its size, I could see its ribs quite well. The thing was starving. A chill went down my spine. That starving coyote was so desperate, it was hunting me. And coyotes, of all things, stay away from people. It took me a while to gather the courage to leave that blind. Because as soon as I did, I knew that thing may be hunting me again. I reminded myself I had a shotgun. But what if it took me by surprise? I sighed, and then I left the blind, my ears on high alert. I kept the shotgun off of safety, and I held it at the ready, aiming as I looked around. My heart was pounding so hard that it was shaking the tips of my fingers, or maybe that was just panic. I walked as quickly as I could, while trying to also be quiet and steady with the gun. Thankfully, I managed to make it back to my vehicle without a problem. If I had to guess why it didn't come back, despite it being desperate, I think that coyote was battling with itself. On one hand, it was scared of me, but on the other hand, it was desperately hungry. And luckily for both of us, its ravenous appetite did not win out. Then again, was it really a coyote? Because I swear... It was larger than a wolf. The next time I go hunting out there, I'll keep an eye out for some especially hungry and large canines. Clemson County Creature from Lucian Wolfhart. My story begins on a cool autumn morning in mid-October in a small but quaint town near Clemson County, where the Tugelo River stands. My friends, Elle and Jay and I, went up to the mountainous region to enjoy a weekend full of camping. What we planned to do, aside from lodging and camping in a rustic cabin, was to hike the vast trails and rugged terrain, and to hunt for our meals, finishing the day off sleeping under the stars. This trip had been planned in advance, and as such, all of us thought we had everything covered, every contingency prepared for. But as we'd soon discover, we were horrifically wrong in that assumption. Our first morning in the mountains was met with a beautiful sunrise, the likes of which I doubt any of us had ever seen before. The light was warm and relaxing. Groggily, I got out of bed, Still exhausted from the night before, as I was the one who drove for the last half of the trip. After waking up a little more, I got dressed, headed downstairs to meet the rest of my group, Ellen J. As we gathered together and sat down for breakfast, we began to discuss the first thing we'd do today. Every so often, I'd tease them in hopes that one of them would drive next. But my attempts at persuasion failed, and I ended up being the driver for the day. We got ready and loaded into the vehicle, trekking into the wilderness for a day of hiking and hunting. I was up front driving and they were in the back seat. I decided to get back at them by swerving on a winding incline. I laughed, but someone slapped me in the back of the head. Come on, dude. Are you going to be that dumb through the whole trip? I chuckled. It was L. Ah, calm down. I'm just horsing around. If I'm going to drive, I want to have some fun too. Whatever, Elle said. Just don't do that again. I nearly soiled myself. 
we eventually reached our destination. The fallen leaves decorated the forest floor, which crisply crunched underfoot as we made our way further into the hiking trail. It was really peaceful out here. Sometimes the wind would die down, and it would be nothing but silence and beauty, which would soon end when Jay began to whistle, usually take me home country roads. And being as catchy as it was, we couldn't resist the urge to sing along. The hunting part of our hike was obviously destined to fail. The day went by fast, and before we knew it, the moon began to rise, and with it came the nightlife. The moonlight was pale and eerie, creeping through the brambles and thickets of branches above us, sending chills down our backs as the air grew cold. L began to cling to J, obviously creeped out, saying, maybe we should get going, call it a night. Now, L's my best friend, and in the time we've known each other, whenever either of us gets a bad feeling, we'd take heed and turn away from the supposed risk. I nodded, and just as we began to head back in the direction of the car, a shrill cry rang out a deafening and blood-chilling wail that snatched away whatever peace and tranquility was left in the night. We all stood frozen. The hell was that? Jay asked, L grabbing onto him tighter. Did you hear that? I began to scan the area around us, trying to make out anything in the dim moonlight. My ears twitched at every sound I heard but I soon fixated on something in the distance. I squinted my eyes. It appeared to be two glowing, whitish yellow orbs. They were in a nearby tree. As quickly as I saw them, the orbs vanished, and that horrific wail resounded in the air, leaving us motionless from fear again. Courage or stupidity took hold of us, and we booked it back to the car. Whatever it was, running from it may be a bad idea, but staying there was certainly not an option. We made it back to the car, Jay and L getting in first. I jumped into the driver's seat and started it. As soon as the headlights flicked on, there in the brush in front of us, just barely visible, was a horrific visage. The creature I saw was sickly and had pale yellow eyes, I knew it knew we were scared, and it seemed to take pride in that. Its skin was a reddened color, like a tanned hide, only darker, while its face, from what little we could see, was sharp and angular. On the tree next to it lay one of its grotesque hands, just as monstrous as the rest of it, adorned with claws at the tips of its curled, elongated fingers. One leg was partially visible, and it was, much to our dismay, bent and misshapen. That's when we knew if this was a prank. It was the best darned prank ever, as no human leg is able to bend like that. Imagine how a dog's legs would be, or some other canine, with the knees bent backwards, heels resting off the ground. All the while, as the pads of its feet lay nestled on the forest floor, its sharp claws dug into the dirt and leaves beneath it. Then the creature cracked what appeared to be a smile, revealing rows of sharp and gnarled teeth and fangs. All of this, as drawn out as it seems, happened in the span of a minute or two. Just as quickly as we saw it, it slithered away back into the brush. What, what was that? I asked fear stinging my throat and tears burning my eyes. L and J were yelling at me to drive. I snapped back into reality, throwing the car into reverse and turning around, gunning it down the path. To hell if the road was narrow, we were getting out of there as fast as we could. After what felt like an anxiety-ridden eternity, we finally arrived back at the cabin and slowly made our way inside. Not because we weren't in a hurry, but because we were shocked and exhausted. We all decided to sleep in the same room that night, huddled around one another, cold and pale as the grave. Elle was passed out from the excitement of it all, 
while Jay was soon to follow from a rundown of his adrenaline-driven high. But I myself stayed awake for a while longer, clutching a hunting knife and wondering if I should grab a gun instead. I tossed and turned, alert at every sound that came from the woods, unable to get any decent sleep for what seemed like hours until I finally gave up on the idea of a well-rested night. Screw it. I gave a defeated sigh. I'm not gonna sleep. I went downstairs for a drink and a bite to eat, still on edge as my heart pounded in my chest. There I sat in the kitchen, eating my midnight snack, drinking away whatever that thing was from my memory. All of a sudden, as if on a dreadful cue, a chill ran down my back. It was the same chill I felt right before that creature showed up, a feeling of a lurking nearby danger. A light tapping sounded at the window, and without thinking, I turned to look. In the darkness, two whitish-yellow eyes shone from outside, beaming into the cabin as whatever they belonged to searched around. Then they rose higher into the air, resting almost above the window frame. This creature was tall, frightfully so. It put its hand on the window, but in the moonlight it looked wet and redder than it did before. A fresh, viscous substance dripped from its claws. Slowly I backed away, and it neared closer and closer to the door. Seeing that the door was unlocked, I bolted for it and slammed up against it as it creaked, knocking whatever that hideous thing was away. I locked the door. I heard a slight grunt and what sounded like a growl. But then came a different sound, a familiar one. Let me in, Lucian. It was Elle's voice from behind the door. There's a monster out here. Please don't let it get me. Her voice deepened and became more sinister in tone. I stood there, knife in hand, tears welling in my eyes, a gasp in my throat, and then it spoke again. This time, it was Jay's voice. Let me in, little boy. Let me in. Let me in. It slammed against the door and let out its horrific wail, that ungodly scream. Jay and Del ran downstairs, looking as shocked and horrified as I did. The voice demanded to be let in again, in Elle's voice now. Jay, open the door, please. That's not me in there with you. Then it spoke in my voice. I want to have some fun too. I think I may have hyperventilated, because everything went black after that. When I came to, it was morning. Jay and Del were standing over me. They'd already packed up, and we were all ready to get the hell out of there. We drove, and the mountains grew distant behind us, soon fading away as we made it home. This time around, I didn't mind being the driver this time. Elle and Jay refused to return there, but one day, I think I will. I think I'll go back to Clemson County. I love the woods and mountains. I love the nature itself. And I don't think the evil that lurks there can deter me. But I hope that when I do go back to Clemson County, it goes well for me. I'd rather come out of it alive again. Here's to hoping. Creature in Hangman's Field from DOC. My dad is a big hunter. My brother and I tag along on trips and trail surveys often. It's usually fun because we spend all day in the woods on our ATVs. One day we decided to stop and look at a spot deep in the woods. These were the Pine Barrens and it was already dark, so I was starting to get uncomfortable. This was a spot I was familiar with because we go through these trails a lot. It's called Hangman's Field because of a story of a man who hung himself on a tree here above an old well. 
The well is still there and gives off a terrifying vibe. But this area is one big scary trip. There's virtually no life, no signs of squirrels, deer, or plants, just dead vegetation and still air. There's a giant lonesome dead tree that is snapped in half and hangs unnaturally. My point is, the whole place isn't somewhere you want to go to feel good. We stopped and opened up the cooler to get a drink as my dad looked around, trying to get a signal on his cell phone so we could find our way back through the woods. Out of nowhere, we hear a loud and heavy animal running through the field. The noise was prominent. There were no other sources of sounds around us. This creature was circling us. We turned on all the headlights on the ATVs in an effort to see it or scare it off. And we did see it, and we knew then that trying to scare it off would be impossible. It was no less than seven feet tall, lumbering but quick. We could hear its breathing whenever it stopped running. This thing was a monster. It gave off a blood-curdling screech that made us cringe and shiver. It had skin like tree bark, with limbs that meandered like a dead tree. You would mistake it for a tree if you didn't know any better, or if you didn't look close enough. But having seen it run and hear it screeching at us, we knew it was something otherworldly. We quickly decided to get the hell out of there and followed the trail all the way back until we hit the power lines, which meant we were close to the truck. We loaded the ATVs faster than ever and hopped in. We were familiar with stories about the Pine Barrens before this happened, but we never thought we'd see something like this. If you're ever out at Hangman's Field, it's too late and you've made a dire mistake. Something Below My Tree Stand From That Fat Canadian I'm a native Canadian living on 30 acres of land, owned by my dad. On our land, we have horses, sheep, cattle, and four husky Rottweiler mixes. Quite an intimidating breed of dog. Anyway, out here, I love hunting, and I've had my eye on this prime buck. 13 points, grayish-white pelt. I've caught him on my trail cam about 10 times now. He's had plenty of time to start a family so it's time for him to be claimed by me. One day I take one of the horses, Magic, looking for the trail of Frost, which is what I named the big buck. I tie him up at the start of the trail, and I make my way to my tree stand. According to the cameras, this was the most recent trail that he was on, and it happened to be the most common trail he was seen at. So I was feeling lucky. Sure enough, after waiting about two hours in my tree stand, I saw a huge buck in the nearby field, and I knew it was him. I take aim through the scope, careful about being quiet and precise. This may be my only chance. The huge buck and a doe that's with him are both spooked and run into the tree line. I curse under my breath, then look back in the scope, searching for what may have done that when suddenly I hear a snap from a twig or branch below me. Instinctively, I look away from the scope and peer down, and I can't breathe. A few feet under me is the most bizarre-looking creature I'd ever seen. It had the face like a dog, but stood tall, I'd say six and a half to seven feet tall to be exact. It was staring into the clearing where the deer just were, Obviously, I wasn't the only one hunting them. I realized then that this creature stank to high heaven. I also realized that I was downwind, and something that stank that bad would have quickly been noticed by those deer. I held my breath, and I waited ages for the thing to leave. I must have done a dang good job covering up my scent that morning, because it failed to notice me but I continued to hold my breath as long as possible. When I did breathe, I would do it slowly. If I'd have made a sound, I don't think I'd be alive today. I thought about shooting it, 
but I wasn't sure how many bullets would do the trick, and reloading this thing would take too long. After about 20 minutes, the thing finally started to move. Unluckily for me, it was moving in the direction where I'd left my horse. I slowly climbed down when the coast was clear, and I prayed that it didn't hurt magic. The walk back to magic was the longest walk of my life, both because I was terrified and because I was walking at about two miles per hour, if not slower. As soon as the smell of the thing began to dissipate, I began to smile. I walked faster until I began to run, and I climbed aboard Magic, who was perfectly fine, thank God. Then the two of us got out of there. After seeing this creature, it didn't stop me from hunting there, but it definitely made me more cautious. There's no telling what it was, but if it comes close to my house and threatens Magic and the livestock, I'm ready to face off with it. Treasure Hunting Turned Nightmare from Aaron. By the way, this is a different kind of hunting story, but I hope you like it. I woke up one Saturday morning to my friend Jamie calling me, asking me if I wanted to go on a treasure hunt with his metal detector in the woods. I agreed, because it sounded interesting, and it was a warm sunny day in Warrington, England. At around 10.30, we met at our local subway in Stockton Heath to grab a sub before heading out to the forest. My friend Samuel looked on edge as we made it out there. He'd never really liked nature. The woods freaked him out for as long as I'd known him. I reminded him, as I always did, that there was nothing to be afraid of out here. But that day, I was about to be proved wrong. Jamie could not wait to use his metal detector, and as soon as he could, he had it out and was scanning the ground a little too quickly. I told him to slow down or it wasn't going to pick anything up, but he didn't listen. Jamie was the time to get very excitable. We must have spent several hours out here, but we didn't find anything. Jamie was entirely disappointed, and I had regretted saying yes to this, as I expected us to find something. Maybe an old broken pair of glasses at the very least, or an old coin. Even an empty can would have been fun, but we literally found nothing. Samuel, who had been ready to head back at the first minute, was getting excited himself because he knew it was time to go home. As we were walking back on the trail, we all froze for a moment, because, of all people, Samuel stopped us and pointed ahead on the trail. Guys, do you see that? His finger led to what appeared to be some bushes. See what, dude? Those. That. The big clump of stuff on the right side of the trail, he said. I don't see anything, man. It looks like some bushes to me. Yeah, Samuel said. But they weren't there before. That's what I'm saying. Man, you're just seeing things. I'm telling you, it's just... And then the bushes started to move. What appeared to be a thicket of leaves now looked to be hair curly and gross. This bush got taller until it stood about eight feet tall, and we realized that what we were looking at was not plants at all, but a large and mysterious hairy creature. It walked across the trail and disappeared on the other side, leaving us dumbfounded and horrified. As soon as its footsteps died down, we ran back home. After this experience, our little friend group has not gone back into those woods. And these days, I often take second glances at thickets and bushes, because apparently, sometimes they can be something else. Thank you for listening to another unsettling episode of Unexplained Encounters. You can send us your story to have it narrated on the show at darkstories.org. Unexplained Encounters is an EerieCast original series. You can find other horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com.
such as Redwood Bureau, a fictional anthology series, Freaky Folklore, a documentary-style series about myths and cryptids around the world, Destination Terror, a show about the most haunted places, and Tales from the Break Room, another show I host all about the scary things that happen to people at work. Again, that's EerieCast.com. By the way, if you want fewer annoying ads and you want to support what we do, consider going to EerieCast.com plus to sign up for EerieCast Plus. That unlocks all our podcasts with all but host red ads removed. Until next time, stay safe out there and stay creepy because this world is a strange one.